Nightingale by Kristen Hanna Read for you by Polly Stone Chapter 1 April 9th, 1995 The Oregon Coast If I have learned anything in this long life of mine, it is this. In love we find out who we want to be. In war we find out who we are. Today's young people want to know everything about everyone. They think talking about a problem will solve it, I come from a quieter generation. We understand the value of forgetting, the lure of reinvention. Lately, though, I find myself thinking about the war and my past, about the people I lost. Lost. It makes it sound as if I misplaced my loved ones. Perhaps I left them where they don't belong and then turned away too confused to retrace my steps. They are not lost, nor are they in a better place. They are gone. As I approach the end of my years, I know that grief, like regret, settles into our DNA and remains forever a part of us. I have aged in the months since my husband's death and my diagnosis. My skin has the crinkled appearance of wax paper that someone has tried to flatten and reuse. My eyes fail me often, in the darkness, when headlights flash, when rain falls. It is unnerving, this new unreliability in my vision. Perhaps that's why I find myself looking backward. The past has a clarity. I can no longer see in the present. I want to imagine there will be peace when I am gone, that I will see all of the people I have loved and lost, at least that I will be forgiven. I know better, though, don't I? My house, named The Peaks by the lumber baron who built it over a hundred years ago, is for sale and I am preparing to move because my son thinks I should. He is trying to take care of me, to show how much he loves me in this most difficult of times, and so I put up with his controlling ways. What do I care where I die? That is the point, really. It no longer matters where I live. I am boxing up the Oregon beachside life I settled into nearly fifty years ago. There is not much I want to take with me. But there is one thing. I reach for the hanging handle that controls the attic steps. The stairs unfold from the ceiling, like a gentleman extending his hand. The flimsy stairs wobble beneath my feet as I climb into the attic, which smells of must and mold. A single hanging light bulb swings overhead. I pull the cord. It's like being in the hold of an old steamship. Wide wooden planks panel the walls. Cobwebs turn the creases silver and hang in skeins from the indentation between the planks. The ceiling is so steeply pitched that I can stand upright only in the center of the room. I see the rocking chair I used when my grandchildren were young, then an old crib and a ratty-looking rocking horse set on rusty springs, and the chair my daughter was refinishing when she got sick. Boxes are tucked along the wall, marked Christmas, Thanksgiving, Easter, Halloween, serve wear, sports. 
In those boxes are the things I don't use much anymore, but can't bear to part with. For me, admitting that I won't decorate a tree for Christmas is giving up, and I've never been good at letting go. Tucked in the corner is what I am looking for. An ancient steamer trunk covered in travel stickers. With effort, I drag the heavy trunk to the center of the attic, directly beneath the hanging light. I kneel beside it, but the pain in my knees is piercing, so I slide onto my backside. For the first time in thirty years, I lift the trunk's lid. The top tray is full of baby memorabilia, tiny shoes, ceramic hand molds, crayon drawings populated by stick figures and smiling suns, report cards, dance recital pictures. I lift the tray from the trunk and set it aside. The mementos in the bottom of the trunk are in a messy pile. Several faded leather-bound journals, a packet of aged postcards tied together with a blue satin ribbon, a cardboard box bent in one corner, a set of slim books of poetry by Julienne Rossignol, and a shoebox that holds hundreds of black-and-white photographs. On top is a yellowed, faded piece of paper. My hands are shaking as I pick it up. It is a carte d'identité, an identity card from the war. I see the small passport-sized photo of a young woman, Juliette Gervais. Mom? I hear my son on the creaking wooden steps, footsteps that match my heartbeats. Has he called out to me before? Mom? You shouldn't be up here. Shit, the steps are unsteady. He comes to stand beside me. One fall and... I touch his pant leg, shake my head softly. I can't look up. Don't, is all I can say. He kneels, then sits. I can smell his aftershave something subtle and spicy and also a hint of smoke. He has sneaked a cigarette outside, a habit he gave up decades ago and took up again at my recent diagnosis. There is no reason to voice my disapproval. He is a doctor. He knows better. My instinct is to toss the card into the trunk and slam the lid down, hiding it again. It's what I have done all my life. Now I am dying. Not quickly, perhaps, but not slowly either, and I feel compelled to look back on my life. Mom, you're crying. Am I? I want to tell him the truth, but I can't. It embarrasses and shames me, this failure. At my age... I should not be afraid of anything, certainly not my own past. I say only, I want to take this trunk. It's too big. I'll repack the things you want into a smaller box. I smile at his attempt to control me. I love you, and I am sick again. For these reasons, I have let you push me around, but I am not dead yet. I want this trunk with me. What can you possibly need in it? It's just our artwork and other junk. If I had told him the truth long ago, or had danced and drunk and sung more, maybe he would have seen me instead of a dependable, ordinary mother. He loves a version of me that is incomplete. I always thought it was what I wanted, to be loved and admired. Now I think perhaps I'd like to be known. Think of this as my last request. I can see that he wants to tell me not to talk that way. 
but he's afraid his voice will catch. He clears his throat. You've beaten it twice before. You'll beat it again. We both know this isn't true. I am unsteady and weak. I can neither sleep nor eat without the help of medical science. Of course I will. I just want to keep you safe. I smile. Americans can be so naive. Once I shared his optimism, I thought the world was safe. But that was a long time ago. Who is Juliet Gervais? Julian says, and it shocks me a little to hear that name from him. I close my eyes, and in the darkness that smells of mildew and bygone lives, my mind casts back, a line thrown across years and continents, against my will, or maybe in tandem with it, who knows any more. I remember. Chapter 2 The lights are going out all over Europe. We shall not see them lit again in our lifetime. Sir Edward Grey on World War I August 1939, France Vianne Mauriac left the cool, stucco-walled kitchen and stepped out into her front yard. On this beautiful summer morning in the Loire Valley, everything was in bloom. White sheets flapped in the breeze, and roses tumbled like laughter along the ancient stone wall that hid her property from the road. A pair of industrious bees buzzed among the blooms. From far away, she heard the chugging purr of a train and then the sweet sound of a little girl's laughter. Sophie. Vianne smiled. Her eight-year-old daughter was probably running through the house, making her father dance attendance on her as they readied for their Saturday picnic. Your daughter is a tyrant, Antoine said, appearing in the doorway. He walked toward her, his pomaded hair glinting black in the sunlight. He'd been working on his furniture this morning, sanding a chair that was already as soft as satin and a fine layer of wood dust peppered his face and shoulders. He was a big man, tall and broad-shouldered, with a rough face and a dark stubble that took constant effort to keep from becoming a beard. He slipped an arm around her and pulled her close. I love you, V. I love you, too. It was the truest fact of her world, she loved everything about this man, his smile, the way he mumbled in his sleep and laughed after a sneeze and sang opera in the shower. She'd fallen in love with him 15 years ago, on the school play yard, before she'd even known what love was. He was her first everything. First kiss, first love, first lover. Before him, She'd been a skinny, awkward, anxious girl, given to stuttering when she got scared, which was often. A motherless girl. You will be the adult now, her father had said to Vianne, as they walked up to this very house for the first time. She'd been 14 years old, her eyes swollen from crying, her grief unbearable. In an instant, this house had gone from being the family's summer house to a prison of sorts. Maman had been dead less than two weeks when Papa gave up on being a father. Upon their arrival here, he'd not held her hand or rested a hand on her shoulder or even offered her a handkerchief to dry her tears. But, but I'm just a girl, she'd said. Not anymore. She'd looked down at her younger sister, Isabel, who still sucked her thumb at four and had no idea what was going on. Isabel kept asking when Maman was coming home. When the door opened, a tall, thin woman with a nose like a water spigot and eyes as small and dark as raisins appeared. These are the girls, the woman had said. Papa nodded. They will be no trouble. 
It had happened so fast. Vian hadn't really understood. Papa dropped off his daughters like soiled laundry and left them with a stranger. The girls were so far apart in age, it was as if they were from different families. Vian had wanted to comfort Isabel, meant to, but Vian had been in so much pain it was impossible to think of anyone else, especially a child as willful and impatient and loud as Isabel. Vian still remembered those first days here, Isabel shrieking and Madame spanking her. Vian had pleaded with her sister, saying again and again, Mon Dieu, Isabel, quit screeching, just do as she bids. But even at four, Isabel had been unmanageable. Vian had been undone by all of it, the grief for her dead mother, the pain of her father's abandonment, the sudden change in their circumstances, and Isabel's cloying, needy loneliness. It was Antoine who'd saved Vianne. That first summer after Maman's death, the two of them had become inseparable. With him, Vianne had found an escape. By the time she was 16, she was pregnant. At 17, she was married and the mistress of Le Jardin. Two months later, she had a miscarriage, and she lost herself for a while. There was no other way to put it. She'd crawled into her grief and cocooned it around her, unable to care about anyone or anything, certainly not a needy, wailing four-year-old sister. But that was old news, not the sort of memory she wanted on a beautiful day like today. She leaned against her husband as their daughter ran up to them, announcing, I'm ready, let's go. Well, Antoine said, grinning, the princess is ready, and so we must move. Vianne smiled as she went back into the house and retrieved her hat from the hook by the door. A strawberry blonde with porcelain-thin skin and sea-blue eyes, she always protected herself from the sun. By the time she'd settled the wide-brimmed straw hat in place and collected her lacy gloves and picnic basket, Sophie and Antoine were already outside the gate. Vian joined them on the dirt road in front of their home. It was barely wide enough for an automobile. Beyond it stretched acres of hayfields, the green here and there studded with red poppies and blue cornflowers. Forests grew in patches. In this corner of the Loire Valley, fields were more likely to be growing hay than grapes. Although less than two hours from Paris by train, it felt like a different world altogether. Few tourists visited, even in the summer. Now and then an automobile rumbled past, or a bicyclist, or an ox-driven cart, but for the most part, they were alone on the road. They lived nearly a mile from Carivaux, a town of less than a thousand souls that was known mostly as a stopping point on the pilgrimage of St. Jean d'Arc. There was no industry in town and few jobs, except for those at the airfield that was the pride of Carivaux, the only one of its kind for miles. In town, narrow cobblestone streets wound through ancient limestone buildings that leaned clumsily against one another. Mortar crumbled from stone walls. Ivy hid the decay that lay beneath, unseen but always felt. The village had been cobbled together piecemeal, crooked streets, uneven steps, blind alleys, over hundreds of years. Colors enlivened the stone buildings. Red awnings ribbed in black metal, ironwork balconies decorated with geraniums in terracotta planters. Everywhere there was something to tempt the eye, a display case of pastel macarons, rough willow baskets filled with cheese and ham and saucisson, crates of colorful tomatoes and aubergines and cucumbers. The cafes were full on this sunny day. Men sat around metal tables, drinking coffee and smoking hand-rolled brown cigarettes and arguing loudly. A typical day in Carivaux. Monsieur Lachaud was sweeping the street in front of his saladerie, and Madame Clonet was washing the window of her hat shop, 
and a pack of adolescent boys were strolling through town, shoulder to shoulder, kicking bits of trash and passing a cigarette back and forth. At the end of town, they turned toward the river. At a flat, grassy spot along the shore, Vianne set down her basket and spread out a blanket in the shade of a chestnut tree. From the picnic basket, she withdrew a crusty baguette, a wedge of rich double cream cheese, two apples, some slices of paper-thin Bayonne ham, and a bottle of Bollinger 36. She poured her husband a glass of champagne and sat down beside him as Sophie ran toward the riverbank. The day passed in a haze of sunshine-warmed contentment. They talked and laughed and shared their picnic. It wasn't until late in the day when Sophie was off with her fishing pole and Antoine was making their daughter a crown of daisies that he said, Hitler will suck us all into his war soon. War. It was all anyone could talk about these days, and Vianne didn't want to hear it, especially not on this lovely summer day. She tended a hand across her eyes and stared at her daughter. Beyond the river... The green Loire Valley lay cultivated with care and precision. There were no fences, no boundaries, just miles of rolling green fields and patches of trees and the occasional stone house or barn. Tiny white blossoms floated like bits of cotton in the air. She got to her feet and clapped her hands. Come, Sophie, it's time to go home. You can't ignore this, Vianne. Should I look for trouble? Why? You are here to protect us. Smiling, too brightly perhaps, she packed up the picnic and gathered her family and led them back to the dirt road. In less than thirty minutes, they were at the sturdy wooden gate of Le Jardin, the stone country house that had been in her family for three hundred years. Aged to a dozen shades of gray, it was a two-story house with blue shuttered windows that overlooked the orchard. Ivy climbed up the two chimneys and covered the bricks beneath. Only seven acres of the original parcel were left. The other two hundred had been sold off over the course of two centuries as her family's fortune dwindled. Seven acres was plenty for Vianne. She couldn't imagine needing more. Vianne closed the door behind them. In the kitchen... Copper and cast iron pots and pans hung from an iron rack above the stove. Lavender and rosemary and thyme hung in drying bunches from the exposed timber beams of the ceiling. A copper sink, green with age, was big enough to bay the small dog in. The plaster on the interior walls was peeling here and there to reveal paint from years gone by. The living room was an eclectic mix of furniture and fabrics, tapestried settee, aubusson rugs, antique Chinese porcelain, chintz, and toile. Some of the paintings on the wall were excellent, perhaps important, and some were amateurish. It had the jumbled, cobbled-together look of lost money and bygone taste, a little shabby, but comfortable. She paused in the salon, glancing through the glass-paned doors that led to the backyard, where Antoine was pushing Sophie on the swing he'd made for her. Vianne hung her hat gently on the hook by the door and retrieved her apron, tying it in place. While Sophie and Antoine played outside, Vianne cooked supper. She wrapped a pink pork tenderloin in thick-cut bacon, tied it in twine, and browned it in hot oil. While the pork roasted in the oven, she made the rest of the meal, at eight o'clock, right on time, she called everyone to supper and couldn't help smiling at the thundering of feet and the chatter of conversation and the squealing of chair legs scraping across the floor as they sat down. Sophie sat at the head of the table, wearing the crown of daisies Antoine had made for her at the riverbank. Vianne set down the platter, whose fragrance wafted upward, Roasted pork and crispy bacon and apples glazed in a rich wine sauce, resting on a bed of browned potatoes. Beside it was a bowl of fresh peas, swimming in butter seasoned with tarragon from the garden. 
and of course there was the baguette Vianne had made yesterday morning. As always, Sophie talked all through supper. She was like her taunt Isabel in that way, a girl who couldn't hold her tongue. When at last they came to dessert, Ile Flottante, islands of toasted meringue floating in a rich creme anglaise, there was a satisfied silence around the table. Well, Vianne said at last, pushing her half-empty dessert plate away, it's time to do the dishes. Oh, maman, Sophie whined. No whining, Antoine said. Not at your age. Vianne and Sophie went into the kitchen, as they did each night, to their stations. Vianne at the deep copper sink, Sophie at the stone counter, and began washing and drying the dishes. Vianne could smell the sweet, sharp scent of Antoine's after-supper cigarette wafting through the house. Papa didn't laugh at a single one of my stories today, Sophie said as Vianne placed the dishes back in the rough wooden rack that hung on the wall. Something is wrong with him. No laughter? Well, certainly that is cause for alarm. He's worried about the war. The war. Again. Vianne shooed her daughter out of the kitchen. Upstairs, in Sophie's bedroom, Vianne sat on the double bed, listening to her daughter chatter as she put on her pajamas and brushed her teeth and got into bed. Vianne leaned down to kiss her goodnight. I'm scared, Sophie said. Is war coming? Don't be afraid, Vianne said. Papa will protect us. But even as she said it, she remembered another time when her maman had said to her, Don't be afraid. It was when her own father had gone off to war. Sophie looked unconvinced. But... But nothing. There is nothing to worry about. Now go to sleep. She kissed her daughter again, letting her lips linger on the little girl's cheek. Vianne went down the stairs and headed for the backyard. Outside, the night was sultry. The air smelled of jasmine. She found Antoine sitting in one of the iron cafe chairs out on the grass, his legs stretched out, his body slumped uncomfortably to one side. She came up beside him, put a hand on his shoulder. He exhaled smoke and took another long drag on the cigarette. Then he looked up at her. In the moonlight, his face appeared pale and shadowed, almost unfamiliar. He reached into the pocket of his vest and pulled out a piece of paper. I have been mobilized, Vianne along with most men between 18 and 35. Mobilized? But we are not at war. I don't... I am to report for duty on Tuesday. But... but you're a postman. He held her gaze, and suddenly she couldn't breathe. I am a soldier now, it seems. Chapter 3 Vianne knew something of war. Not its clash and clatter and smoke and blood, perhaps, but the aftermath. Though she had been born in peacetime, her earliest memories were of the war. She remembered watching her maman cry as she said goodbye to papa. She remembered being hungry and always being cold. But most of all, she remembered how different her father was when he came home, how he limped and sighed and was silent. That was when he began drinking and keeping to himself and ignoring his family. After that, she remembered doors slamming shut, arguments erupting and disappearing into clumsy silences, and her parents sleeping in different rooms. The father who went off to war was not the one who came home. She had tried to be loved by him. More important, she had tried to keep loving him. But in the end, one was as impossible as the other. In the years since he'd shipped her off to Carivo, Vianne had made her own life. She sent her father Christmas and birthday cards, 
but she'd never received one in return, and they rarely spoke. What was there left to say? Unlike Isabel, who seemed incapable of letting go, Vian understood and accepted that when Maman had died, their family had been irreparably broken. He was a man who simply refused to be a father to his children. I know how war scares you, Antoine said. The Maginot line will hold, she said, trying to sound convincing. You'll be home by Christmas. The Maginot line was miles and miles of concrete walls and obstacles and weapons that had been constructed along the German border after the Great War to protect France. The Germans couldn't breach it. Antoine took her in his arms. The scent of jasmine was intoxicating, and she knew suddenly, certainly, that from now on, whenever she smelled jasmine, she would remember this goodbye. I love you, Antoine Moyac, and I expect you to come home to me. Later, she couldn't remember them moving into the house, climbing the stairs, lying down in bed, undressing each other. She remembered only being naked in his arms, lying beneath him as he made love to her in a way he never had before, with frantic, searching kisses and hands that seemed to want to tear her apart even as they held her together. You're stronger than you think you are, V, he said afterward, when they lay quietly in each other's arms. I'm not, she whispered too quietly for him to hear. The next morning, Vianne wanted to keep Antoine in bed all day, maybe even convince him that they should pack their bags and run like thieves in the night. But where would they go? War hung over all of Europe. By the time she finished making breakfast and doing the dishes, a headache throbbed at the base of her skull. You seem sad, Maman, Sophie said. How can I be sad on a gorgeous summer's day when we are going to visit our best friends? Vianne smiled a bit too brightly. It wasn't until she was out the front door and standing beneath one of the apple trees in the front yard that she realized she was barefoot. Maman, Sophie said impatiently. I'm coming, she said, as she followed Sophie through the front yard, past the old dovecote, now a gardening shed, and the empty barn. Sophie opened the back gate and ran into the well-tended neighboring yard, toward a small stone cottage with blue shutters. Sophie knocked once, got no answer, and went inside. Sophie, Vianne said sharply, but her admonishment fell on deaf ears. Manners were unnecessary at one's best friend's house, and Rachel de Champlain had been Vianne's best friend for fifteen years. They'd met only a month after Papa had so ignominiously dropped his children off at Le Jardin. They'd been a pair back then, Vianne, slight and pale and nervous, and Rachel, as tall as the boys, with eyebrows that grew faster than a lie and a voice like a foghorn. Outsiders, both of them, until they met. They'd become inseparable in school and stayed friends in all the years since. They'd gone to university together, and both had become school teachers. They'd even been pregnant at the same time. Now they taught in side-by-side -side classrooms at the local school. Rachel appeared in the open doorway, holding her newborn son, Ariel. A look passed between them. In it was everything they felt and feared. Vianne followed her friend into a small, brightly lit interior that was neat as a pin. A vase full of wildflowers graced the rough wooden trestle table, flanked by mismatched chairs. In the corner of the dining room was a leather valise, and sitting on top of it was the brown felt fedora that Rachel's husband Mark favored. Rachel went into the kitchen for a small crockery plate full of cannelée. Then the women headed outside. In the small backyard, roses grew along a privet hedge. A table and four chairs sat unevenly on a stone patio. Antique lanterns hung from the branches of a chestnut tree. Vianne picked up a cannelée and took a bite, 
savoring the vanilla-rich cream center and crispy, slightly burnt-tasting exterior. She sat down. Rachel sat down across from her, with the baby asleep in her arms. Silence seemed to expand between them and fill with their fears and misgivings. I wonder if he'll know his father, Rachel said, as she looked down at her baby. They'll be changed, Vian said, remembering. Her father had been in the Battle of the Somme, in which more than three quarters of a million men had lost their lives. Rumors of German atrocities had come home with the few who survived. Rachel moved the infant to her shoulder, patted his back soothingly. Mark is no good at changing diapers, and Ari loves to sleep in our bed. I guess that'll be all right now. Vianne felt a smile start. It was a little thing, this joke, but it helped. Antoine's snoring is a pain in the backside. I should get some good sleep. And we can have poached eggs for supper. Only half the laundry, she said, but then her voice broke. I'm not strong enough for this, Rachel. Of course you are. We'll get through it together. Before I met Antoine, Rachel waved a hand dismissively. I know, I know, you are as skinny as a branch. You stuttered when you got nervous, and you were allergic to everything. I know, I was there. But that's all over now. You'll be strong. You know why? Why? Rachel's smile faded. I know I'm big. Statuesque, as they like to say when they're selling me brassiers and stockings. But I feel undone by this V. And I'm going to need to lean on you sometimes, too. Not with all my weight, of course. So we can't both fall apart at the same time. Voila, Rachel said. Our plan. Should we open a bottle of cognac now or gin? It's ten o'clock in the morning. You're right, of course. A French 75. On Tuesday morning, when Vianne awoke, sunlight poured through the window, glazing the exposed timbers. Antoine sat in the chair by the window, a walnut rocker he'd made during Vianne's second pregnancy. For years, that empty rocker had mocked them, the miscarriage years as she thought of them now, desolation in a land of plenty, three lost lives in four years, tiny, thready heartbeats, blue hands, and then, miraculously, a baby who survived. Sophie. There were sad little ghosts caught in the wood grain of that chair, but there were good memories, too. Maybe you should take Sophie to Paris, he said as she sat up. Julian would look out for you. My father has made his opinion on living with his daughters quite clear. I cannot expect a welcome from him. Vianne pushed the mat lasse coverlet aside and rose, putting her bare feet on the worn rug. Will you be all right? Sophie and I will be fine. You'll be home in no time anyway. The Maginot line will hold. And Lord knows the Germans are no match for us. Too bad their weapons are. I took all of our money out of the bank. There are 65,000 francs in the mattress. Use it wisely, Vianne. Along with your teaching salary... It should last you a good long time. She felt a flutter of panic. She knew too little about their finances. Antoine handled them. He stood up slowly and took her in his arms. She wanted to bottle how safe she felt in this moment, so she could drink of it later, when loneliness and fear left her parched. Remember this, she thought. The way the light caught in his unruly hair the love in his brown eyes, the chapped lips that had kissed her only an hour ago in the darkness. Through the open window behind them, she heard the slow, even clop, clop, clop of a horse moving up the road and the clattering of the wagon being pulled along behind. That would be Monsieur Kian on his way to market with his flowers. If she were in the yard, he would stop 
and give her one, and say it couldn't match her beauty, and she would smile and say merci, and offer him something to drink. Vian pulled away reluctantly. She went over to the wooden dresser and poured tepid water from the blue crockery pitcher into the bowl and washed her face. In the alcove that served as their wardrobe, behind a pair of gold and white toile curtains, she put on her brassiere and stepped into her lace-trimmed drawers and garter. She smoothed the silk stockings up her legs, fastened them to her garters, and then slipped into a belted cotton frock with a squared yoke collar. When she closed the curtains and turned around, Antoine was gone. She retrieved her handbag and went down the hallway to Sophie's room. Like theirs, it was small, with a steeply pitched timbered ceiling, wide plank wooden floors, and a window that overlooked the orchard. An ironwork bed, a nightstand with a hand-me-down lamp, and a blue-painted armoire filled the space. Sophie's drawings decorated the walls. Vian opened the shutters and let light flood the room. As usual in the hot summer months, Sophie had kicked the coverlet to the floor sometime in the night. Her pink-stuffed teddy bear, Bebe, slept against her cheek. Vianne picked up the bear, staring down at its matted, much-petted face. Last year, Bebe had been forgotten on a shelf by the window as Sophie moved on to newer toys. Now, Bebe was back. Vianne leaned down to kiss her daughter's cheek. Sophie rolled over and blinked awake. I don't want Papa to go, Maman, she whispered. She reached out for Bebe, practically snatched the bear from Vianne's hands. I know, Vianne sighed. I know. Vianne went to the armoire, where she picked out the sailor dress that was Sophie's favorite. Can I wear the daisy crown Papa made me? The daisy crown lay crumpled on the nightstand, the little flowers wilted. Vianne picked it up gently and placed it on Sophie's head. Vianne thought she was doing all right until she stepped into the living room and saw Antoine. Papa? Sophie touched the wilted daisy crown uncertainly. Don't go. Antoine knelt down and drew Sophie into his embrace. I have to be a soldier to keep you and Maman safe. But I'll be back before you know it. Vianne heard the crack in his voice. Sophie drew back. The daisy crown was sagging down the side of her head. You promise you'll come home? Antoine looked past his daughter's earnest face to Vianne's worried gaze. Oui, he said at last. Sophie nodded. The three of them were silent as they left the house. They walked hand in hand up the hillside to the gray wooden barn. Knee-high golden grass covered the knoll, and lilac bushes as big as hay wagons grew along the perimeter of the property. Three small white crosses were all that remained in this world to mark the babies Vianne had lost. Today, she didn't let her gaze linger there at all. Her emotions were heavy enough right now. She couldn't add the weight of those memories, too. Inside the barn sat their old green Renault. When they were all in the automobile, Antoine started up the engine, backed out of the barn, and drove on browning ribbons of dead grass to the road. Vianne stared out the small, dusty window, watching the green valley pass in a blur of familiar images. Red tile roofs, stone cottages, fields of hay and grapes, spindly-treed forests. All too quickly, they arrived at the train station near Tours. The platform was filled with young men carrying suitcases, and women kissing them goodbye and children crying. A generation of men were going off to war. Again. Don't think about it, Vianne told herself. Don't remember what it was like last time, when the men limped home, faces burned, missing arms and legs. Vianne clung to her husband's hand as Antoine bought their tickets and led them onto the train. 
in the third-class carriage, stiflingly hot, people packed in like marsh reeds, she sat stiffly upright, still holding her husband's hand with her handbag on her lap. At their destination, a dozen or so men disembarked. Vianne and Sophie and Antoine followed the others down a cobblestone street and into a charming village that looked like most small communes in Touraine. How was it possible that war was coming, and that this quaint town with its tumbling flowers and crumbling walls was amassing soldiers to fight? Antoine tugged at her hand, got her moving again. When had she stopped? Up ahead, a set of tall, recently erected iron gates had been bolted into stone walls. Behind them were rows of temporary housing. The gates swung open. A soldier on horseback rode out to greet the new arrivals, his leather saddle creaking at the horse's steps, his face dusty and flushed from heat. He pulled on the reins and the horse halted, throwing its head and snorting. An aeroplane droned overhead. You men, the soldier said. Bring your papers to the lieutenant over there by the gate, now. Move. Antoine kissed Vianne with a gentleness that made her want to cry. I love you, he said against her lips. I love you too, she said, but the words that always seemed so big felt small now. What was love when put up against war? Me too, papa, me too, Sophie cried, flinging herself into his arms. They embraced as a family, one last time, until Antoine pulled back. Goodbye, he said. Vianne couldn't say it in return. She watched him walk away, watched him merge into the crowd of laughing, talking young men, becoming indistinguishable. The big iron gates slammed shut, the clang of metal reverberating in the hot, dusty air, and Vianne and Sophie stood alone, in the middle of the street. Chapter 4 June 1940, France The medieval villa dominated a deeply green, forested hillside. It looked like something in a confectioner's shop window, a castle sculpted of caramel with spun sugar windows and shutters the color of candied apples. Far below, a deep blue lake absorbed the reflection of the clouds. Manicured gardens allowed the villa's occupants, and more important, their guests, to stroll about the grounds where only acceptable topics were to be discussed. In the formal dining room, Isabel Rossignol sat stiffly erect at the white clothed table that easily accommodated twenty four diners. Everything in this room was pale. Walls and floor and ceiling were all crafted of oyster-hued stone. The ceiling arched into a peak nearly twenty feet overhead. Sound was amplified in this cold room, as trapped as the occupants. Madame de Four stood at the head of the table, dressed in a severe black dress that revealed the soup-spoon-sized hollow at the base of her long neck. A single diamond brooch was her only adornment. One good piece, ladies, and choose it well. Everything makes a statement. Nothing speaks quite so loudly as cheapness. Her narrow face ended in a blunt chin and was framed by curls so obviously peroxided the desired impression of youth was quite undone. The trick, she was saying in a cultivated voice, clipped and cut, is to be completely quiet and unremarkable in your task. Each of the girls at the table wore the fitted blue woolen jacket and skirt that was the school uniform. It wasn't so bad in the winter, but on this hot June afternoon, the ensemble was unbearable. Isabel could feel herself beginning to sweat, and no amount of lavender in her soap could mask the sharp scent of her perspiration. She stared down at the unpeeled orange placed in the center of her Limoges china plate. Flatware lay in precise formation on either side of the plate. Salad fork, dinner fork, knife, spoon, 
butter knife, fish fork. It went on and on. Now, Madame Dufour said, pick up the correct utensils, quietly, silver play, quietly, and peel your orange. Isabel picked up her fork and tried to ease the sharp prongs into the heavy peel, but the orange rolled away from her and bumped over the gilt edge of the plate, clattering the china. Merde, she muttered, grabbing the orange before it fell to the floor. Meld? Madame Dufour was beside her. Isabel jumped in her seat. Mon Dieu, the woman moved like a viper in the reeds. Pardon, madame, Isabel said, returning the orange to its place. Mademoiselle Rosignol, Madame said, how is it that you have graced our halls for two years and learned so little? Isabel again stabbed the orange with her fork, a graceless but effective move. Then she smiled up at Madame. Generally, Madame, the failing of a student to learn is the failing of the teacher to teach. Breaths were indrawn all down the table. Ah, Madame said. So we are the reason you still cannot manage to eat an orange properly. Isabel tried to slice through the peel, too hard, too fast. The silver blade slipped off the puckered peel and clanged on the china plate. Madame Dufour's hand snaked out, her fingers coiled around Isabel's wrist. All up and down the table, the girls watched. Polite conversation, girls, Madame said, smiling thinly. No one wants a statue for a dinner partner. On cue, the girls began speaking quietly to one another about things that did not interest Isabel. Gardening, weather, fashion. Acceptable topics for women. Isabel heard the girl next to her say quietly, I am so very fond of Alain Lace, aren't you? And really, it was all she could do to keep from screaming. Mademoiselle Rosignol, Madame said. You will go see Madame Allard and tell her that our experiment has come to an end. What does that mean? She will know. Go. Isabel scooted back from the table quickly, lest Madame change her mind. Madame's face scrunched in displeasure at the loud screech the chair legs made on the stone floor. Isabel smiled. I really do not like oranges, you know. Really? Madame said sarcastically. Isabel wanted to run from this stifling room, but she was already in enough trouble, so she forced herself to walk slowly, her shoulders back, her chin up. At the stairs, which she could navigate with three books on her head if required, she glanced sideways, saw that she was alone, and rushed down. In the hallway below, she slowed and straightened. By the time she reached the headmistress's office, she wasn't even breathing hard. She knocked. At Madame's flat, come in. Isabel opened the door. Madame Allard sat behind a gilt-trimmed mahogany writing desk. Medieval tapestries hung from the stone walls of the room, and an arched, leaded glass window overlooked gardens so sculpted they were more art than nature. Even birds rarely landed here. No doubt they sensed the stifling atmosphere and flew on. Isabel sat down, remembering an instant too late that she hadn't been offered a seat. She popped back up. Pardon, madame. Sit down, Isabel. She did, carefully crossing her ankles as a lady should, clasping her hands together. Madame Dufour asked me to tell you that the experiment is over. Madame reached for one of the Murano fountain pens on her desk and picked it up, tapping it on the desk. Why are you here, Isabel? I hate oranges. Pardon. And if I were to eat an orange, which, honestly, madame, why would I when I don't like them? I would use my hands like the Americans do, like everyone does, really. A fork and knife to eat an orange? I mean... Why are you at the school? Oh, that. Well, the convent of the Sacred Heart in Avignon expelled me, for nothing, I might add. And the Sisters of St. Francis? Ah, they had reason to expel me. And the school before that? Isabel didn't know what to say. 
Madame put down her fountain pen. You are almost nineteen. Oui, madame. I think it's time for you to leave. Isabel got to her feet. Shall I return to the orange lesson? You misunderstand. I mean you should leave the school, Isabel. It is clear that you are not interested in learning what we have to teach you. How to eat an orange, and when you can spread cheese, and who is more important, the second son of a duke or a daughter who won't inherit, or an ambassador to an unimportant country? Madame, do you not know what is going on in the world? Isabel might have been secreted deep in the countryside, but still she knew. Even here, barricaded behind hedges and bludgeoned by politeness, she knew what was happening in France. At night, in her monastic cell, while her classmates were in bed, she sat up long into the night, listening to the BBC on her contraband radio. France had joined Britain in declaring war on Germany, and Hitler was on the move. All across France, people had stockpiled food and put up blackout shades and learned to live like moles in the dark. They had prepared and worried, and then... nothing. Month after month, nothing happened. At first, all anyone could talk about was the Great War and the losses that had touched so many families. But as the months went on, and there was only talk of war, Isabel heard her teachers calling it the drôle de guerre, the phony war. The real horror was happening elsewhere in Europe, in Belgium and Holland and Poland. Will manners not matter in war, Isabel? They don't matter now. Isabel said impulsively, wishing a moment later that she'd said nothing. Madame stood. We were never the right place for you, but... My father would put me anywhere to be rid of me, she said. Isabel would rather blurt out the truth than hear another lie. She had learned many lessons in the parade of schools and convents that had housed her for more than a decade. Most of all, she'd learned that she had to rely on herself, Certainly her father and her sister couldn't be counted on. Madame looked at Isabel. Her nose flared ever so slightly, an indication of polite but pained disapproval. It is hard for a man to lose his wife. It is hard for a girl to lose her mother, she smiled defiantly. I lost both parents, though, didn't I? One died, and the other turned his back on me. I can't say which hurt more. Mon Dieu, Isabel, must you always speak whatever is on your mind? Isabel had heard this criticism all her life, but why should she hold her tongue? No one listened to her either way. So you will leave today. I will telegram your father. Tomas will take you to the train. Tonight? Isabel blinked. But Papa won't want me. Ah, consequences. Madame said. Perhaps now you will see that they should be considered. Isabel was alone on a train again, heading toward an unknown reception. She stared out the dirty, mottled window at the flashing green landscape. Fields of hay, red roofs, stone cottages, gray bridges, horses. Everything looked exactly as it always had, and that surprised her. War was coming, and she'd imagined it would leave a mark on the countryside somehow, changing the grass color, or killing the trees, or scaring away the birds. But now, as she sat on this train chugging into Paris, she saw that everything looked completely ordinary. At the sprawling Gare de Lyon, the train came to a wheezing, belching stop. Isabel reached down for the small valise at her feet and pulled it onto her lap. As she watched the passengers shuffle past her, exiting the train carriage, the question she'd avoided came back to her. Papa. She wanted to believe he would welcome her home, that finally he would hold out his hands and say her name in a loving way, the way he had before when Maman had been the glue that held them together. She stared down at her scuffed suitcase. So small. Most of the girls in the schools she'd attended 
had arrived with a collection of trunks bound in leather straps and studded with brass tacks. They had pictures on their desks and mementos on their nightstands and photograph albums in their drawers. Isabel had a single framed photograph of a woman she wanted to remember and couldn't. When she tried, all that came to her were blurry images of people crying and the physician shaking his head and her mother saying something about holding tightly to her sister's hand. As if that would help. Vianne had been as quick to abandon Isabel as Papa had been. She realized that she was the only one left in the carriage. Clasping her suitcase in her gloved hand, she sidled out of the seat and exited the carriage. The platforms were full of people. Trains stood in shuddering rows, Smoke filled the air, puffed up toward the high, arched ceiling. Somewhere a whistle blared. Great iron wheels began to churn. The platform trembled beneath her feet. Her father stood out, even in the crowd. When he spotted her, she saw the irritation that transformed his features, reshaped his expression into one of grim determination. He was a tall man, at least six foot two, but he had been bent by the Great War, or at least that was what Isabel remembered hearing once. His broad shoulders sloped downward, as if posture were too much to think about with all that was on his mind. His thinning hair was gray and unkempt. He had a broad, flattened nose, like a spatula, and lips as thin as an afterthought. On this hot summer day, he wore a wrinkled white shirt with sleeves rolled up. A tie hung loosely tied around his fraying collar, and his corduroy pants were in need of laundering. She tried to look mature. Perhaps that was what he wanted of her. Isabel. She clutched her suitcase handle in both hands. Papa. Kicked out of another one. She nodded, swallowing hard. How will we find another school in these times? That was her opening. I want to live with you, Papa. With me? He seemed irritated and surprised. But wasn't it normal for a girl to want to live with her father? She took a step toward him. I could work in the bookstore. I won't get in your way. She drew in a sharp breath, waiting. Sound amplified suddenly. She heard people walking, the platforms groaning beneath them, pigeons flapping their wings overhead, a baby crying. Of course, Isabel, come home. Her father sighed in disgust and walked away. Well, he said, looking back, are you coming? Isabel lay on a blanket in the sweet-smelling grass, a book open in front of her. Somewhere nearby, a bee buzzed at a blossom. It sounded like a tiny motorcycle amid all this quiet. It was a blisteringly hot day, a week after she'd come home to Paris. Well, not home. She knew her father was still plotting to be rid of her, but she didn't want to think about that on such a gorgeous day, in the air that smelled of cherries and sweet green grass. You read too much, Christoph said, chewing on a stalk of hay. What is that, a romantic novel? She rolled toward him, snapping the book shut. It was about Edith Cavill, a nurse in the Great War, a hero. I could be a war hero, Christoph. He laughed. A girl? A hero? Absurd. Isabel got to her feet quickly yanking up her hat and white kid gloves. Don't be mad, he said, grinning up at her. I'm just tired of the war talk, and it's a fact that women are useless in war. Your job is to wait for our return. He propped his cheek in one hand and peered up at her through the mop of blonde hair that fell across his eyes. In his yachting-style blazer and wide-legged white pants, he looked exactly like what he was, a privileged university student who was unused to work of any kind. 
Many students his age had volunteered to leave university and join the army, not Kristoff. Isabel hiked up the hill and through the orchard, out to the grassy knoll where his open-topped pannard was parked. She was already behind the wheel, with the engine running when Kristoff appeared, a sheen of sweat on his conventionally handsome face, the empty picnic basket hanging from his arm. Just throw that stuff in the back, she said with a bright smile. You're not driving. It appears that I am. Now get in. It's my automobile, Isabel. Well, to be precise, and I know how important the facts are to you, Christoph, it's your mother's automobile, and I believe a woman should drive a woman's automobile. Isabel tried not to smile when he rolled his eyes and muttered, Fine, and leaned over to place the basket behind Isabel's seat. Then, moving slowly enough to make his point, he walked around the front of the automobile and took his place in the seat beside her. He had no sooner clicked the door shut than she put the automobile in gear and stomped on the gas. The automobile hesitated for a second, then lurched forward, spewing dust and smoke as it gathered speed. Mon Dieu, Isabelle, slow down! She held onto her flapping straw hat with one hand and clutched the steering wheel with the other. She barely slowed as she passed other motorists. Mon Dieu, slow down, he said again. Certainly he must know that she had no intention of complying. A woman can go to war these days, Isabel said when the Paris traffic finally forced her to slow down. I could be an ambulance driver, maybe. Or I could work on breaking secret codes. Or charming the enemy into telling me a secret location or plan. Remember that game? War is not a game, Isabel. I believe I know that, Christoph. But if it does come, I can help. That's all I'm saying. On the Rue de l'Amiral de Coligny, she had to slam on the brakes to avoid hitting a lorry. A convoy from the Comédie Française was pulling out of the Louvre Museum. In fact, there were lorries everywhere and uniformed gendarmes directing traffic. Sandbags were piled up around several buildings and monuments to protect from attack, of which there had been none since France joined the war. Why were there so many French policemen out here? Odd, Isabel mumbled, frowning. Christophe craned his neck to see what was going on. They're moving treasures out of the Louvre, he said. Isabel saw a break in traffic and sped up. In no time, she had pulled up in front of her father's bookshop and parked. She waved goodbye to Kristoff and ducked into the shop. It was long and narrow, lined from floor to ceiling with books. Over the years, her father had tried to increase his inventory by building freestanding bookcases. The result of his improvements was the creation of a labyrinth. The stacks led one this way and that, deeper and deeper within. At the very back were the books for tourists. Some stacks were well lit, some in shadows. There weren't enough outlets to illuminate every nook and cranny, but her father knew every title on every shelf. You're late, he said, looking up from his desk in the back. He was doing something with the printing press, probably making one of his books of poetry which no one ever purchased. His blunt-tipped fingers were stained blue, I suppose boys are more important to you than employment. She slid onto the stool behind the cash register. In the week she'd lived with her father, she'd made it a point not to argue back, although acquiescing gnawed at her. She tapped her foot impatiently. Words, phrases, excuses clamored to be spoken aloud. It was hard not to tell him how she felt, but she knew how badly he wanted her gone so she held her tongue. Do you hear that? He said some time later. Had she fallen asleep? Isabel sat up. She hadn't heard her father approach, but he was beside her now, frowning. There was a strange sound in the bookshop, to be sure. Dust fell from the ceiling. The bookcases clattered slightly, making a sound like chattering teeth. Shadows passed in front of the leaded glass display windows at the entrance. Hundreds of them. P. 
people? So many of them? Papa went to the door. Isabel slid off her stool and followed him. As he opened the door, she saw a crowd running down the street, filling the sidewalks. What in the world? Papa muttered. Isabel pushed past Papa, elbowed her way into the crowd. A man bumped into her so hard she stumbled, and he didn't even apologize. More people rushed past them. What is it? What's happened? She asked a florid, wheezing man who was trying to break free of the crowd. The Germans are coming into Paris, he said. We must leave. I was in the Great War, I know. Isabel scoffed. Germans in Paris? Impossible. He ran away, bobbing from side to side, weaving, his hands fisting and unfisting at his sides. We must get home, Papa said, locking the bookshop door. It can't be true, she said. The worst can always be true, Papa said grimly. Stay close to me, he added, moving into the crowd. Isabel had never seen such panic. All up and down the street, lights were coming on, automobiles were starting, doors were slamming shut. People screamed to one another and reached out, trying to stay connected in the melee. Isabel stayed close to her father. The pandemonium in the street slowed them down. The metro tunnels were too crowded to navigate, so they had to walk all the way. It was nearing nightfall when they finally made it home. At their apartment building, it took her father two tries to open the main door, his hands were shaking so badly. Once in, they ignored the rickety cage elevator and hurried up five flights of stairs to their apartment. Don't turn on the lights, her father said harshly as he opened the door. Isabel followed him into the living room and went past him to the window where she lifted the blackout shade, peering out. From far away came a droning sound. As it grew louder, the window rattled, sounding like ice in a glass. She heard a high, whistling sound only seconds before she saw the black flotilla in the sky, like birds flying in formation. Aeroplanes. Bosh, her father whispered. Germans. German aeroplanes flying over Paris. The whistling sound increased, became like a woman's scream, and then somewhere, maybe in the second arrondissement, she thought, a bomb exploded in a flash of eerie bright light, and something caught fire. The air raid siren sounded. Her father wrenched the curtain shut and led her out of the apartment and down the stairs. Their neighbors were all doing the same thing, carrying coats and babies and pets down the stairs to the lobby and then down the narrow, twisting stone stairs that led to the cellar. In the dark, they sat together, crowded in close. The air stank of mildew and body odor and fear. That was the sharpest scent of all. The bombing went on and on and on, screeching and droning, the cellar walls vibrating around them, Dust fell from the ceiling. A baby started crying and couldn't be soothed. Shut that child up, please, someone snapped. I'm trying, monsieur. He is scared. So are we all. After what felt like an eternity, silence fell. It was almost worse than the noise. What of Paris was left? By the time the all-clear sounded, Isabel felt numb. Isabel? She wanted her father to reach out for her, to take her hand and comfort her, even if it was just for a moment. But he turned away from her and headed up the dark, twisting basement stairs. In their apartment, Isabel went immediately to the window, peering past the shade to look for the Eiffel Tower, it was still there, rising above a wall of thick black smoke. Don't stand by the windows, he said. She turned slowly. The only light in the room was from his torch, a sickly yellow thread in the dark. Paris won't fall, she said. 
He said nothing, frowned. She wondered if he was thinking of the Great War and what he'd seen in the trenches. Perhaps his injury was hurting again, aching in sympathy with the sound of falling bombs and hissing flames. Go to bed, Isabel. How can I possibly sleep at a time like this? He sighed. You will learn that a lot of things are possible. Chapter 5 They had been lied to by their government. They had been assured, time and time again, that the Maginot Line would keep the Germans out of France. Lies. Neither concrete and steel nor French soldiers could stop Hitler's march, and the government had run from Paris like thieves in the night. It was said they were in tour, strategizing. But what good did strategy do when Paris was to be overrun by the enemy? Are you ready? I am not going, Papa. I have told you this. She had dressed for travel, as he'd asked, in a red polka dot summer dress and low heels. We will not have this conversation again, Isabel. The Humberts will be here soon to pick you up. They will take you as far as Tours. From there, I leave it to your ingenuity to get to your sister's house. Lord knows you have always been adept at running away. So you throw me out again. Enough of this, Isabel. Your sister's husband is at the front. She is alone with her daughter. You will do as I say. You will leave Paris. Did he know how this hurt her? Did he care? You've never cared about Vianne or me, and she doesn't want me any more than you do. You're going, he said. I want to stay and fight, Papa, to be like Edith Cavell. He rolled his eyes. You remember how she died? Executed by the Germans. Papa, please. Enough. I have seen what they can do, Isabel. You have not. If it's that bad, you should come with me. And leave the apartment and bookshop to them? He grabbed her by the hand and dragged her out of the apartment and down the stairs, her straw hat and valise banging into the wall, her breath coming in gasps. At last, he opened the door and pulled her out onto the Avenue de la Bourdonnais. Chaos. Dust. Crowds. The street was a living, breathing dragon of humanity, inching forward, wheezing dirt, honking horns. People yelling for help, babies crying, and the smell of sweat heavy in the air. Automobiles clogged the area, each burdened beneath boxes and bags. People had taken whatever they could find, carts and bicycles and even children's wagons. Those who couldn't find or afford the petrol or an automobile or a bicycle walked. Hundreds, thousands of women and children held hands, shuffled forward, carrying as much as they could hold. Suitcases, picnic baskets, pets. Already the very old and very young were falling behind. Isabel didn't want to join this hopeless, helpless crowd of women and children and old people. While the young men were away, dying for them at the front, their families were leaving, heading south or west, although really, what made any of them think it would be safer there? Hitler's troops had already invaded Poland and Belgium and Czechoslovakia. The crowd engulfed them. A woman ran into Isabel, mumbled pardon, and kept walking. Isabel followed her father. I can be useful, please. I'll be a nurse or drive an ambulance. I can roll bandages or even stitch up a wound. Beside them, a horn augud. Her father looked past her, and she saw the relief that lifted his countenance. Isabel recognized that look. It meant he was getting rid of her. Again. They are here, he said. Don't send me away, she said. Please. He maneuvered her through the crowd to where a dusty black automobile was parked. It had a saggy, stained mattress strapped to its roof, 
along with a set of fishing poles and a rabbit cage with the rabbit still inside. The boot was open, but also strapped down. Inside, she saw a jumble of baskets and suitcases and lamps. Inside the automobile, Monsieur Humbert's pale, plump fingers clutched the steering wheel, as if the automobile were a horse that might bolt at any second. He was a pudgy man who spent his days in the butcher shop near Papa's bookstore. His wife, Patricia, was a sturdy woman who had the heavy jowled peasant look one saw so often in the country. She was smoking a cigarette and staring out the window as if she couldn't believe what she was seeing. Monsieur Humbert rolled down his window and poked his face into the opening. Hello, Julienne. She is ready? Papa nodded. She is ready. Merci, Edouard. Patricia leaned over to talk to Papa through the open window. We are only going as far as Orléans, and she has to pay her share of petrol. Of course. Isabel couldn't leave. It was cowardly, wrong. Papa! Au revoir, he said firmly enough to remind her that she had no choice. He nodded toward the car, and she moved numbly toward it. She opened the back door and saw three small, dirty girls lying together, eating crackers and drinking from bottles and playing with dolls. The last thing she wanted was to join them, but she pushed her way in, made a space for herself among these strangers that smelled vaguely of cheese and sausage, and closed the door. Twisting around in her seat, she stared at her father through the back window. His face held her gaze. She saw his mouth bend ever so slightly downward. It was the only hint that he saw her. The crowd surged around him like water around a rock, until all she could see was the wall of bedraggled strangers coming up behind the car. Isabel faced forward in her seat again. Out her window, a young woman stared back at her, wild eyes, hair a bird's nest, an infant suckling on her breast. The car moved slowly, sometimes inching forward, sometimes stopped for long periods of time. Isabel watched her countrymen, countrywomen, shuffle past her, looking dazed and terrified and confused. Every now and then, one of them would pound on the car bonnet or boot, begging for something. They kept the windows rolled up even though the heat in the car was stifling. At first... She was sad to be leaving. And then her anger bloomed, growing hotter even than the air in the back of this stinking car. She was so tired of being considered disposable. First, her papa had abandoned her, and then Vianne had pushed her aside. She closed her eyes to hide tears she couldn't suppress. In the darkness that smelled of sausage and sweat and smoke, with the children arguing beside her, she remembered the first time she'd been sent away. The long train ride. Isabel stuffed in beside Vianne, who did nothing but sniff and cry and pretend to sleep. And then Madame, looking down her copper pipe of a nose, saying, They will be no trouble. Although she'd been young, only four, Isabel thought she'd learned what alone meant, but she'd been wrong. In the three years she'd lived at Le Jardin, she'd at least had a sister, even if Fian was never around. Isabel remembered peering down from the upstairs window, watching Vianne and her friends from a distance, praying to be remembered, to be invited. And then when Vianne had married Antoine and fired Madame Doom, not her real name, of course, but certainly the truth, Isabel had believed she was a part of the family, but not for long. When Vianne had her miscarriage, it was instantly, Goodbye, Isabel. Three weeks later, at seven, she'd been in her first boarding school. That was when she really learned about alone. You, Isabel, did you bring food? Patricia asked. She was turned around in her seat, peering at Isabel. No. Wine? I brought money and clothes and books. Books, Patricia said dismissively and turned back around. 
That should help. Isabel looked out the window again. What other mistakes had she already made? Hours passed. The automobile made its slow, agonizing way south. Isabel was grateful for the dust. It coated the window and obscured the terrible, depressing scene. People. Everywhere. In front of them, behind them, beside them. So thick was the crowd that the automobile could only inch forward in fits and starts. It was like driving through a swarm of bees that pulled apart for a second and then swarmed again. The sun was punishingly hot. It turned the smelly automobile interior into an oven and beat down on the women outside who were shuffling toward what? No one knew what exactly was happening behind them or where safety lay ahead. The car lurched forward and stopped hard. Isabel hit the seat in front of her. The children immediately started to cry for their mother. Merde, Monsieur Humbert muttered. Monsieur Humbert, Patricia said primly. The children. An old woman pounded on the car's bonnet as she shuffled past. That's it then, Madame Humbert, he said. We are out of petrol. Patricia looked like a landed fish. What? I stopped at every chance along the way. You know I did. We have no more petrol and there's none to be had. But, well, what are we to do? We'll find a place to stay. Perhaps I can convince my brother to come fetch us. Humbert opened his automobile door, being careful not to hit anyone ambling past, and stepped out onto the dusty dirt road. See, there, a tomp is not far ahead. We'll get a room and a meal and it will all look better in the morning. Isabel sat upright. Surely she had fallen asleep and missed something. Were they going to simply abandon the automobile? You think we can walk to tour? Patricia turned around in her seat. She looked as drained and hot as Isabel felt. Perhaps one of your books can help you. Certainly they were a smarter choice than bread or water. Come, girls, out of the automobile. Isabel reached down for the valise at her feet. It was wedged in tightly and required some effort to extricate. With a growl of determination, she finally yanked it free and opened the car door and stepped out. She was immediately surrounded by people, pushed and shoved and cursed at. Someone tried to yank her suitcase out of her grasp. She fought for it, hung on. As she clutched it to her body, a woman walked past her, pushing a bicycle laden with possessions. The woman stared at Isabel hopelessly, her dark eyes revealing exhaustion. Someone else bumped into Isabel. She stumbled forward and almost fell. Only the thicket of bodies in front of her saved her from going to her knees in the dust and dirt. She heard the person beside her apologize, and Isabel was about to respond when she remembered the Humberts. She shoved her way around to the other side of the car, crying out, Monsieur Humbert! There was no answer, just the ceaseless pounding of feet on the road. She called out Patricia's name, but her cry was lost in the thud of so many feet, so many tires crunching on the dirt. People bumped her, pushed past her. If she fell to her knees, she'd be trampled and die here, alone in the throng of her countrymen. Clutching the smooth leather handle of her valise, she joined the march toward Etampes. She was still walking hours later when night fell. Her feet ached, a blister burned with every step. Hunger walked beside her, poking her insistently with its sharp little elbow. But what could she do about it? She'd packed for a visit with her sister, not an endless exodus. She had her favorite copy of Madame Bovary and the book everyone was reading, Autant en emporte le vent, and some clothes, no food or water. She'd expected that this whole journey would last a few hours, certainly not that she would be walking to Carivaux. At the top of a small rise, she came to a stop. 
Moonlight revealed thousands of people walking beside her, in front of her, behind her, jostling her, bumping into her, shoving her forward until she had no choice but to stumble along with them. Hundreds more had chosen this hillside as a resting place. Women and children were camped along the side of the road, in fields and gutters and gullies. The dirt road was littered with broken-down automobiles and belongings, forgotten, discarded, stepped on, too heavy to carry. Women and children lay entangled in the grass, or beneath trees or alongside ditches, asleep, their arms coiled around each other. Isabel came to an exhausted halt on the outskirts of Etampes. The crowd spilled out in front of her, stumbling onto the road to town. And she knew. There would be nowhere to stay in Etampes and nothing to eat. The refugees who had arrived before her would have moved through the town like locusts, buying every foodstuff on the shelves. There wouldn't be a room available. Her money would do her no good. So what should she do? Head southwest, toward Tours and Carivaux. What else? As a girl, she'd studied maps of this region in her quest to return to Paris. She knew this landscape, if only she could think. She peeled away from the crowd headed toward the collection of moonlit gray stone buildings in the distance and picked her way carefully through the valley. All around her, people were seated in the grass or sleeping beneath blankets. She could hear them moving, whispering. Hundreds of them, thousands. On the far side of the field, she found a trail that ran south along a low stone wall. Turning onto it, she found herself alone. She paused letting the feel of that settle through her, calm her. Then she began walking again. After a mile or so, the trail led her into a copse of spindly trees. She was deep in the woods, trying not to focus on the pain in her toe, the ache in her stomach, the dryness in her throat, when she smelled smoke and roasting meat. Hunger stripped her resolve and made her careless, she saw the orange glow of the fire and moved toward it. At the last minute, she realized her danger and stopped. A twig snapped beneath her foot. You may as well come over, said a male voice. You move like an elephant through the woods. Isabel froze. She knew she'd been stupid. There could be danger here for a girl alone. If I wanted you dead, you'd be dead. That was certainly true. He could have come upon her in the dark and slit her throat. She'd been paying attention to nothing except the gnawing in her empty stomach and the aroma of roasting meat. You can trust me. She stared into the darkness, trying to make him out. Couldn't. You would say that if the opposite were true, too. A laugh. We. Oui. And now, come here. I have a rabbit on the fire. She followed the glow of firelight over a rocky gully and uphill. The tree trunks around her looked silver in the moonlight. She moved lightly, ready to run in an instant. At the last tree between her and the fire, she stopped. A young man sat by the fire, leaning back against a rough trunk, one leg thrust forward, one bent at the knee. He was probably only a few years older than Isabel. It was hard to see him well in the orange glow. He had longish, stringy black hair that looked unfamiliar with a comb or soap, and clothes so tattered and patched she was reminded of the war refugees who'd so recently shuffled through Paris, hoarding cigarettes and bits of paper and empty bottles, begging for change or help. He had the pale, unwholesome look of someone who never knew where his next meal was coming from. And yet he was offering her food. I hope you are a gentleman, she said from her place in the darkness. He laughed. I'm sure you do. She stepped into the light cast by the fire. Sit, he said. She sat across from him in the grass. He leaned around the fire and handed her the bottle of wine. She took a long drink, 
So long he laughed as she handed him back the bottle and wiped wine from her chin. What a pretty drunkard you are. She had no idea how to answer that. He smiled. Gaetan Dubois. My friends call me Gate. Isabel Rosignol. Ah, a nightingale. She shrugged. It was hardly a new observation. Her surname meant nightingale. Maman had called Vianne and Isabel her nightingales as she kissed them goodnight. It was one of Isabel's few memories of her. Why are you leaving Paris? A man like you should stay and fight. They opened the prison. Apparently it is better to have us fight for France than sit behind bars when the Germans storm through. You were in prison? Does that scare you? No, it's just unexpected. You should be scared, he said, pushing the stringy hair out of his eyes. Anyway, you are safe enough with me. I have other things on my mind. I am going to check on my maman and sister and then find a regiment to join. I'll kill as many of those bastards as I can. You're lucky, she said with a sigh. Why was it so easy for men in the world to do as they wanted and so difficult for women? Come with me. Isabel knew better than to believe him. You only ask because I'm pretty, and you think I'll end up in your bed if I stay, she said. He stared across the fire at her. It cracked and hissed as fat dripped onto the flames. He took a long drink of wine and handed the bottle back to her. Near the flames, their hands touched, the barest brushing of skin on skin. I could have you in my bed right now if that's what I wanted. Not willingly, she said, swallowing hard, unable to look away. Willingly, he said in a way that made her skin prickle and made breathing difficult. But that's not what I meant, or what I said. I asked you to come with me to fight. Isabel felt something so new, she couldn't quite grasp it. She knew she was beautiful. It was simply a fact to her. People said it whenever they met her. She saw how men gazed at her with unabashed desire, remarking on her hair or green eyes or plump lips, how they looked at her breasts. She saw her beauty reflected in women's eyes, too, girls at school who didn't want her to stand too near the boys they liked, and judged her to be arrogant before she'd even spoken a word. Beauty was just another way to discount her, to not see her. She had grown used to getting attention in other ways. And she wasn't a complete innocent when it came to passion, either. Hadn't the good sisters of St. Francis expelled her for kissing a boy during Mass? But this felt different. He saw her beauty. Even in the half-light, she could tell but he looked past it. Either that, or he was smart enough to see that she wanted to offer more to the world than a pretty face. I could do something that matters, she said quietly. Of course you could. I could teach you to use a gun and a knife. I need to go to Carivo and make sure my sister is well. Her husband is at the front. He gazed at her across the fire, his expression intent. We will see your sister in Carivo and my mother in Poitiers, and then we will be off to join the war. He made it sound like such an adventure, no different from running off to join the circus, as if they would see men who swallowed swords and fat women with beards along the way. It was what she'd been looking for all of her life. A plan, then, she said, unable to hide her smile. Chapter 6 The next morning, Isabel blinked awake to see sunlight gilding the leaves rustling overhead. She sat up, re-smoothing the skirt that had hiked up in her sleep, revealing lacy white garters and ruined silk stockings. Don't do that on my account. Isabel glanced to her left and saw Gaetan coming toward her. For the first time, she saw him clearly. He was lanky, wiry as an apostrophe mark, and dressed in clothes that appeared to have come from a beggar's bin. 
Beneath a fraying cap, his face was scruffy and sharp, unshaven. He had a wide brow and a pronounced chin and deep-set gray eyes that were heavily lashed. The look in those eyes was as sharp as the point of his chin and revealed a kind of clarified hunger. Last night she'd thought it was how he looked at her. Now she saw that it was how he looked at the world. He didn't scare her, not at all. Isabel was not like her sister, Vianne, who was given to fear and anxiety. But neither was Isabel a fool. If she was going to travel with this man, she had better get a few things straight. So, she said, prison. He stared at her, raised a black eyebrow, as if to say, scared yet? A girl like you wouldn't know anything about it. I could tell you it was a Jean Valjean sort of stay, and you would think it was romantic. It was the kind of thing she heard all the time. It circled back to her looks, as most snide comments did. Surely a pretty blonde girl had to be shallow and dim-witted. Were you stealing food to feed your family? He grinned crookedly. It gave him a lopsided look, with one side of his smile hiking up farther than the other. No. Are you dangerous? It depends. What do you think of communists? Ah, so you were a political prisoner. Something like that. But like I said, a nice girl like you wouldn't know anything about survival. You'd be surprised the things I know, Gaetan. There is more than one kind of prison. Is there, pretty girl? What do you know about it? What was your crime? I took things that didn't belong to me. Is that enough of an answer? Thief. And you got caught? Obviously. That isn't exactly comforting, Gaetan. Were you careless? Gate, he said quietly, moving toward her. I haven't decided if we are friends yet. He touched her hair, let a few strands coil around his dirty finger. We are friends. Bank on it. Now let's go. When he reached for her hand, it occurred to her to refuse him, but she didn't. They walked out of the forest and back onto the road, merging once again into the crowd, which opened just enough to let them in and then closed around them. Isabel hung onto Gaetan with one hand and her suitcase with the other. They walked for miles. Automobiles died around them. Cartwheels broke. Horses stopped and couldn't be made to move again. Isabel felt herself becoming listless and dull, exhausted by heat and dust and thirst. A woman limped along beside her, crying, her tears black with dirt and grit. And then that woman was replaced by an older woman in a fur coat who was sweating profusely and seemed to be wearing every piece of jewelry she owned. The sun grew stronger, became stiflingly, staggeringly hot. Children whined. Women whimpered. The acrid, stuffy scent of body odor and sweat filled the air, but Isabel had grown so used to it that she barely noticed other people's smell or her own. It was almost three o'clock, the hottest part of the day, when they saw a regiment of French soldiers walking alongside them, dragging their rifles. The soldiers moved in a disorganized way, not in formation, not smartly. A tank rumbled beside them, crunching over the belongings left in the road. On it, several way-faced French soldiers slumped, their heads hung low. Isabel pulled free of Gaetan and stumbled through the crowd, elbowing her way to the regiment. You're going the wrong way, she screamed, surprised to hear how hoarse her voice was. Gaetan pounced on a soldier, shoved him back so hard he stumbled and crashed into a slow-moving tank. Who is fighting for France? The bleary-eyed soldier shook his head. No one. In a glint of silver, Isabel saw the knife Gaetan held to the man's throat. The soldier's gaze narrowed. Go ahead. Do it. Kill me. Isabel pulled Gaetan away. In his eyes, 
She saw a rage so deep it scared her. He could do it. He could kill this man by slitting his throat. And she thought, they opened the prisons. Was he worse than a thief? Gate, she said. Her voice got through to him. He shook his head as if to clear it and lowered his knife. Who is fighting for us? He said bitterly, coughing at the dust. We will be, she said, soon. Behind her, an automobile honked its horn. Auga. Isabel ignored it. Automobiles were no better than walking anymore. The few that were still running were moving only at the whim of the people around them, like flotsam in the reeds of a muddy river. Come on. She pulled him away from the demoralized regiment. They walked on, still holding hands. But as the hours passed, Isabel noticed a change in Gaetan. He rarely spoke and didn't smile. At each town, the crowd thinned. People stumbled into Artenay, Saran, and Orléans, their eyes alight with desperation as they reached into handbags and pockets and wallets for money they hoped to be able to spend. Still, Isabel and Gaetan kept going. They walked all day and fell into exhausted sleep in the dark and woke again to walk the next day. By their third day, Isabel was numb with exhaustion. Oozing red blisters had formed between most of her toes and on the balls of her feet, and every step was painful. Dehydration gave her a terrible, pounding headache, and hunger gnawed at her empty stomach. Dust clogged her throat and eyes and made her cough constantly. She stumbled past a freshly dug grave on the side of the road, marked by a crudely hammered-together wooden cross. Her shoe caught on something, a dead cat, and she staggered forward, almost falling to her knees. Gaetan steadied her. She clung to his hand, remained stubbornly upright. How much later was it that she heard something? An hour? A day? Bees. They buzzed around her head. She batted them away, she licked her dried lips and thought of pleasant days in the garden with bees buzzing about. No, not bees. She knew that sound. She stopped, frowning. Her thoughts were addled. What had she been trying to remember? The droning grew louder, filling the air. And then the aeroplanes appeared, six or seven of them, looking like small crucifixes against the blue and cloudless sky. Isabel tented a hand over her eyes, watching the airplanes fly closer, lower. Someone yelled, It's the Bosch! In the distance, a stone bridge exploded in a spray of fire and stone and smoke. The airplanes dropped lower over the crowd. Gaetan threw Isabel to the ground and covered her body with his. The world became pure sound. The roar of the aeroplane engines, the rat-a-tat-tat of machine gun fire, the beat of her heart, people screaming. Bullets ate up the grass in rows. People screamed and cried out. Isabel saw a woman fly into the air like a rag doll and hit the ground in a heap. Trees snapped in half and fell over. People yelled. Flames burst into existence. Smoke filled the air. And then, quiet. Gaetan rolled off her. Are you all right? He asked. She pushed the hair from her eyes and sat up. There were mangled bodies everywhere, and fires, and billowing black smoke. People were screaming, crying, dying. An old man moaned, Help me! Isabel crawled to him on her hands and knees, realizing as she got close that the ground was marshy with his blood. A stomach wound gaped through his ripped shirt. Entrails bulged out of the torn flesh. Maybe there's a doctor, was all she could think of to say. And then she heard it again, the droning. They're coming back. Gaetan pulled her to her feet. 
she almost slipped in the blood-soaked grass. Not far away, a bomb hit, exploding into fire. Isabel saw a toddler in soiled nappies standing by a dead woman crying. She stumbled toward the toddler. Gaetan yanked her sideways. I have to help. Your dying won't help that kid, he growled, pulling her so hard it hurt. She stumbled along beside him in a daze. They dodged discarded automobiles and bodies, most of which were ripped beyond repair, bleeding, bones sticking out through clothes. At the edge of town, Gaetan pulled Isabel into a small stone church. Others were already there, crouching in corners, hiding amidst the pews, hugging their loved ones close. Aeroplanes roared overhead, accompanied by the stuttering shriek of machine guns. The stained glass window shattered. Bits of colored glass clattered to the floor, slicing through skin on the way down. Timbers cracked. Dust and stones fell. Bullets ran across the church, nailing arms and legs to the floor. The altar exploded. Gaetan said something to her, and she answered, or she thought she did, but she wasn't sure, and before she could figure it out, another bomb whistled, fell, and the roof over her head exploded. Chapter 7 The École Elementaire was not a big school by city standards, but it was spacious and well laid out, plenty large enough for the children of the Commune of Carivaux. Before its life as a school, the building had been stables for a rich landowner, and thus its U-shaped design. The central courtyard had been a gathering place for carriages and tradesmen. It boasted gray stone walls, bright blue shutters, and wooden floors. The manor house, to which it had once been aligned, had been bombed in the Great War and never rebuilt. Like so many schools in the small towns of France, it stood on the far edge of town. Vianne was in her classroom, behind her desk, staring out at the shining children's faces in front of her, dabbing her upper lip with her wrinkled handkerchief. On the floor, by each child's desk, was the obligatory gas mask. Children now carried them everywhere. The open windows and thick stone walls helped to keep the sun at bay, but still the heat was stifling. Lord knew it was hard enough to concentrate without the added burden of the heat. The news from Paris was terrible, terrifying. All anyone could talk about was the gloomy future and the shocking present. Germans in Paris. The Maginot Line broken. French soldiers dead in trenches and running from the front. For the last three nights, since the telephone call from her father, she hadn't slept. Isabel was God knew where between Paris and Carivaux, and there had been no word from Antoine. Who wants to conjugate the verb courir for me? she asked tiredly. Shouldn't we be learning German? Vianne realized what she'd just been asked. The students were interested now, sitting upright, their eyes bright. Pardon, she said, clearing her throat, buying time. We should be learning German, not French. It was young Gilles Fournier, the butcher's son. His father and all three of his older brothers had gone off to the war, leaving only him and his mother to run the family's butcher shop. And shooting, Francois agreed, nodding his head. My maman says we will need to know how to shoot Germans, too. My grand-mère says we should all just leave, said Claire. She remembers the last war, and she says we are fools for staying. The Germans won't cross the war, will they, Madame Moriac? In the front row center, Sophie sat forward in her seat, her hands clasped atop the wooden desk, her eyes wide. She had been as upset by the rumors as Vianne. The child had cried herself to sleep two nights in a row, worrying over her father. Now Bebe came to school with her. Sarah sat in the desk beside her best friend, looking equally fearful. It is all right to be afraid, Vianne said, moving toward them. It was what she'd said to Sophie last night and to herself, but the words rang hollow. I'm not afraid, Gilles said. I got a knife. 
I'll kill any dirty Bosch who show up in Caivo. Sarah's eyes widened. They're coming here? No, Vian said. The denial didn't come easily. Her own fear caught at the word, stretched it out. The French soldiers, your fathers and uncles and brothers, are the bravest men in the world. I'm sure they are fighting for Paris and Tours and Orléans even as we speak. But Paris is overrun, Gilles said. What happened to the French soldiers at the front? In wars, there are battles and skirmishes, losses along the way. But our men will never let the Germans win. We will never give up. She moved closer to her students. But we have a part to play, too. Those of us left behind. We have to be brave and strong, too, and not believe the worst. We have to keep on with our lives so our fathers and brothers and husbands have lives to come home to, we? Oui? But what about Tante Isabelle? Sophie asked. Grandpère said she should have been here by now. My cousin ran from Paris, too, Francois said. He has not arrived here, either. My uncle says it is bad on the roads. The bell rang, and students popped from their seats like springs. In an instant, the war, the airplanes, the fear were forgotten. They were eight- and nine-year-olds, freed at the end of a summer school day, and they acted like it, yelling, laughing, talking all at once, pushing one another aside running for the door. Vianne was thankful for the bell. She was a teacher, for God's sake. What did she know to say about dangers such as these? How could she assuage a child's fear when her own was straining at the leash? She busied herself with ordinary tasks, gathering up the detritus that sixteen children left behind, banging chalk from the soft erasers, putting books away. When everything was as it should be, she put her papers and pencils into her own leather satchel and took her handbag out of the desk's bottom drawer. Then she put on her straw hat, pinned it in place, and left her classroom. She walked down the quiet hallways, waving to colleagues who were still in their classrooms. Several of the rooms were closed up now that the male teachers had been mobilized. At Rachel's classroom, she paused, watching as Rachel put her son in his pram and wheeled it toward the door. Rachel had been planning to take this term off from teaching to stay home with Ari, but the war had changed all of that. Now she had no choice but to bring her baby to work with her. You look like I feel, Vian said as her friend neared. Rachel's dark hair had responded to the humidity and doubled in size. That can't be a compliment, but I'm desperate, so I'm taking it as one. You have chalk on your cheek, by the way. Vianne wiped her cheek absently and leaned over the pram. The baby was sleeping soundly. How's he doing? For a ten-month-old who is supposed to be at home with his maman and is instead gallivanting around town beneath enemy aeroplanes and listening to ten-year-old students shriek all day? Fine. She smiled and pushed a damp ringlet from her face as they headed down the corridor. Do I sound bitter? No more than the rest of us. Ha! Bitterness would do you good. All that smiling and pretending of yours would give me hives. Rachel bumped the pram down the three stone steps and onto the walkway that led to the grassy play area that had once been an exercise arena for horses and a delivery area for tradesmen. A 400-year-old stone fountain gurgled and dripped water in the center of the yard. Come on, girls, Rachel called out to Sophie and Sarah, who were sitting together on a park bench. The girls responded immediately and fell into step ahead of the women, chattering constantly, their heads cocked together, their hands clasped, a second generation of best friends. They turned into an alleyway and came out on Rue Victor Hugo, right in front of a bistro, where old men sat on ironwork chairs drinking coffee and smoking cigarettes and talking politics. Ahead of them, Vian saw a haggard trio of women limping along, their clothes tattered, their faces yellow with dust. Poor women, Rachel said with a sigh. 
Helene Ruel told me this morning that at least a dozen refugees came to town late last night. The stories they bring are not good, but no one embellishes a story like Helene. Ordinarily, Vianne would make a comment about what a gossip Helene was, but she couldn't be glib. According to Papa, Isabel had left Paris days ago. She still hadn't arrived at Le Jardin. I'm worried about Isabel, she said. Rachel linked her arm through Vianne's. Do you remember the first time your sister ran away from that boarding school in Lyon? She was seven years old. She made it all the way to Amboise, alone, with no money. She spent two nights in the woods and talked her way onto the train. Vianne barely remembered anything of that time except for her own grief. When she'd lost the first baby, she'd fallen into despair. The lost year, Antoine called it. That was how she thought of it, too. When Antoine told her he was taking Isabel to Paris and to Papa, Vianne had been, God help her, relieved. Was it any surprise that Isabel had run away from the boarding school to which she'd been sent? To this day, Vianne felt an abiding shame at how she'd treated her baby sister. She was nine the first time she made it to Paris, Vianne said, trying to find comfort in the familiar story. Isabel was tough and driven and determined. She always had been. If I'm not mistaken, she was expelled two years later for running away from school to see a traveling circus. Or was that when she climbed out of the second-floor dormitory window using a bedsheet? Rachel smiled. The point is, Isabel will make it here if that's what she wants. God help anyone who tries to stop her. She will arrive any day, I promise, unless she has met an exiled prince and fallen desperately in love. That is the kind of thing that could happen to her. You see? Rachel teased. You feel better already. Now come to my house for lemonade. It's just the thing on a day this hot. After supper, Vianne got Sophie settled into bed and went downstairs. She was too worried to relax. The silence in her house kept reminding her that no one had come to her door. She could not remain still. Regardless of her conversation with Rachel, she couldn't dispel her worry and a terrible sense of foreboding about Isabel. Vianne stood up, sat down, then stood up again and walked to the front door, opening it. Outside, the fields lay beneath a purple and pink evening sky. Her yard was a series of familiar shapes. Well-tended apple trees stood protectively between the front door and the rose and vine-covered stone wall, beyond which lay the road to town and acres and acres of fields, studded here and there with thickets of narrow-trunked trees. Off to the right was the deeper woods, where she and Antoine had often sneaked off to be alone when they were younger. Antoine. Isabel. Where were they? Was he at the front? Was she walking from Paris? Don't think about it. She needed to do something. Gardening. Keep her mind on something else. Retrieving her worn gardening gloves and stepping into the boots by the door, she made her way to the garden, positioned on a flat patch of land between the shed and the barn. Potatoes, onions, carrots, broccoli, peas, beans, cucumbers, tomatoes, and radishes grew in its carefully tended beds. On the hillside between the garden and the barn were the berries, raspberries and blackberries in carefully contained rows. She knelt down in the rich, black dirt and began pulling weeds. Early summer was usually a time of promise. Certainly things could go wrong in this most ardent season, but if one remained steady and calm and didn't shirk the all-important duties of weeding and thinning, the plants could be guided and tamed. Vianne always made sure that the beds were precisely organized and tended with a firm yet gentle hand. Even more important than what she gave her garden was what it gave her. In it, she found a sense of calm. She became aware of something wrong slowly, in pieces, First, 
There was a sound that didn't belong, a vibration, a thudding, and then a murmur. The odors came next. Something wholly at odds with her sweet garden smell, something acrid and sharp that made her think of decay. Vian wiped her forehead, aware that she was smearing black dirt across her skin, and stood up. Tucking her dirty gloves in the gaping hip pockets of her pants, she rose to her feet and moved toward her gate. Before she reached it, a trio of women appeared, as if sculpted out of the shadows. They stood clumped together in the road just behind her gate. An old woman, dressed in rags, held the others close to her, a young woman with a babe in arms, and a teenage girl who held an empty birdcage in one hand and a shovel in the other. Each looked glassy-eyed and feverish. The young mother was clearly trembling. Their faces were dripping with sweat. Their eyes were filled with defeat. The old woman held out dirty, empty hands. Can you spare some water? She asked. But even as she asked her the question, she looked unconvinced, beaten. Vianne opened the gate. Of course, would you like to come in? Sit down, perhaps? The old woman shook her head. We are ahead of them. There is nothing for those in the back. Vian didn't know what the woman meant, but it didn't matter. She could see that the women were suffering from exhaustion and hunger. Just a moment. She went into the house and packed them some bread and raw carrots and a small bit of cheese, all that she had to spare. She filled a wine bottle with water and returned, offering them the provisions. It's not much, she said. It is more than we've had since Tour, the young woman said in a toneless voice. You were in Tour? Vian asked. Drink Sabine, the old woman said, holding the water to the girl's lips. Vian was about to ask about Isabel when the old woman said sharply, They're here. The young mother made a moaning sound and tightened her hold on the baby, who was so quiet, and his tiny fist so blue, that Vian gasped. The baby was dead. Vian knew about the kind of talon grief that wouldn't let go. She had fallen into the fathomless gray that warped a mind and made a mother keep holding on long after hope was gone. Go inside, the old woman said to Vian. Lock your doors. But... The ragged trio backed away, lurched, really, as if Vian's breath had become noxious. And then she saw the mass of black shapes moving across the field and coming up the road. The smell preceded them. Human sweat and filth and body odor. As they neared, the miasma of black separated, peeled into forms. She saw people on the road and in the fields, walking, limping, coming toward her. Some were pushing bicycles or prams or dragging wagons. Dogs barked, babies cried. There was coughing, throat clearing, whining. They came forward, through the field and up the road, relentlessly moving closer, pushing one another aside, their voices rising. Vian couldn't help so many. She rushed into her house and locked the door behind her. Inside, she went from room to room, locking doors and closing shutters. When she was finished, she stood in the living room, uncertain, her heart pounding. The house began to shake just a little. The windows rattled. The shutters thumped against the stone exterior. Dust rained down from the exposed timbers of the ceiling. Someone pounded on the front door. It went on and on and on, fists landing on the front door in hammer blows that made Vian flinch. Sophie came running down the stairs, clutching Bebe to her chest. Maman! Vian opened her arms, and Sophie ran into her embrace. Vian held her daughter close as the onslaught increased. Someone pounded on the side door. The copper pots and pans hanging in the kitchen clanged together, made a sound like church bells. She heard the high squealing of the outdoor pump. They were getting water. 
Vian said to Sophie. Wait here one moment. Sit on the divan. Don't leave me. Vian peeled her daughter away and forced her to sit down. Taking an iron poker from the side of the fireplace, she crept cautiously up the stairs. From the safety of her bedroom, she peered out the window, careful to remain hidden. There were dozens of people in her yard, mostly women and children, moving like a pack of hungry wolves. Their voices melded into a single, desperate growl. Vianne backed away. What if the doors didn't hold? So many people could break down doors and windows, even walls. Terrified, she went back downstairs, not breathing until she saw Sophie still safe on the divan. Vianne sat down beside her daughter and took her in her arms, letting Sophie curl up as if she were a much littler girl. She stroked her daughter's curly hair. A better mother, a stronger mother, would have had a story to tell right now. But Vianne was so afraid that her voice had completely gone. All she could think was an endless, beginningless prayer. Please. She pulled Sophie closer and said, Go to sleep, Sophie. I'm here. Maman, Sophie said, her voice almost lost in the pounding on the door. What if Tante Isabelle is out there? Vianne stared down at Sophie's small, earnest face, covered now in a sheen of sweat and dust. God help her, was all she could think of to say. At the sight of the gray stone house, Isabel felt a wash in exhaustion. Her shoulders sagged. The blisters on her feet became unbearable. In front of her, Gaetan opened the gate. She heard it clatter brokenly and tilt sideways. Leaning into him, she stumbled up to the front door. She knocked twice, wincing each time her bloodied knuckles hit the wood. No one answered. She pounded with both of her fists, trying to call out her sister's name, but her voice was too hoarse to find any volume. She staggered back, almost sinking to her knees in defeat. Where can you sleep? Gaetan said, holding her upright with his hand on her waist. In the back, the pergola. He led her around the house to the backyard. In the lush, jasmine-perfumed shadows of the arbor, she collapsed to her knees. She hardly noticed that he was gone, and then he was back with some tepid water, which she gulped from his cupped hands. It wasn't enough. Her stomach gnarled with hunger, sent an ache deep, deep inside of her. Still, when he started to leave again, she reached out for him, mumbled something, a plea not to be left alone, and he sank down beside her, putting out his arm for her to rest her head upon. They lay side by side in the warm dirt, staring up through the black thicket of vines that looped around the timbers and cascaded to the ground. The heady aromas of jasmine and blooming roses and rich earth created a beautiful bower. And yet, even here, in this quiet, it was impossible to forget what they'd just been through and the changes that were close on their heels. She had seen a change in Gaetan, watched anger and impotent rage erase the compassion in his eyes and the smile from his lips. He had hardly spoken since the bombing, and when he did, his voice was clipped and curt. They both knew more about war now, about what was coming. You could be safe here with your sister, he said. I don't want to be safe, and my sister will not want me. She twisted around to look at him. Moonlight came through in lacy patterns, illuminating his eyes, his mouth, leaving his nose and chin in darkness. He looked different again, older already, in just these few days, careworn, angry. He smelled of sweat and blood and mud and death, but she knew she smelled the same. Have you heard of Edith Cavell? she asked. Do I strike you as an educated man? She thought about that for a moment and then said, 
Yes. He was quiet long enough that she knew she'd surprised him. I know who she is. She saved the lives of hundreds of Allied airmen in the Great War. She is famous for saying that patriotism is not enough. And this is your hero? A woman executed by the enemy. A woman who made a difference, Isabel said, studying him. I am relying on you, a criminal and a communist, to help me make a difference. Perhaps I am as mad and impetuous as they say. Who are they? Everyone. She paused, felt her expectation gather close. She had made a point of never trusting anyone, and yet she believed Gaetan. He looked at her as if she mattered. You will take me, as you promised. You know how such bargains are sealed? How? With a kiss. Quit teasing, this is serious. What is more serious than a kiss on the brink of war? He was smiling, but not quite. That banked anger was in his eyes again, and it frightened her, reminded her that she really didn't know him at all. I would kiss a man who was brave enough to take me into battle with him. I think you know nothing of kissing, he said with a sigh. Shows what you know. She rolled away from him and immediately missed his touch. Trying to be nonchalant, she rolled back to face him and felt his breath on her eyelashes. You may kiss me then, to seal our deal. He reached out slowly, put a hand around the back of her neck, and pulled her toward him. Are you sure? he asked, his lips almost touching hers. She didn't know if he was asking about going off to war or granting permission for a kiss, but right now, in this moment, it didn't matter. Isabel had traded kisses with boys as if they were pennies to be left on park benches and lost in chair cushions, meaningless. Never before, not once, had she really yearned for a kiss. We, oui, she whispered, leaning toward him. At his kiss, something opened up inside the scraped, empty interior of her heart, unfurled. For the first time, her romantic novels made sense. She realized that the landscape of a woman's soul could change as quickly as a world at war. I love you, she whispered. She hadn't said these words since she was four years old. Then it had been to her mother. At her declaration, Gaetan's expression changed, hardened. The smile he gave her was so tight and false she couldn't make sense of it. What? Did I do something wrong? No, of course not, he said. We are lucky to have found each other, she said. We are not lucky, Isabel. Trust me on this. As he said it, he drew her in for another kiss. She gave herself over to the sensation of the kiss, let it become the whole of her universe, and knew finally how it felt to be enough for someone. When Vianna woke, she noticed the quiet first. Somewhere a bird sang. She lay perfectly still in bed, listening. Beside her, Sophie snored and grumbled in her sleep. Vianne went to the window, lifting the blackout shade. In her yard, apple branches hung like broken arms from the trees. The gate hung sideways, two of its three hinges ripped out. Across the road... The hayfield was flattened, the flowers crushed. The refugees who'd come through had left belongings and refuse in their wake. Suitcases, buggies, coats too heavy to carry and too hot to wear, pillowcases and wagons. Vianne went downstairs and cautiously opened the front door. Listening for noise, hearing none, she unlatched the lock and turned the knob. They had destroyed her garden ripping up anything that looked edible, leaving broken stalks and mounds of dirt. Everything was ruined, gone. Feeling defeated, she walked around the house to the backyard, which had also been ravaged. 
She was about to go back inside when she heard a sound. A mewling. Maybe a baby crying. There it was again. Had someone left an infant behind? She moved cautiously across the yard to the wooden pergola draped in roses and jasmine. Isabel lay curled up on the ground, her dress ripped to shreds, her face cut up and bruised, her left eye swollen nearly shut, a piece of paper pinned to her bodice. Isabel! Her sister's chin tilted upward slightly. She opened one bloodshot eye. V, she said in a cracked, hoarse voice. Thanks for locking me out. Vianne went to her sister and knelt beside her. Isabel, you are covered in blood and bruised. Were you... Isabel seemed not to understand for a moment. Oh, it is not my blood. Most of it isn't anyway. She looked around. Where's Gate? What? Isabel staggered to her feet, almost toppling over. Did he leave me? He did. She started to cry. He left me. Come on, Vian said gently. She guided her sister into the cool interior of the house, where Isabel kicked off her blood-spattered shoes, let them crack into the wall and clatter to the floor. Bloody footprints followed them into the bathroom tucked beneath the stairs. While Vianne heated water and filled the bath, Isabel sat on the floor, her legs splayed out, her feet discolored by blood, muttering to herself and wiping tears from her eyes, which turned to mud on her cheeks. When the bath was ready, Vianne returned to Isabel, gently undressing her. Isabel was like a child, pliable, whimpering in pain. Vianne unbuttoned the back of Isabel's once red dress and peeled it away, afraid that the slightest breath might topple her sister over. Isabel's lacy undergarments were stained in places with blood. Vianne unlaced the corseted midsection of the foundation and eased it off. Isabel gritted her teeth and stepped into the tub. Lean back. Isabel did as she was told, and Vianne poured hot water over her sister's head, keeping the water from her sister's eyes. All the while, as she washed Isabel's dirty hair and bruised body, she kept up a steady, soothing croon of meaningless words meant to comfort. She helped Isabel out of the tub and dried her body with a soft white towel. Isabel stared at her, slack-jawed, blank-eyed. How about some sleep? Vianne said. Sleep, Isabel mumbled, her head lolling to one side. Vianne brought Isabel a nightdress that smelled of lavender and rose water and helped her into it. Isabel could hardly keep her eyes open as Vianne guided her to the upstairs bedroom and settled her beneath a light blanket. Isabel was asleep before her head hit the pillow. Isabel woke to darkness. She remembered daylight. Where was she? She sat up so quickly her head spun. She took a few shallow breaths and then looked around. The upstairs bedroom at Le Jardin, her old room, it did not give her a warm feeling. How often had Madame Doom locked her in the bedroom for her own good? Don't think about that, she said aloud. An even worse memory followed. Gaetan. He had abandoned her after all. It filled her with the kind of bone-deep disappointment she knew so well. Had she learned nothing in life? People left. She knew that. They especially left her. She dressed in the shapeless blue house dress Vianne had left draped across the foot of the bed. Then she went down the narrow, shallow-stepped stairs, holding on to the iron banister. Every pain-filled step felt like a triumph. Downstairs, the house was quiet, except for the crackling, staticky sound of a radio on at low volume. She was pretty sure Marie Chevalier was singing a love song. Perfect. Vianne was in the kitchen, 
wearing a gingham apron over a pale yellow house dress. A floral scarf covered her hair. She was peeling potatoes with a paring knife. Behind her, a cast iron pot made a cheery little bubbling sound. The aromas made Isabel's mouth water. Vianne rushed forward to pull out a chair at the small table in the kitchen's corner. Here, sit. Isabel fell onto the seat. Vianne brought her a plate that was already prepared. A hunk of still warm bread, a triangle of cheese, a smear of quince paste, and a few slices of ham. Isabel took the bread in her red, scraped-up hands, lifting it up to her face, breathing in the yeasty smell. Her hands were shaking as she picked up a knife and slathered the bread with fruit and cheese. When she set down the knife, it clattered. She picked up the bread and bit into it, the single best bite of food of her life. The hard crust of the bread, its pillow-soft interior, the buttery cheese and the fruit all combined to make her practically swoon. She ate the rest of it like a madwoman, barely noticing the cup of café noir her sister had set down beside her. Where's Sophie? Isabel asked, her cheeks bulging with food. It was difficult to stop eating, even to be polite. She reached for a peach, felt its fuzzy ripeness in her hands and bit into it. Juice dribbled down her chin. She's next door, playing with Sarah. You remember my friend, Rachel? I remember her, Isabel said. Vianne poured herself a tiny cup of espresso and brought it to the table, where she sat down. Isabel burped and covered her mouth. Pardon me. I think a lapse in manners can be overlooked, Vianne said with a smile. You haven't met Madame Dufour. No doubt she would hit me with a brick for that transgression, Isabel sighed. Her stomach hurt now. She felt like she might vomit. She wiped her moist chin with her sleeve. What is the news from Paris? The swastika flag flies from the Eiffel Tower. And Papa? Fine, he says. Worried about me, I'll bet, Isabel said bitterly. He shouldn't have sent me away. But when has he ever done anything else? A look passed between them. It was one of the few memories they shared, that abandonment but clearly Vianne didn't want to remember it. We hear there were more than ten million of you on the roads. The crowds weren't the worst of it, Isabel said. We were mostly women and children, V, and old men and boys, and they just obliterated us. It's over now, thank God, Vianne said. It's best to focus on the good. Who is Gaetan? You spoke of him in your delirium. Isabel picked at one of the scrapes on the back of her hand, realizing an instant too late that she should have let it alone. The scab ripped away and blood bubbled up. Maybe he has to do with this, Vianne said when the silence elongated. She pulled a crumpled piece of paper out of her apron pocket. It was the note that had been pinned to Isabel's bodice. Dirty, bloody fingerprints ran across the paper. On it was written... You are not ready. Isabel felt the world drop out from under her. It was a ridiculous, girlish reaction, overblown, and she knew it, but still it hit her hard, wounded deep. He had wanted to take her with him until the kiss. Somehow he'd tasted the lack in her. He's no one, she said grimly, taking the note, crumpling it. Just a boy with black hair and a sharp face who tells lies. He's nothing. Then she looked at Vianne. I'm going off to the war. I don't care what anyone thinks. I'll drive an ambulance or roll bandages, anything. Oh, for heaven's sake, Isabel. Paris is overrun. The Nazis control the city. What is an 18-year-old girl to do about all of that? I am not going to hide out in the country while the Nazis destroy France. And let's face it, you have never exactly felt sisterly toward me. Her aching face tightened. I'll be leaving as soon as I can walk. You will be safe here, Isabelle. That's what matters. 
You must stay. Safe, Isabel spat. You think that is what matters now, Vian? Let me tell you what I saw out there. French troops running away from the enemy. Nazis murdering innocents. Maybe you can ignore that, but I won't. You will stay here and be safe. We will speak of it no more. When have I ever been safe with you, Vian? Isabel said, seeing hurt blossom in her sister's eyes. I was young, Isabel. I tried to be a mother to you. Oh, please, let's not start with a lie. After I lost the baby, Isabel turned her back on her sister and limped away before she said something unforgivable. She clasped her hands to still their trembling. This was why she hadn't wanted to return to this house and see her sister, why she'd stayed away for years. There was too much pain between them. She turned up the radio to drown out her thoughts. A voice crackled over the airwaves. Maréchal Pétain speaking to you. Isabel frowned. Pétain was a hero of the Great War, a beloved leader of France. She turned up the volume further. Vianne appeared beside her. I assume the direction of the government of France. Static overtook his deep voice, crackled through it. Isabel thumped the radio impatiently. Our admirable army, which is fighting with a heroism worthy of its long military traditions against an enemy superior in numbers and arms. Static. Isabel hit the radio again, whispering, Suit! In these painful hours I think of the unhappy refugees who in extreme misery clog our roads. I express to them my compassion and my solicitude. It is with a broken heart that I tell you today it is necessary to stop fighting. We've won, Vian said. Shh, Isabel said sharply. Addressed myself last night to the adversary to ask him if he is ready to speak with me as soldier to soldier after the actual fighting is over and with honor the means of putting an end to hostilities. The old man's words droned on, saying things like trying days, control their anguish, and worst of all, destiny of the fatherland. Then he said the word Isabel never thought she'd hear in France. Surrender. Isabel hobbled out of the room on her bloody feet and went into the backyard, needing air suddenly, unable to draw a decent breath. Surrender. France. To Hitler. It must be for the best, her sister said calmly. When had Vian come out here? You've heard about Maréchal Pétain. He is a hero unparalleled. If he says we must quit fighting, we must. I'm sure he'll reason with Hitler. Vian reached out. Isabel yanked away. The thought of Vian's comforting touch made her feel sick. She limped around to face her sister. You don't reason with men like Hitler. So you know more than our heroes now? I know we shouldn't give up. Vian made a tisking sound, a little scuff of disappointment. If Marshal Pétain thinks surrender is best for France, it is, period. At least the war will be over and our men will come home. You are a fool, Vian said. Fine, and went back into the house. Isabel tented a hand over her eyes and stared up into the bright and cloudless sky. How long would it be before all this blue was filled with German airplanes? She didn't know how long she stood there, imagining the worst, remembering how the Nazis had opened fire on innocent women and children in Tours, obliterating them, turning the grass red with their blood. Don't Isabel? Isabel heard the small, tentative voice as if from far away. She turned slowly. A beautiful girl stood at Le Jardin's back door. She had skin like her mother's, as pale as fine porcelain, and expressive eyes that appeared coal black from this distance, as dark as her father's. She could have stepped from the pages of a fairy tale, 
Snow White or Sleeping Beauty. You can't be Sophie, Isabel said. The last time I saw you, you were sucking your thumb. I still do sometimes, Sophie said with a conspiratorial smile. You won't tell? Me? I am the best of secret keepers, Isabel moved toward her, thinking, my niece, family. Shall I tell you a secret about me, just so that we are fair? Sophie nodded earnestly, her eyes widening. I can make myself invisible. No, you can't. Isabel saw Vianne appear at the back door. Ask your mamma. I have sneaked onto trains and climbed out of windows and run away from convent dungeons. All of this because I can disappear. Isabelle, Vianne said sternly. Sophie stared up at Isabel, enraptured. Really? Isabel glanced at Vianne. It is easy to disappear when no one is looking at you. I am looking at you, Sophie said. Will you make yourself invisible now? Isabel laughed. Of course not. Magic, to be its best, must be unexpected. Don't you agree? And now, shall we play a game of checkers? Chapter 8 The surrender was a bitter pill to swallow. But Maréchal Pétain was an honorable man, a hero of the last war with Germany. Yes, he was old, but Vianne shared the belief that this only gave him a better perspective from which to judge their circumstances. He had fashioned a way for their men to come home, so it wouldn't be like the Great War. Vianne understood what Isabel could not. Pétain had surrendered on behalf of France to save lives and preserve their nation and their way of life. It was true that the terms of this surrender were difficult. France had been divided into two zones, the occupied zone, the north half of the country and the coastal regions, including Carivaux, was to be taken over and governed by the Nazis. The great middle of the country, the land that lay below Paris and above the sea, would be the free zone, governed by a new French government in Vichy, led by Maréchal Pétain himself, in collaboration with the Nazis. Immediately upon France's surrender, food became scarce. Laundry soap, unobtainable. Ration cards could not be counted upon. Phone service became unreliable, as did the mail. The Nazis effectively cut off communication between cities and towns. The only mail allowed was on official German postcards. But for Vianne, these were not the worst of the changes. Isabel became impossible to live with. Several times since the surrender, while Vianne toiled to reconstruct and replant her garden and repair her damaged fruit trees, she had paused in her work and seen Isabel standing at the back gate, staring up at the sky, as if some dark and horrible thing were headed this way. All Isabel could talk about was the monstrosity of the Nazis and their determination to kill the French. She had no ability, of course, to hold her tongue, and since Vianne refused to listen, Sophie became her sister's audience, her acolyte. Isabel filled poor Sophie's head with terrible images of what would happen, so much so that the child had nightmares. Vianne dared not leave the two of them alone, and so today, like each of the previous days, she made them both come to town with her to see what their ration cards would get them. They had been standing in a food queue at the butcher's shop for two hours already. Isabel had been complaining nearly that whole time. Apparently, it made no sense to her that she should have to shop for food. Vianne, look, Isabel said. More dramatics. Vianne, look! She turned, just to silence her sister, and saw them. Germans. Up and down the street, windows and doors slammed shut. People disappeared so quickly, Vianne found herself suddenly standing alone on the sidewalk with her sister and daughter. She grabbed Sophie and pulled her against the butcher shop's closed door. Isabel stepped defiantly into the street. Isabel! 
Vian hissed. But Isabel stood her ground, her green eyes bright with hatred, her pale, fine-boned, beautiful face marred by scratches and bruises. The green lorry in the lead came to a halt in front of Isabel. In the back, soldiers sat on benches, facing one another, rifles laid casually across their laps. They looked young and clean-shaven and eager in brand-new helmets with medals glinting on their gray-green uniforms. Young, most of all. Not monsters, just boys, really. They craned their necks to see what had stopped traffic. At the sight of Isabel standing there, the soldiers started to smile and wave. Vian grabbed Isabel's hand and yanked her out of the way. The military entourage rumbled past them, a string of vehicles and motorcycles and lorries covered in camouflaged netting. Armored tanks rolled thunderously on the cobblestone street. And then came the soldiers. Two long lines of them, marching into town. Isabel walked boldly alongside them up Rue Victor Hugo. The Germans waved to her, looking more like tourists than conquerors. Maman, you can't let her go off by herself, Sophie said. Merde, Vian clutched Sophie's hand and ran after Isabel. They caught up with her in the next block. The town square, usually full of people, had practically emptied. Only a few townspeople dared to remain as the German vehicles pulled up in front of the town hall and parked. An officer appeared. Or Vian assumed he was an officer because of the way he began barking orders. Soldiers marched around the large cobblestone square, claiming it with their overwhelming presence. They ripped down the flag of France and replaced it with their Nazi flag, a huge black swastika against a red and black background. When it was in place, the troops stopped as one, extended their right arms, and yelled, Heil Hitler! If I had a gun, Isabel said, I'd show them not all of us wanted to surrender. Shh, Vian said. You'll get us all killed with that mouth of yours. Let's go. No, I want... Vian spun to face Isabel. Enough. You will not draw attention to us. Is that understood? Isabel gave one last hate-filled glance at the marching soldiers and then let Vian lead her away. They slipped from the main street and entered a dark cleft in the walls that led to a back alley behind the milliner's shop. They could hear the soldiers singing. Then a shot rang out, and another. Someone screamed. Isabel stopped. Don't you dare, Vianne said. Move. They kept to the dark alleys, ducking into doorways when they heard voices coming their way. It took longer than usual to get through town, but eventually they made it to the dirt road. They walked silently past the cemetery and all the way home. Once inside, Vian slammed the door behind her and locked it. You see? Isabel said instantly. She had obviously been waiting to throw out the question. Go to your room, Vian said to Sophie. Whatever Isabel was going to say, she didn't want Sophie to hear. Vian eased the hat from her head and set down her empty basket. Her hands were shaking. They're here because of the airfield, Isabel said. She began pacing. I didn't think it would happen so fast, even with the surrender. I didn't believe. I thought our soldiers would fight anyway. I thought... Quit biting your nails. You'll make them bleed, you know. Isabel looked like a madwoman, with her waist-length blonde hair falling loose from its braid and her bruised face twisted with fury. The Nazis are here, Vian, in Carivo. Their flag flies from the Hôtel de Ville as it flies from the Arc de Triomphe and the Eiffel Tower. They weren't in town five minutes and a shot was fired. The war is over, Isabelle. Maréchal Pétain said so. The war is over? The war is over? Did you see them back there with their guns and their flags and their arrogance? We need to get out of here, V. We'll take Sophie and leave Carivo. And go where? Anywhere. Lyon, maybe. Provence. 
What was that town in the Dordogne where Maman was born, Brantome? We could find her friend, that Basque woman, what was her name? She might help us. You are giving me a headache. A headache is the least of your problems, Isabel said, pacing again. Vianne approached her. You are not going to do anything crazy or stupid. Am I understood? Isabel growled in frustration and marched upstairs, slamming the door behind her. Surrender. The word stuck in Isabel's thoughts. That night, as she lay in the downstairs guest bedroom, staring up at the ceiling, she felt frustration lodge in her so deeply she could hardly think straight. Was she supposed to spend the war in this house like some helpless girl doing laundry and standing in food lines and sweeping the floor? Was she to stand by and watch the enemy take everything from France? She had always felt lonely and frustrated, or at least she had felt it for as long as she could remember, but never as sharply as now. She was stuck here in the country with no friends and nothing to do. No. There must be something she could do. Even here, even now. Hide the valuables. It was all that came to her. The Germans would loot the houses in town. Of that she had no doubt. And when they did, they would take everything of value. Her own government, cowards that they were, had known that. It was why they had emptied much of the Louvre and put fake paintings on the museum walls. Not much of a plan, she muttered, but it was better than nothing. The next day, as soon as Vianne and Sophie left for school, Isabel began. She ignored Vianne's request that she go to town for food. She couldn't stand to see the Nazis, and one day without meat would hardly matter. Instead, she searched the house opening closets and rummaging through drawers, and looking under the beds. She took every item of value and set it on the trestle table in the dining room. There were lots of valuable heirlooms, lacework tatted by her great-grandmother, a set of sterling silver salt and pepper shakers, a gilt-edged Limoges platter that had been their aunt's, several small impressionist paintings, a tablecloth made of fine ivory Alençon lace, several photograph albums, a silver-framed photograph of Vianne and Antoine and baby Sophie, her mother's pearls, Vianne's wedding dress, and more. Isabel boxed up everything that would fit in a wooden-trimmed leather trunk, which she dragged through the trampled grass, wincing every time it scraped on a stone or thudded into something. By the time she reached the barn, she was breathing hard and sweating. The barn was smaller than she remembered. The hayloft, once the only place in the world where she was happy, was really just a small tier on the second floor, a bit of floor perched at the top of a rickety ladder and beneath the roof, through which slats of sky could be seen. How many hours had she spent up here alone with her picture books, pretending that someone cared enough to come looking for her? Waiting for her sister who was always out with Rachel or Antoine. She pushed that memory aside. The center of the barn was no more than 30 feet wide. It had been built by her great-grandfather to hold buggies, back when the family had money. Now there was only an old Renault parked in the center. The stalls were filled with tractor parts and web-draped wooden ladders and rusted farm implements. She closed the barn door and went to the automobile. The driver's side door opened with a squeaking, clattering reluctance. She climbed in, started the engine, drove forward about eight feet, and then parked. The trap door was revealed now, about five feet long and four feet wide, and made of planks connected by leather straps. The cellar door was nearly impossible to see, especially as it was now, covered in dust and old hay. She pulled the trap door open, letting it rest against the automobile's dinged-up bumper, and peered down into the musty darkness. Holding the trunk by its strap, she turned on her torchlight and clamped it under her other armpit and climbed down the ladder slowly, clanking the trunk down, rung by rung, until she was at the bottom. The trunk clattered onto the dirt floor beside her. 
Like the loft, this hidey hole had seemed bigger to her as a child. It was about eight feet wide and ten feet long, with shelving along one side and an old mattress on the floor. The shelves used to hold barrels for winemaking, but a lantern was the only thing left on the shelves. She tucked the trunk into the back corner and then went back to the house where she gathered up some preserved food, blankets, some medical supplies, her father's hunting shotgun, and a bottle of wine, all of which she put out on the shelves. When she climbed back up the ladder, she found Vianne in the barn. What in the world are you doing out here? Isabel wiped her dusty hands on the worn cotton of her skirt. Hiding your valuables and putting supplies down here, in case we need to hide from the Nazis. Come down and look. I did a good job, I think. She backed down the ladder, and Vianne followed her into the darkness. Lighting a lantern, Isabel proudly showed off Papa's shotgun and the foodstuffs and medical supplies. Vianne went straight to their mother's jewelry box, opening it. Inside lay brooches and earrings and necklaces, mostly costume pieces. But at the bottom, lying on blue velvet, were the pearls that Grand Mère had worn on her wedding day and given to Maman to wear on her wedding day. You may need to sell them some day, Isabel said. Vianne clamped the box shut. They are heirlooms, Isabel. For Sophie's wedding day and yours, I would never sell them. She sighed impatiently and turned to Isabel. What food were you able to get in town? I did this instead. Of course you did. It's more important to hide Maman's pearls than to feed your niece supper. Honestly, Isabel. Vianne climbed up the ladder, her displeasure revealed in tiny disgusted huffs. Isabel left the cellar and drove the Renault back into place over the door. Then she hid the keys behind a broken board in one of the stalls. At the last moment, she disabled the automobile by removing the distributor cap. She hid it with the keys. When she finally returned to the house, Vianne was in the kitchen frying potatoes in a cast iron skillet. I hope you aren't hungry. I'm not. She moved past Vianne, barely making eye contact. Oh, and I hid the keys and distributor cap in the first stall, behind a broken board. In the living room, she turned on the radio and scooted close, hoping for news from the BBC. There was a staticky crackle, and then an unfamiliar voice said, This is the BBC. General de Gaulle is speaking to you. Vianne! Isabel yelled toward the kitchen. Who is General de Gaulle? Vianne came into the living room, drying her hands on her apron. What is... Shh! Isabel snapped. The leaders who have been at the head of the French army for many years have formed a government. On the pretext that our army has been defeated, this government has approached the enemy with a view to ceasing hostilities. Isabel stared at the small wooden radio, transfixed. This man they'd never heard of spoke directly to the people of France, not at them as Pétain had done, but to them in an impassioned voice. Pretext of defeat! I knew it! We certainly have been, and still are, submerged by the mechanical strength of the enemy, both on land and in the air. The tanks, the aeroplanes... The tactics of the Germans astounded our generals to such an extent that they have been brought to the pain which they are in today. But has the last word been said? Has all hope disappeared? Is the defeat final? Mon Dieu, Isabel said. This was what she'd been waiting to hear. There was something to be done, a fight to engage in. The surrender wasn't final. Whatever happens, de Gaulle's voice went on, the flame of French resistance must not and shall not die. Isabel hardly noticed that she was crying. The French hadn't given up. Now all Isabel had to do was figure out how to answer this call. Two days after the Nazis occupied Carivaux, 
They called a meeting for the late afternoon. Everyone was to attend, no exceptions. Even so, Vianne had had to fight with Isabel to get her to come. As usual, Isabel did not think ordinary rules pertained to her, and she wanted to use defiance to show her displeasure. As if the Nazis cared what one impetuous 18-year-old girl thought of their occupation of her country. Wait here, Vianne said impatiently when she'd finally gotten Isabel and Sophie out of the house. She gently closed the broken gate behind them. It gave a little click of closure. Moments later, Rachel appeared on the road, coming toward them with the baby in her arms and Sarah at her side. That's my best friend Sarah, Sophie said, gazing up at Isabel. Isabel, Rachel said with a smile. It's good to see you again. Is it? Isabel said. Rachel moved closer to Isabel. That was a long time ago, Rachel said gently. We were young and stupid and selfish. I'm sorry we treated you badly, ignored you. That must have been very painful. Isabel's mouth opened, closed. For once, she had nothing to say. Let's go, Vianne said, irritated that Rachel had said to Isabel what Vianne had not been able to. We shouldn't be late. Even this late in the day, the weather was unseasonably warm, and in no time, Vianne felt herself beginning to sweat. In town, they joined the grumbling crowd that filled the narrow cobblestone street from storefront to storefront. The shops were closed, and the windows were shuttered, even though the heat would be unbearable when they got home. Most of the display cases were empty, which was hardly surprising. The Germans ate so much. Even worse, they left food on their plates in the cafes. Careless and cruel it was, with so many mothers beginning to count the jars in their cellars so that they could dole out every precious bite to their children. Nazi propaganda was everywhere, on windows and shop walls, posters that showed smiling German soldiers surrounded by French children, with captions designed to encourage the French to accept their conquerors and become good citizens of the Reich. As the crowd approached the town hall, the grumbling stopped. Up close, it felt even worse. This following of instructions, walking blindly into a place with guarded doors and locked windows. We shouldn't go in, Isabel said. Rachel, who stood between the sisters, towering over both of them, made a tisking sound. She resettled the baby in her arms, patting his back in a comforting rhythm. We have been summoned. All the more reason to hide, Isabel said. Sophie and I are going in, Vian said, although she had to admit that she felt a prickly sense of foreboding. I have a bad feeling about it, Isabel muttered. Like a thousand-legged centipede, the crowd moved forward into the great hall. Tapestries had once hung from these walls, leftover treasures from the time of kings, when the Loire Valley had been the royal hunting ground, but all that was gone now. Instead, there were swastikas and propagandist posters on the walls. Trust in the Reich, and a huge painting of Hitler. Beneath the painting stood a man wearing a black field tunic decorated with medals and iron crosses, knee breeches, and spit-shined boots. A red swastika armband circled his right bicep. When the hall was full, the soldiers closed the oak doors, which creaked in protest. The officer at the front of the hall faced them, shot his right arm out, and said, Heil Hitler! The crowd murmured softly among themselves. What should they do? Heil Hitler, a few said grudgingly. The room began to smell of sweat and leather polish and cigarette smoke. I am Sturmbahnführer Weld of the Geheime Staatspolizei, the Gestapo, the man in the black uniform said in heavily accented French. I am here to carry out the terms of the armistice on behalf of the Fatherland and the Führer. It will be of little hardship on those of you who obey the rules. He cleared his throat. The rules. All radios are to be turned into us at the town hall immediately as are all guns, explosives, 
and ammunition. All operational vehicles will be impounded. All windows will be equipped with material for blackout, and you shall use it. A 9 p.m. curfew is instantly in effect. No light shall be on after dusk. We will control all food, whether grown or imported. He paused, looked out over the mass of people standing in front of him. Not so bad, see? We will live together in harmony, yes? But know this. Any act of sabotage or espionage or resistance will be dealt with swiftly and without mercy. The punishment for such behavior is death by execution. He pulled a pack of cigarettes from his breast pocket and extracted a single cigarette. Lighting it, he stared out at the people so intently it seemed he was memorizing each face. Also, although many of your ragged, cowardly soldiers are returning, we must inform you that the men taken prisoner by us shall remain in Germany. Vian felt confusion ripple through the audience. She looked at Rachel, whose square face was blotchy in places, a sign of anxiety. Mark and Antoine will come home, Rachel said stubbornly. The Sternbahnfuhrer went on. You may leave now, as I am sure we understand each other. I will have officers here until 8.45 tonight. They will receive your contraband. Do not be late. And, he smiled good-naturedly, do not risk your lives to keep a radio. Whatever you keep or hide, we will find, and if we find it, death. He said it so casually, and wearing such a fine smile, that for a moment it didn't sink in. The crowd stood there a moment longer, uncertain whether it was safe to move. No one wanted to be seen as taking the first step. And then suddenly, they were moving, pack-like, toward the open doors that led them outside. Bastards, Isabel said as they moved into an alley. And I was so sure they'd let us keep our guns, Rachel said, lighting up a cigarette, inhaling deeply and exhaling in a rush. I'm keeping our gun, I can tell you, Isabel said in a loud voice, and our radio. Shh, Vian said. General de Gaulle thinks, I don't want to hear that foolishness. We have to keep our heads down until our men come home, Vian said. Mon Dieu, Isabel said sharply. You think your husband can fix this? No, Vian said. I believe you will fix it, you and your General de Gaulle, of whom no one has ever heard. Now come. While you are hatching a plan to save France, I need to tend to my garden. Come on, Rachel, let us dullards be away. Vianne held tightly to Sophie's hand and walked briskly ahead. She did not bother to glance back to see if Isabel was following. She knew her sister was back there, hobbling forward on her damaged feet. Ordinarily, Vianne would keep pace with her sister out of politeness, but just now she was too mad to care. Your sister may not be so wrong. Rachel said as they passed the Norman church on the edge of town. If you take her side in this, I may be forced to hurt you, Rachel. That being said, your sister may not be entirely wrong. Vianne sighed. Don't tell her that. She's unbearable already. She will have to learn propriety. You teach her. She has proven singularly resistant to improving herself or listening to reason. She's been to two finishing schools and still can't hold her tongue or make polite conversation. Two days ago, instead of going to town for meat, she hid the valuables and created a hiding place for us, just in case. I should probably hide mine, too. Not that we have much. Vian pursed her lips. There was no point in talking further about this. Soon Antoine would be home and he would help keep Isabel in line. At the gate to Le Jardin, Vianne said goodbye to Rachel and her children, who kept walking. Why do we have to give them our radio, Maman? Sophie asked. It belongs to Papa. We don't, Isabel said, coming up beside them. We will hide it. We will not hide it, Vianne said sharply. 
We will do as we are told and keep quiet, and soon Antoine will be home, and he will know what to do. Welcome to the Middle Ages, Sophie, Isabel said. Vian yanked her gate open, forgetting a second too late that the refugees had broken it. The poor thing clattered on its single hinge. It took all of Vian's fortitude to act as if it hadn't happened. She marched up to the house, opened the door, and immediately turned on the kitchen light. Sophie, she said, unpinning her hat, would you please set the table? Vianne ignored her daughter's grumbling. It was to be expected. In only a few days, Isabel had taught her niece to challenge authority. Vianne lit the stove and started cooking. When a creamy potato and lardon soup was simmering, she began to clean up. Of course, Isabel was nowhere around to help. Sighing, she filled the sink with water to wash dishes. She was so intent on her task that it took her a moment to notice that someone was knocking on the front door. Patting her hair, she walked into the living room, where she found Isabel rising from the divan, a book in her hands. Reading while Vianne cooked and cleaned. Naturally. Are you expecting anyone? Isabel asked. Vianne shook her head. Maybe we shouldn't answer, Isabel said. Pretend we're not here. It's most likely Rachel. There was another knock at the door. Slowly, the doorknob turned, and the door creaked open. Yes, of course it was Rachel. Who else would? A German soldier stepped into her home. Oh, my pardons, the man said in terrible French. He removed his military hat, tucked it in his armpit, and smiled. He was a good-looking man, tall and broad-shouldered and narrow-hipped, with pale skin and light gray eyes. Vian guessed he was roughly her age. His field uniform was precisely pressed and looked brand new. An iron cross decorated his stand-up collar. Binoculars hung from a strap around his neck, and a chunky leather utility belt cinched his waist. Behind him, through the branches of the orchard, she saw his motorcycle parked on the side of the road. A sidecar was attached to it, mounted with machine guns. Mademoiselle, he said to Vianne, giving her a swift nod as he clicked his boots together. Madame, she corrected him, wishing she sounded haughty and in control, but even to her own ears she sounded scared. Madame Mauriac, I am Hopman, Captain Wolfgang Beck. He handed her a piece of paper and clicked his heels together again. My French is not so good. You will excuse my ineptitude, please. When he smiled, deep dimples formed in his cheeks. She took the paper and frowned down at it. I don't read German. What do you want? Isabel demanded, coming to stand by Vianne. Your home is most beautiful and very close to the airfield. I noticed it upon our arrival. How many bedrooms have you? Why, Isabel said at the same time Vian said, three. I will bill it here, the captain said in his bad French. Bill it, Vian said. You mean to stay? Oui, madame. Bill it? You? A man? A Nazi? No, no. Isabel shook her head. No. The captain's smile neither faded nor fell. You were to town, he said, looking at Isabel. I saw you when we arrived. You noticed me? He smiled. I am sure every red-blooded man in my regiment noticed you. Funny you would mention blood, Isabel said. Vianne elbowed her sister. I am sorry, Captain. My young sister is obstinate on occasion. But I am married, you see, and my husband is at the front, and there is my sister and my daughter here, so you must see how inappropriate it would be to have you here. Ah, so you would rather leave the house to me. How difficult that must be for you. Leave? Vianne said. I believe you aren't understanding the captain. Isabel said, not taking her gaze from him. 
He is moving into your home, taking it over, really, and that piece of paper is a requisition order that makes it possible. And Petain's armistice, of course. We can either make room for him or abandon a home that has been in our family for generations. He looked uncomfortable. This, I'm afraid, is the situation. Many of your fellow villagers are facing the same dilemma, I fear. If we leave, will we get our home back? Isabel asked. I would not think so, madame. Vianne dared to take a step toward him. Perhaps she could reason with him. My husband will be home any day now, I imagine. Perhaps you could wait until he is here? I am not the general, alas. I am simply a captain in the Wehrmacht. I follow orders, madame. I do not give them. And I am ordered to billet here. But I assure you that I am a gentleman. We will leave, Isabel said. Leave? Vianne said to her sister in disbelief. This is my home. To the captain, she said. I can count on you to be a gentleman? Of course. Vianne looked at Isabel, who shook her head slowly. Vianne knew there was no real choice. She had to keep Sophie safe until Antoine came home, and then he would handle this unpleasantness. Surely he would be home soon, now that the armistice had been signed. There is a small bedroom downstairs. You'll be comfortable there. The captain nodded. Merci, madame. I will get my things. As soon as the door closed behind the captain, Isabel said, Are you mad? We can't live with a Nazi. He said he's in the Wehrmacht. Is that the same thing? I'm hardly interested in their chain of command. You haven't seen what they're willing to do to us, Vian. I have. We'll leave. Go next door to Rachel's. We could live with her. Rachel's house is too small for all of us, and I am not going to abandon my home to the Germans. To that, Isabel had no answer. Vianne felt anxiety turn to an itch along her throat. An old nervous habit returned. You go if you must, but I'm waiting for Antoine. We have surrendered, so he'll be home soon. Vianne, please. The front door rattled hard. Another knock. Vianne walked dully forward. With a shaking hand, she reached for the knob and opened the door. Captain Beck stood there, holding his military hat in one hand and a small leather valise in the other. He said, Hello again, madame, as if he'd been gone for some time. Vianne scratched at her neck, feeling acutely vulnerable beneath this man's gaze. She backed away quickly, saying, This way, Herr Captain. As she turned, she saw the living room that had been decorated by three generations of her family's women. Golden stucco walls, the color of freshly baked brioche, gray stone floors covered by ancient abusan rugs, heavily carved wooden furniture upholstered in mohair and tapestry fabric, lamps made of porcelain, curtains of gold and red toile, antiques and treasures left over from the years when the Rosignols had been wealthy tradesmen. Until recently, there had been artwork on the walls. Now only the unimportant pieces remained. Isabel had hidden the good ones. Vianne walked past all of it to the small guest bedroom tucked beneath the stairs. At the closed door, to the left of the bathroom that had been added in the early twenties, she paused. She could hear him breathing behind her. She opened the door to reveal a narrow room with a large window, bracketed by blue-gray curtains that pooled on the wooden floor. A painted chest of drawers supported a blue pitcher and ewer. In the corner was an aged oak armoire with mirrored doors. By the double bed sat a nightstand. On it, an antique ormolu clock. Isabel's clothes lay everywhere, as if she were packing for an extended holiday. Vianne picked them up quickly, and the valise, too. When she finished, she turned. His suitcase plunked to the floor. She looked at him, compelled by simple politeness to offer a tense smile. You needn't worry, madame, he said gently. 
We have been admonished to act as gentlemen. My mother would demand the same, and in truth, she scares me more than my general. It was such an ordinary remark that Vianne was taken aback. She had no idea how to respond to this stranger who dressed like the enemy and looked like a young man she might have met at church. And what was the price for saying the wrong thing? He remained where he was, a respectful distance from her. I apologize for any inconvenience, madame. My husband will be home soon. We all hope to be home soon. Another unnerving comment. Vianne nodded politely and left him alone in the room, closing the door behind her. Tell me he's not staying, Isabel said, rushing at her. He says he is, Vianne said tiredly, pushing back the hair from her eyes. She realized just now that she was trembling. I know how you feel about these Nazis. Just make sure he doesn't know it. I won't let you put Sophie at risk with your childish rebellion. Childish rebellion? Are you? The guest room door opened, silencing Isabel. Captain Beck strode confidently toward them, smiling broadly. Then he saw the radio in the room and he paused. Do not worry, ladies. I am most pleased to deliver your radio to the Commandant. Really? Isabel said. You consider this a kindness? Vianne felt a tightening in her chest. There was a storm brewing in Isabel. Her sister's cheeks had gone pale. Her lips were drawn in a thin, colorless line. Her eyes were narrowed. She was glaring at the German as if she could kill him with a look. Of course. He smiled, looking a little confused. The sudden silence seemed to unnerve him. Suddenly he said, You have beautiful hair, mademoiselle. At Isabel's frown, he said, This is an appropriate compliment, yes? Do you think so? Isabel said, her voice low. Quite lovely. Beck smiled. Isabel walked into the kitchen and came back with a pair of boning shears. His smile faded. Am I misunderstood? Vianne said, Isabel, don't. Just as Isabel gathered up her thick blonde hair and fisted it, staring grimly at Captain Beck's handsome face, she hacked off her hair and handed the long blonde tail to him. It must be verboten for us to have anything beautiful, is it not, Captain Beck? Vianne gasped. Please, sir, ignore her. Isabel is a silly, prideful girl. No, Beck said. She is angry, and angry people make mistakes in war and die. So do conquering soldiers, Isabel snapped. Beck laughed at her. Isabel made a sound that was practically a snarl and pivoted on her heel. She marched up the stairs and slammed the door shut so hard the house shook. You will want to speak to her now, I warrant, Beck said. He looked at Vianne in a way that made it seem as if they understood each other. Such theatrics in the wrong place could be most dangerous. Vianne left him standing in her living room and went upstairs. She found Isabel sitting on Sophie's bed, so angry she was shaking. Scratches marred her cheeks and throat, a reminder of what she'd seen and survived. And now her hair was hacked off, the ends uneven. Vianne tossed Isabel's belongings onto the unmade bed and closed the door behind her. What in the name of all that's holy were you thinking? I could kill him in his sleep, just slit his throat. And do you think they would not come looking for a captain who had orders to billet here? Mon Dieu, Isabelle. She took a deep breath to calm her racing nerves. I know there are problems between us, Isabelle. I know I treated you badly as a child. I was too young and scared to help you, and Papa treated you worse. But this is not about us now, and you can't be the girl who acts impetuously any more. It is about my daughter now, your niece. We must protect her. But... France has surrendered, Isabel. Certainly this fact has not escaped you. 
Didn't you hear General de Gaulle? He said... And who is this General de Gaulle? Why should we listen to him? Maréchal Pétain is a war hero and our leader. We have to trust our government. Are you joking, Vian? The government in Vichy is collaborating with Hitler. How can you not understand this danger? Pétain is wrong. Does one follow a leader blindly? Vian moved toward Isabel slowly, half afraid of her now. You don't remember the last war, she said, clasping her hands to still them. I do. I remember the fathers and brothers and uncles who didn't come home. I remember hearing children in my class cry quietly when bad news came by telegram. And I remember the men who came home on crutches, their pant legs empty and flapping, or one arm gone, or a face ruined. I remember how Papa was before the war, and how different he was when he came home, how he drank and slammed doors and screamed at us, and then when he stopped. I remember the stories about Verdun and Somme and a million Frenchmen dying in trenches that ran red with blood, and the German atrocities. Don't forget that part of it. They were cruel, Isabel. That's my point exactly. We must... They were cruel because we were at war with them, Isabel. Pétain has saved us from going through that again. He has kept us safe. He has stopped the war. Now Antoine and all our men will come home. To a Heil Hitler world, Isabel said with a sneer. The flame of French resistance must not and shall not die. That's what de Gaulle said. We have to fight however we can, for France v so it stays France. Enough, Vian said. She moved close enough that she could have whispered to Isabel or kissed her, but Vian did neither. In a steady, even voice, she said, You will take Sophie's room upstairs and she will move in with me. And remember this, Isabel. He could shoot us. Shoot us and no one would care. You will not provoke this soldier in my home. She saw the words hit home. Isabel stiffened. I will try to hold my tongue. Do more than try. Chapter 9 Vianne closed the bedroom door and leaned against it, trying to calm her nerves. She could hear Isabel pacing in the room behind her, moving with an anger that made the floorboards tremble. How long did Vianne stand there alone, trembling, trying to get her nerves under control? It felt like hours passed while she struggled with her fear. In ordinary times, she would have found the strength to talk rationally with her sister, to say some of the things that had long been unspoken. Vianne would have told Isabel how sorry she was for the way she'd treated her as a little girl. Maybe she could have made Isabel understand. Vianne had been so helpless after Maman's death. When Papa had sent them away, to live in this small town, beneath the cold, stern eyes of a woman who had shown the girls no love, Vianne had wilted. In another time, she might have shared with Isabel what they had in common, how undone she'd been by Maman's death, how Papa's rejection had broken her heart or how he'd treated her at sixteen when she'd come to him, pregnant and in love, and been slapped across the face and called a disgrace. How Antoine had pushed Papa back hard and said, I'm going to marry her. And Papa's answer, Fine, she's all yours. You can have the house, but you'll take her squalling sister too. Vianne closed her eyes. She hated to think about all of that. For years, she'd practically forgotten it. Now, how could she push it aside? She had done to Isabel exactly what their father had done to them. It was the greatest regret of Yan's life. But this was not the time to repair that damage. Now, she had to do everything in her power to keep Sophie safe until Antoine came home. Isabel would simply have to be made to understand that. With a sigh she went downstairs to check on supper. In the kitchen, she found her potato soup simmering a bit too briskly, 
so she uncovered it and lowered the heat. Madame, are you sanguine? She flinched at the sound of his voice. When had he come in here? She took a deep breath and patted her hair. It was not the word he meant. Really, his French was terrible. That smells delicious, he said, coming up behind her. She set the wooden spoon down on the rest beside the stove. May I see what you are making? Of course, she said, both of them pretending her wishes mattered. It's just potato soup. My wife, alas, is not much of a cook. He was right beside her now, taking Antoine's place, a hungry man peering down at a cooking dinner. You are married, she said, reassured by it, although she couldn't say why. And a baby soon to be born. We are planning to call him Wilhelm, although I will not be there when he is born, and of course such decisions must inevitably be his mother's. It was such a human thing to say. She found herself turning slightly to look at him. He was her height, almost exactly, and it unnerved her. Looking directly into his eyes made her feel vulnerable. God willing, we will all be home soon, he said. He wants this over too, she thought, with relief. It's supper time, Herr Captain. Will you be joining us? It would be an honor, madame although you will be pleased to hear that most evenings I will be working late and enjoying my supper with the officers. I shall also often be out on campaigns. You shall sometimes hardly notice my presence. Vianne left him in the kitchen and carried silverware into the dining room, where she almost ran into Isabel. You shouldn't be alone with him, Isabel hissed. The captain came into the room. You cannot think I would accept your hospitality and then do harm. Consider this night. I have brought you wine, a lovely sancerre. You brought us wine, Isabel said. As any good guest would, he answered. Vianne thought, oh no. But there was nothing she could do to stop Isabel from speaking. You know about Tour, Herr Captain, Isabel asked how your Stukas fired on innocent women and children who were fleeing for their lives and dropped bombs on us? Us, he said, his expression turning thoughtful. I was there. You see the marks on my face. Ah, he said, that must have been most unpleasant. Isabel went very still. The green of her eyes seemed to blaze against the red marks and bruises on her pale skin. Unpleasant. Think about Sophie, Vianne reminded her evenly. Isabel gritted her teeth and then turned it into a fake smile. Here, Captain Beck, let me show you to your seat. Vianne took her first decent breath in at least an hour. Then, slowly, she headed into the kitchen to dish up supper. Vianne served supper in silence. The atmosphere at the table was as heavy as coal soot, settling on all of them. It frayed Vianne's nerves to the breaking point. Outside, the sun began to set. Pink light filled the windows. Would you care for wine, mademoiselle? Beck said to Isabel, pouring himself a large glass of the Sancerre he had brought to the table. If ordinary French families can't afford to drink it, Herr Captain, how can I enjoy it? A sip, perhaps, would not be. Isabel finished her soup and got to her feet. Excuse me, I'm feeling sick to my stomach. Me too, Sophie said. She got to her feet and followed her aunt out of the room like a puppy follows the lead dog with her head down. Vianne sat perfectly still, her soup spoon held above her bowl. They were leaving her alone with him. Her breathing was a flutter in her chest. She carefully set down her spoon and dabbed at her mouth with her serviette. Forgive my sister, Herr Captain. She is impetuous and willful. My oldest daughter is such a girl. We expect nothing but trouble when she gets a little older. That surprised Vianne so much that she turned. 
You have a daughter? Gisela, he said, his mouth curving into a smile. She is six, and already her mother is unable to get her to reliably do the simplest of tasks, like brush her teeth. Our Gisela would rather build a fort than read a book. He sighed, smiling. It flustered her, knowing this about him. She tried to think of a response, but her nerves were too overwrought. She picked up her spoon and began eating again. The meal seemed to go on forever, in a silence that was her undoing. The moment he finished, saying, A lovely meal, my thanks, she got to her feet and began clearing the table. Thankfully, he didn't follow her into the kitchen. He remained in the dining room, at the table by himself, drinking the wine he'd brought, which she knew would have tasted of autumn, pears and apples. By the time she'd washed and dried the dishes and put them away, night had fallen. She left the house, stepping into the starlit front yard for a moment's peace. On the stone garden wall, a shadow moved. It was a cat, perhaps. Behind her, she heard a footfall, then a match strike and the smell of sulfur. She took a quiet step backward, wanting to melt into the shadows. If she could move quietly enough, perhaps she could return by the side door without alerting him to her presence. She stepped on a twig, heard it snap beneath her heel, and she froze. He stepped out from the orchard. Madame, he said, so you love the starlight also? I am sorry to intrude upon you. She was afraid to move. He closed the distance between them, taking up a place beside her as if he belonged there, looking out across her orchard. You would never know there is a war on out here, he said. Vian thought he sounded sad, and it reminded her that they were alike in a way, both of them far away from the people they loved. Your superior, he said that all prisoners of war will remain in Germany. What does this mean? What of our soldiers? Surely you did not capture all of them. I do not know, madame. Some will return, many will not. Well, isn't this a lovely little moment between new friends? Isabel said, her voice as sharp as cut steel. Vian flinched, horrified that she'd been caught standing out here with a German, the enemy, a man. Isabel stood in the moonlight, wearing a caramel-colored suit. She held her valise in one hand and Vian's best Deauville in the other. You have my hat, Vian said. I may have to wait for a train. My face is still tender from the Nazi attack. She was smiling at Beck as she said this. It wasn't really a smile. Beck inclined his head in a curt nod. You have sisterly things to discuss, obviously. I will take my leave. With a brisk, polite nod, he returned to the house, closing the door behind him. I can't stay here, Isabel said. Of course you can. I have no interest in making friends with the enemy, V. Damn it, Isabel. Don't you dare. Isabel stepped closer. I'll put you and Sophie at risk, sooner or later. You know I will. You told me I needed to protect Sophie. This is the only way I can do it. I feel like I'll explode if I stay, V. Vian's anger dissolved. Without it, she felt inexpressibly tired. This essential difference had always been between them. Vian, the rule follower, and Isabel, the rebel. Even in girlhood, in grief, they had expressed their emotions differently. Vian had gone silent after Maman's death, tried to pretend that Papa's abandonment didn't wound her, while Isabel had thrown tantrums and run away and demanded attention. Maman had sworn that one day they would be the best of friends. Never had this prediction seemed less likely. In this right now, Isabel was right. Vianne would be constantly afraid of what her sister would say or do around the captain, and truthfully, Vianne hadn't the strength for it. How will you go, and where? Train, to Paris, 
I'll telegram you when I arrive safely. Be careful. Don't do anything foolish. Me? You know better than that. Vian pulled Isabel into a fierce embrace and then let her go. The road to town was so dark, Isabel couldn't see her own feet. It was preternaturally quiet, suspenseful as a held breath, until she came to the airfield. There, she heard boots marching on hard-packed dirt, motorcycles and trucks rolling alongside the skein of barbed wire that now protected the ammunition stump. A lorry appeared out of nowhere, its headlamps off, thundering up the road, she lurched out of its way, stumbling into the ditch. In town, it was no easier to navigate with the shops closed and the street lamps off and the windows blacked out. The silence was eerie and unnerving. Her footsteps seemed too loud. With every step, she was aware that a curfew was in effect and she was violating it. She ducked into one of the alleys, feeling her way along the rough sidewalk, her fingertips trailing along the storefronts for guidance. Whenever she heard voices, she froze, shrinking into the shadows until silence returned. It seemed to take forever to reach her destination, the train station on the edge of town. Halt! Isabel heard the word at the same time a floodlight sprayed white light over her. She was a shadow hunched beneath it. A German sentry approached her, his rifle held in his arms. You are just a girl, he said, drawing close. You know about the curfew, ya? Yeah? he demanded. She rose slowly, facing him with a courage she didn't feel. I know we aren't allowed to be out this late. It's an emergency, though. I must go to Paris. My father is ill. Where is your Ausweis? I don't have one. He eased the rifle off his shoulder and into his hands. No travel without an Ausweis. But go home, girl. Before you get hurt. But now, before I decide not to ignore you. Inside, Isabel was screaming in frustration. It took considerable effort to walk away from the sentry without saying anything. On the way home, she didn't even keep to the shadows. She flaunted her disregard of the curfew, daring them to stop her again. A part of her wanted to get caught so she could let loose the string of invective screaming inside her head. This could not be her life, trapped in a house with a Nazi in a town that had given up without a whimper of protest. Vianne was not alone in her desire to pretend that France had neither surrendered nor been conquered. In town, the shopkeepers and bistro owners smiled at the Germans and poured them champagne and sold them the best cuts of meat. The villagers, peasants mostly, shrugged and went on with life, Oh, they muttered disapprovingly and shook their heads and gave out wrong directions when asked. But beyond those small rebellions, there was nothing. No wonder the German soldiers were swollen with arrogance. They had taken over this town without a fight. Hell, they had done the same thing to all of France. But Isabel could never forget what she'd seen in the field near Tours. At home, when she was upstairs again, in the bedroom that had been hers as a child, she slammed the door shut behind her. A few moments later, she smelled cigarette smoke, and it made her so angry she wanted to scream. He was down there smoking a cigarette. Captain Beck, with his cutstone face and fake smile, could toss them all out of this house at will. For any reason or no reason at all. Her frustration curdled into an anger that was like nothing she'd ever known. She felt as if her insides were a bomb that needed to go off. One wrong move or word, and she might explode. She marched over to Vianne's bedroom and opened the door. You need a pass to leave town, she said, her anger expanding. The bastards won't let us take a train to see family. From the darkness, Vianne said, So, that's that. Isabel didn't know if it was relief or disappointment she heard in her sister's voice. Tomorrow you will go to town for me. You will stand in the queues while I am at school and get what you can. But, no buts, Isabel. You are here now and staying. It's time you pulled your weight. I need to be able to count on you. 
For the next week, Isabel tried to be on her best behavior. But it was impossible with that man living under the same roof. Night after night, she didn't sleep. She lay in her bed, alone in the dark, imagining the worst. This morning, well before dawn, she gave up the pretense and got out of bed. She washed her face and dressed in a plain cotton day dress, wrapping a scarf around her butchered hair as she went downstairs. Vianne sat on the divan, knitting, an oil lamp lit beside her. In the ring of lamplight that separated her from the darkness, Vianne looked pale and sickly. She obviously hadn't slept much this week either. She looked up at Isabel in surprise. You're up early. I have a long day of standing in lines ahead of me. Might as well get started, Isabel said. The first in line gets the best food. Vianne put her knitting aside and stood, smoothing her dress, another reminder that he was in the house. Neither of them came downstairs in night dresses. She went into the kitchen and then returned with ration cards. It's meat today. Isabel grabbed the ration cards from Vianne and left the house, plunging into the darkness of a blacked-out world. Dawn rose as she walked, illuminating a world within a world, one that looked like Caravo but felt entirely foreign. As she passed the airfield, a small green car with the letters P-O-L on the rear roared past her. Gestapo. The airfield was already a hive of activity. She saw four guards out front, two at the newly constructed gated entrance and two at the building's double doors. Nazi flags snapped in the early morning breeze. Several aeroplanes stood ready for takeoff to drop bombs on England and across Europe. Guards marched in front of red signs that read, Verboten, keep out under penalty of death. She kept walking. There were already four women queued up in front of the butcher's shop when she arrived. She took her place at the back of the line. That was when she saw a piece of chalk lying in the road, tucked in against the curb. She knew instantly how she could use it. She glanced around, but no one was looking at her. Why would they be when there were German soldiers everywhere? Men in uniforms strode through town like peacocks buying whatever caught their eye, rambunctious and loud and quick to laugh. They were unfailingly polite, opening doors for women and tipping their hats, but Isabel wasn't fooled. She bent down and palmed the bit of chalk, hiding it in her pocket. It felt dangerous and wonderful just having it. She tapped her foot impatiently after that, waiting for her turn. Good morning, she said, offering her ration card to the butcher's wife, a tired-looking woman with thinning hair and even thinner lips. Ham hocks, two pounds, that's what is left. Bones? The Germans take all the good meat, mademoiselle. You're lucky, in fact. Pork is verboten for the French, don't you know? But they don't want the hocks. Do you want them or not? I'll take them, someone said behind her. So will I, yelled another woman. I'll take them, Isabel said. She took the small packet, wrapped up in wrinkled paper and tied with twine. Across the street, she heard the sound of jackboots marching on cobblestone, the rattling of sabers in scabbards, the sound of male laughter, and the purring voices of the French women who warmed their beds. A trio of German soldiers sat at a bistro table not far away. Mademoiselle, one of them said, waving to her. Come have coffee with us. She clutched her willow basket with its paper-wrapped treasures, small and insufficient as they were, and ignored the soldiers. She slipped around the corner and into an alley that was narrow and crooked, like all such passageways in town. Entrances were slim, and from the street they appeared to be dead ends. Locals knew how to navigate them as easily as a boatman knows a boggy river. She walked forward, unobserved. The shops in the alley had all been shut down. A poster in the abandoned milliner's shop window showed a crooked old man with a huge hooked nose, looking greedy and evil, holding a bag of money and trailing blood and bodies behind him. She saw the word, Juif, Jew, and stopped. She knew she should keep walking. 
It was just propaganda after all. The enemy's heavy-handed attempt to blame the Jewish people for the ills of the world and this war. And yet... She glanced to her left. Not fifty feet away was Rue La Grande, a main street through town. To her right was an elbow bend in the alleyway. She reached into her pocket and pulled out her piece of chalk. When she was sure the coast was clear, she drew a huge V for victory on the poster, obliterating as much of the image as she could. Someone grabbed her wrist so hard she gasped. Her piece of chalk fell, clattered to the cobblestones, and rolled into one of the cracks. Mademoiselle, a man said, shoving her against the poster she'd just defaced, pressing her cheek into the paper so that she couldn't see him. Do you know it is verboten to do that? And punishable by death? Chapter 10 Vianne closed her eyes and thought, Hurry home, Antoine. It was all she allowed herself, just that one small plea. How could she handle all of this? War and Captain Beck and Isabel, alone. She wanted to daydream, pretend that her world was upright instead of fallen on its side, that the closed guest room door meant nothing, that Sophie had slept with Vianne last night because they'd fallen asleep reading, that Antoine was outside on this dewy dawn morning, chopping wood for a winter that was still months away. Soon he would come in and say, Well, I am off to a day of delivering mail. Perhaps he would tell her of his latest postmark, a letter in from Africa or America, and he would spin her a romantically imagined tale to go along with it. Instead, she returned her knitting to the basket by the divan, put on her boots, and went outside to chop wood. It would be autumn again in no time, and then winter, and the devastation of her garden by the refugees had reminded her how perilously balanced her survival was. She lifted the axe and brought it down, hard, Grasp, raise, steady, chop. Every chop reverberated up her arms and lodged painfully in the muscles of her shoulders. Sweat squeezed from her pores, dampened her hair. Allow me, please, to do this for you. She froze, the axe in midair. Beck stood nearby, dressed in his breeches and boots, with only a thin white T-shirt covering his chest. His pale cheeks were reddened from a morning shave, and his blonde hair was wet. Droplets fell onto his T-shirt, making a pattern of small gray sunbursts. She felt acutely uncomfortable in her robe and work boots, with her hair pinned in curls. She lowered the axe. There are some things a man does around the house. You are much too fragile to chop wood. I can do it. Of course you can. But why should you? Go, madam. See to your daughter. I can do this small thing for you. Otherwise, my mother will beat me with a switch. She meant to move, but somehow she didn't. And then he was there, pulling the axe gently out of her hand. She held on instinctively for a moment. Their gazes met, held. She released her hold and stepped back so quickly she stumbled. He caught her by the wrist, steadied her. Mumbling a thank you, she turned and walked away from him, keeping her spine as straight as she could. It took all of her limited courage not to speed up. Even so, by the time she reached the door, she felt as if she'd run from Paris. She kicked free of the oversized gardening boots, saw them hit the house with a thunk and fall in a heap. The last thing she wanted was kindness from this man who had invaded her home. She slammed the door shut behind her and went to the kitchen, where she lit the stove and put a pot of water on to boil. Then she went to the bottom of the stairs and called her daughter down for breakfast. She had to call two more times, and then threaten, before Sophie came trudging down the stairs, her hair a mess, the look in her eyes sullen. She was wearing her sailor dress, again. In the ten months Antoine had been gone, she'd outgrown it, but she refused to stop wearing it. I'm up, she said, 
shuffling to the table, taking her seat. Vianne placed a bowl of cornmeal mush in front of her daughter. She had splurged this morning and added a tablespoon of preserved peaches on top. Maman, can't you hear that? There's someone knocking at the door. Vianne shook her head. All she'd heard was the thunk, thunk, thunk of the axe and went to the door, opening it. Rachel stood there with the baby in her arms and Sarah tucked in close to her side. You are teaching today with your hair pinned? Oh, Vianne felt like a fool. What was wrong with her? Today was the last day of school before the summer break. Let's go, Sophie. We are late. She rushed back inside and cleared the table. Sophie had licked her plate clean, so Vianne laid it in the copper sink to wash later. She covered the leftover pot of mush and put the preserved peaches away. Then she ran upstairs to get ready. In no time, she had removed her hairpins and combed her hair into smooth waves. She grabbed her hat, gloves, and handbag and left the house to find Rachel and the children waiting in the orchard. Captain Beck was there too, standing by the shed. His white T-shirt was soaked in places and clung to his chest, revealing the whorls of hair beneath. He had the axe slung casually against one shoulder. Ah, greetings, he said. Vian could feel Rachel's scrutiny. Beck lowered the axe. This is a friend of yours, madame? Rachel, Vian said tightly. My neighbor. This is Herr Captain Beck. He is the one billeting with us. Greetings, Beck said again, nodding politely. Vianne put a hand on Sophie's back and gave her daughter a little shove, and they were off, trudging through the tall grass of the orchard and out onto the dusty road. He's handsome, Rachel said as they came to the airfield, which was abuzz with activity behind the coils of barbed wire. You didn't tell me that. Is he? I'm pretty sure you know he is, so your question is interesting. What's he like? German. The soldiers billeted with Claire Moreau look like sausages with legs. I hear they drink enough wine to kill a judge and snore like rooting hogs. You're lucky, I guess. You're the lucky one, Rachel. No one has moved into your house. Poverty has its reward at last. She linked her arm through Vianne's. Don't look so stricken, Vianne. I hear they have orders to be correct. Vianne looked at her best friend. Last week... Isabel chopped off her hair in front of the captain and said beauty must be verboten. Rachel couldn't stifle her smile completely. Oh. It's hardly funny. She could get us killed with her temper. Rachel's smile faded. Can you talk to her? Oh, I can talk. When has she ever listened to anyone? You are hurting me, Isabel said. The man yanked her away from the wall and dragged her down the street. Moving so fast she had to run along beside him, she bumped into the stone alley wall with every step. When she tripped on a cobblestone and almost fell, he tightened his hold and held her upright. Think, Isabel. He wasn't in uniform, so he must be Gestapo. That was bad. And he'd seen her defacing the poster. Did it count as an act of sabotage or espionage or resistance to the German occupation? It wasn't like blowing up a bridge or selling secrets to Britain. I was making art. It was going to be a vase full of flowers, not a V for victory, a vase. No resistance, just a silly girl drawing on the only paper she could find. I have never even heard of General de Gaulle. And what if they didn't believe her? The man stopped in front of an oak door with a black lion's head knocker at its center. He rapped four times on the door. W where are you taking me? Was this a back door to the Gestapo headquarters? There were terrible rumors about these Gestapo interrogators. Supposedly they were ruthless and sadistic, but no one knew for sure. The door opened slowly, revealing an old man in a beret. A hand-rolled cigarette hung from his fleshy, liver-spotted lips. He saw Isabel and frowned. 
Open up, the man beside Isabel growled, and the old man stepped aside. Isabel was pulled into a room full of smoke. Her eyes stung as she looked around. It was an abandoned novelty store that had once sold bonnets and notions and sewing supplies. In the smoky light, she saw empty display cases that had been shoved up against the walls. Empty metal hat racks were piled in the corner. The window out front had been bricked up, and the back door that faced Rue La Grande was padlocked from the inside. There were four men in the room. A tall, graying man, dressed in rags, standing in the corner. A boy seated beside the old man who had opened the door, and a handsome young man in a tattered sweater and worn pants with scuffed boots who sat at a cafe table. Who is this, Didier? asked the old man who had opened the door. Isabel got the first good look at her captor. He was big and brawny, with the puffed-up look of a circus strongman and a heavily jowled, oversized face. She stood as tall as possible, with her shoulders pressed back and her chin lifted. She knew she looked ridiculously young in her plaid skirt and fitted blouse, but she refused to give them the satisfaction of knowing she was afraid. I found her choking V's on the German posters, said the swarthy man who'd caught her, Didier. Isabel fisted her right hand, trying to rub the orange chalk away without them noticing. Have you nothing to say? said the old man standing in the corner. He was the boss, obviously. I have no chalk. I saw her doing it. Isabel took a chance. You're not German, she said to the strong man. You're French. I'd bet money on it. And you, she said to the old man. You're the pork butcher. The boy she dismissed altogether, but to the handsome young man in the tattered clothes she said, You look hungry, and I think you're wearing your brother's clothes or something you found hanging on a line somewhere. Communist. He grinned at her, and it changed his whole demeanor. But it was the man in the corner she cared about, the one in charge. She took a step toward him. You could be Aryan. Maybe you're forcing the others to be here. I've known him all my life, mademoiselle, the pork butcher said. I fought beside his father, and yours, at some. You're Isabel Rosignol, oui? She didn't answer. Was it a trap? No answer, said the Bolshevik. He rose from his seat, came toward her. Good for you. Why were you chalking a V on the poster? Again, Isabel remained silent. I am Henri Navarre, he said, close enough now to touch her. We are not Germans, nor do we work with them, mademoiselle. He gave her a meaningful look. Not all of us are passive, now, why were you marking up their posters? It was all I could think of, she said. Meaning? She exhaled evenly. I heard de Gaulle's speech on the radio. Henri turned to the back of the room, sent a glance to the old man. She watched the two men have an entire conversation around her without speaking a word. At the end of it, she knew who the boss was, the handsome communist, Henri. At last, Henri said, turning to her again, If you could do something, more, would you? What do you mean? she asked. There is a man in Paris. A group, actually, from the Musée de l'Homme, the burly man corrected him. Henri held up a hand. We don't say more than we must, Didier. Anyway, there is a man, a printer, risking his life to make tracts that we can distribute. Maybe if we can get the French to wake up to what is happening, we have a chance. Henri reached into a leather bag that hung on his chair and pulled out a sheaf of papers. A headline jumped out at her. Vive le général de Gaulle. The text was an open letter to Maréchal Pétain that expressed criticism of the surrender. At the end it read... Nous sommes pour le général de Gaulle. We support General de Gaulle. Well, Henri said quietly, and in that single word, Isabel heard the call to arms she'd been waiting for. Will you distribute them? 
Me? We are communists and radicals, Henri said. They are already watching us. You are a girl, and a pretty one at that. No one would suspect you. Isabel didn't hesitate. I'll do it. The men started to thank her. Henri silenced them. The printer is risking his life by writing these tracts, and someone is risking his or her life by typing them. We are risking our lives by bringing them here. But you, Isabel, you are the one who will be caught distributing them, if you are caught. Make no mistake, this is not chalking a V on a poster. This is punishable by death. I won't get caught, she said. Henri smiled at that. How old are you? Almost nineteen. Ah, he said. And how can one so young hide this from her family? My family is not the problem, Isabel said. They pay no attention to me. But there's a German soldier billeted at my house, and I would have to break curfew. It will not be easy. I understand if you are afraid, Henri began to turn away. Isabel snatched the papers back from him. I said I'd do it. Isabel was elated. For the first time since the armistice, she wasn't completely alone in her need to do something for France. The men told her about dozens of groups like theirs throughout the country, mounting a resistance to follow de Gaulle. The more they talked, the more excited she became at the prospect of joining them. Oh, she knew she should be afraid. They told her often enough. But it was ridiculous. The Germans threatening death for handing out a few pieces of paper. She could talk her way out of it if she were caught. She was sure of it. Not that she would get caught. How many times had she sneaked out of a locked school or boarded a train without a ticket or talked her way out of trouble? Her beauty had always made it easy for her to break rules without reprisal. When we have more, how will we contact you? Henri asked as he opened the door to let her leave. She glanced down the street. The apartment above Madame Lafoy's hat shop, is it still vacant? Henri nodded. Open the curtains when you have papers. I'll come by as soon as I can. Knock four times. If we don't answer, walk away, he said. After a pause, he added, Be careful, Isabel. He shut the door between them. Alone again, she looked down at her basket. Settled under a red and white checked linen cloth were the tracts. On top lay the butcher paper wrapped ham hocks. It wasn't much of a camouflage. She would need to figure out something better. She walked down the alley and turned onto a busy street. The sky was darkening. She'd been with the men all day. The shops were closing up. The only people milling about were German soldiers and the few women who'd chosen to keep them company. The cafe tables out on the street were full of uniformed men, eating the best food, drinking the best wines. It took every ounce of nerve she had to walk slowly. The minute she was out of town, she started to run. As she neared the airfield, she was sweating and out of breath, but she didn't slow. She ran all the way into her yard. With the gate clattering shut behind her, she bent forward, gasping hard, holding the stitch in her side, trying to catch her breath. Mademoiselle Rosignol, are you on fell? Isabel snapped upright. Captain Beck appeared beside her. Had he been there before her? Captain, she said, working hard to still the racing of her heart. A convoy went past. I uh, rushed to get out of their way. A convoy? I didn't see that. It was a while back, and I am silly sometimes. I lost track of time talking to a friend, and well, she gave him her prettiest smile and patted her butchered hair as if it mattered to her that she looked nice for him. How for the cues today? Interminable. Please, allow me to carry your basket inside. She looked down at her basket saw the tiniest white paper corner visible under the linen cloth. No, I... Ah, I insist. We are gentlemen, you know. 
His long, well-manicured fingers closed around the willow handle. As he turned toward the house, she remained at his side. I saw a large group gathering at the town hall this afternoon. What are the Vichy police doing here? Ah, nothing to concern you. He waited at the front door for her to open it. She fumbled nervously with the center-mounted knob, turned it, and opened the door. Although he had every right to go in at will, he waited to be invited in as if he were a guest. Isabelle, is that you? Where have you been? Vianne rose from the divan. The queues were awful today. Sophie popped up from the floor by the fireplace where she'd been playing with Bebe. What did you get today? Hemhawks, Isabel said, glancing worriedly at the basket in Beck's hand. That's all? Vianne said sharply. What about the cooking oil? Sophie sank back to the rug on the floor, clearly disappointed. I will put the hawks in the pantry, Isabel said, reaching for the basket. Please, allow me, Beck said. He was staring at Isabel, watching her closely, or maybe it only felt like that. Vianne lit a candle and handed it to Isabel. Don't waste it, hurry. Beck was very gallant as he walked through the shadowy kitchen and opened the door to the cellar. Isabel went down first, lighting the way. The wooden steps creaked beneath her feet until she stepped down onto the hard-packed dirt floor and into the subterranean chill. The wooden shelves seemed to close in around them as Beck came up beside her. The candle flame sent light gambling in front of them. She tried to still the trembling in her hand as she reached for the paper-wrapped ham hocks. She placed them on the shelf beside their dwindling supplies. Bring up three potatoes and a turnip, Vianne called down. Isabel jumped a little at the sound. You seem nervous, Beck said. Is that the right bird, mademoiselle? The candle sputtered between them. There were lots of dogs in town today. The Gestapo. They love their shepherds. There is no reason for this to concern you. I am afraid of big dogs. I was bitten once as a child. Beck gave her a smile that was stretched out of shape by the light. Don't look at the basket. But it was too late. She saw a little more of the hidden papers sticking out. She forced a smile. You know us girls, scared of everything. That is not how I would describe you, mademoiselle. She reached carefully for the basket and tugged it from his grasp. Without breaking eye contact, she set the basket on the shelf, beyond the candle's light. When it was there, in the dark, she finally released her breath. They stared at each other in uncomfortable silence. Beck nodded. And now I must away. I have only come here to pick up some papers for a meeting tonight. He turned back to the steps and began climbing them. Isabel followed the captain up the narrow stairs. When she emerged into the kitchen, Vianne was standing there with her arms crossed, frowning. Where are the potatoes and a turnip? Vianne asked. I forgot. Vianne sighed. Go, she said. Get them. Isabel turned and went back into the cellar. After she'd gathered up the potatoes and turnip, she went to the basket, lifted the candle to expose the basket to light. There it was, the tiny white triangle of paper peeking out. She quickly withdrew the papers from the basket and shoved them into her panty girdle. Feeling the papers against her skin, she went upstairs, smiling. At supper, Isabel sat with her sister and niece, eating watery soup and day-old bread, trying to think of something to say, but nothing came to her. Sophie, who seemed not to notice, rambled on, telling one story after another. Isabel tapped her foot nervously, listening for the sound of a motorcycle approaching the house, for the clatter of German jackboots on the walkway out front, for a sharp, impersonal knock at the door. Her gaze kept cutting to the kitchen and the cellar door. You're acting very strangely tonight, Vianne said. Isabel ignored her sister's observation. When the meal was finally over, Isabel popped out of her seat and said, I'll do the dishes, V. 
Why don't you and Sophie finish your game of checkers? You'll do the dishes, Vian said, giving Isabel a suspicious look. Come on, I've offered before, Isabel said. Not in my memory. Isabel gathered the empty soup bowls and utensils. She had offered only to keep busy, to do something with her hands. Afterward, Isabel could find nothing to do. The night dragged on. Vian and Sophie and Isabel played Bilot, but Isabel couldn't concentrate. She was so nervous and excited. She made some lame excuse and quit the game early, pretending to be tired. In her upstairs bedroom, she lay atop the blankets, fully dressed, waiting. It was past midnight when she heard Beck return. She heard him enter the yard, then she smelled the smoke from his cigarette drift up. Later, he came into the house, clomping around in his boots, but by one o'clock, everything was quiet again. Still, she waited. At 4 a.m., she got out of bed and dressed in a heavy worsted knit black sweater and plaid tweed skirt. She ripped a seam open in her summer weight coat and slid the papers inside. Then she put the coat on, tying the belt at her waist. She slipped the ration cards in her front pocket. On the way downstairs, she winced at every creak of sound. It seemed to take forever to get to the front door, more than forever, but finally she was there, opening it quietly, closing it behind her. The early morning was cold and black. Somewhere a bird called out, his slumber probably disturbed by the opening of the door. She breathed in the scent of roses and was overcome by how ordinary it seemed in this moment. From here, there would be no turning back. She walked to the still broken gate, glancing back often at the blacked-out house, expecting Beck to be there, arms crossed, booted feet in a warrior's stance, watching her. But she was alone. Her first stop was Rachel's house. There were almost no mail deliveries these days, but women like Rachel, whose men were gone, checked their letterboxes each day, hoping against hope that the mail would bring them news. Isabel reached inside her coat, felt for the slit in the silk lining, and pulled out a single piece of paper. In one movement, she opened the letterbox and slid the paper inside and quietly shut the lid. Out on the road again, she looked around and saw no one. She had done it! Her second stop was Old Man Rivet's farm. He was a communist through and through, a man of the revolution, and he'd lost a son at the front. By the time she gave away her last tract, she felt invincible. It was just past dawn. Pale sunlight gilded the limestone buildings in town. She was the first woman to queue up outside the shop this morning, and because of that, she got her full ration of butter, 150 grams for the month, two-thirds of a cup, a treasure. Chapter 11 Every day that long, hot summer, Vianne woke to a list of chores. She, along with Sophie and Isabel, replanted and expanded the garden and converted a pair of old bookcases into rabbit hutches. She used chicken wire to enclose the pergola. Now the most romantic place on the property stank of manure, manure they collected for their garden. She took in wash from the farmer down the road, old man Rivet, in exchange for feed. The only time she really relaxed and felt like herself was on Sunday mornings when she took Sophie to church. Isabel refused to attend mass and then had coffee with Rachel sitting in the shade of her backyard, just two best friends talking, laughing, joking. Sometimes Isabel joined them but she was more likely to play with the children than talk with the women, which was fine with Vianne. Her chores were necessary, of course, a new way of preparing for a winter that seemed far away, but would arrive like an unwanted guest on the worst possible day. More importantly, it kept Vianne's mind occupied. When she was working in her garden, or boiling strawberries for preserves, or pickling cucumbers, she wasn't thinking of Antoine, and how long it had been since she'd heard from him. It was the uncertainty that gnawed at her. 
Was he a prisoner of war? Was he wounded somewhere? Dead? Or would she look up one day and see him walking up this road, smiling? Missing him, longing for him, worrying about him. Those were her nighttime journeys. In a world now laden with bad news and silence, the one bit of good news was that Captain Beck had spent much of the summer away on one campaign or another. In his absence, the household settled into a routine of sorts. Isabel did all that was asked of her without complaint. It was October now, and chilly. Vian found herself distracted as she walked home from school with Sophie. She could feel that one of her heels was coming loose, and it made her slightly unsteady. Her black kidskin Oxfords weren't made for the kind of everyday use to which they'd been put in the past few months. The sole was beginning to pull away at the toe, which often caused her to trip. The worry about replacing things like shoes was never far away. A ration card did not mean there were shoes or food to be bought. Vian kept one hand on Sophie's shoulder, both to steady her gait and to keep her daughter close. There were Nazi soldiers everywhere, riding in lorries and on motorcycles with machine gun mounted sidecars. They marched in the square, their voices raised in triumphant song. A military lorry honked at them, and they moved farther onto the sidewalk as a convoy rumbled past. More Nazis. Is that Tante Isabel? Sophie asked. Vian glanced in the direction of Sophie's finger. Sure enough, Isabel was coming out of an alley, clutching her basket. She looked furtive, was the only word that came to mind. Furtive. At that, a dozen little pieces clicked into place. Tiny incongruities became a pattern. Isabel had often left Le Jardin in the wee hours of the morning, much earlier than necessary, she had dozens of long-winded excuses for absences that Vianne had barely cared about. Heels that broke, hats that flew off in the wind and had to be chased down, a dog that frightened her and blocked her way. Was she sneaking out to be with a boy? Tante Isabelle, Sophie cried out. Without waiting for a reply or permission, Sophie darted into the street she dodged a trio of German soldiers who were tossing a ball back and forth. Merde, Vianne muttered. Pardon, she said, ducking around the soldiers and striding across the cobblestone street. What did you get today? She heard Sophie ask Isabel as her daughter reached into the willow basket. Isabel slapped Sophie's hand hard. Sophie yelped and drew her hand back. Isabel, Vianne said harshly. What's wrong with you? Isabel had the good grace to blush. I am sorry. It's just that I'm tired. I've been in queues all day. And for what? A veal jelly bone with barely any meat on it and a tin of milk. It's disheartening. Still, I shouldn't be rude. I'm sorry, Soph. Perhaps if you didn't sneak out so early in the morning, you wouldn't be tired, Vianne said. I'm not sneaking out, Isabel said. I'm going to the shops for food. I thought you wanted that of me. And by the way, we need a bicycle. These walks to town on bad shoes are killing me. Vian wished she knew her sister well enough to read the look in her eyes. Was it guilt or worry or defiance? If she didn't know better, she'd say it was pride. Sophie linked arms with Isabel as the three of them set off for home. Vian studiously ignored the changes to Carivo, the Nazis taking up so much space, the posters on the limestone walls, the new anti-Jewish tracts were sickening, and the red and black swastika flags hanging above doorways and from balconies. People had begun to leave Carivo, abandoning their homes to the Germans. The rumor was that they were going to the free zone, but no one knew for sure. Shops closed and didn't reopen. She heard footsteps coming up behind her and said evenly, Let's walk faster. Madame Moriac, if I may interrupt. Good Lord, is he following you? Isabel muttered. 
Vianne slowly turned around. Herr Captain, she said. People in the street watched Vianne closely, eyes narrowed in disapproval. I wanted to say that I will be late tonight and will, sorrowfully, not be there for supper, Beck said. How terrible, Isabel said in a voice as sweet and bitter as burnt caramel. Vianne tried to smile, but really, she didn't know why he'd stopped her. I will save you something. Nine, nine, you are most kind. He fell silent. Vianne did the same. Finally, Isabel sighed heavily. We are on our way home, Herr Captain. Is there something I can do for you, Herr Captain? said Vianne. Beck moved closer. I know how worried you have been about your husband, so I did some checking. Oh, it is not fine news. I am sorrowful to report. Your husband, Antoine Moyag, has been captured along with many of your town's men. He is in a prisoner of war camp. He handed her a list of names and a stack of official postcards. He will not be coming home. Vianne barely remembered leaving town. She knew Isabel was beside her, holding her upright, urging her to put one foot in front of the other, and that Sophie was beside her, chirping out questions as sharp as fish hooks. What is a prisoner of war? What did Herr Captain mean that Papa would not be coming home? Never? Vianne knew when they'd arrived home because the sense of her garden greeted her, welcomed her. She blinked feeling a little like someone who had just wakened from a coma to find the world impossibly changed. Sophie, Isabel said firmly, go make your mother a cup of coffee. Open a tin of milk. But... Go, Isabel said. When Sophie was gone, Isabel turned to Vianne, cupped her face with cold hands. He'll be all right. Vianne felt as if she were breaking apart bit by bit, losing blood and bone as she stood here, contemplating something she had studiously avoided thinking about, a life without him. She started to shiver. Her teeth chattered. Come inside for coffee, Isabel said. Into the house? Their house? His ghost would be everywhere in there, a dent in the divan where he sat to read the hook that held his coat, and the bed. She shook her head, wishing she could cry, but there were no tears in her. This news had emptied her. She couldn't even breathe. Suddenly, all she could think about was the sweater of his that she was wearing. She started to strip out of her clothes, tearing off the coat and the vest, ignoring Isabel's shouted, No! as she yanked the sweater over her head and buried her face in the soft wool, trying to smell him in the yarn, his favorite soap, him. But there was nothing but her own smell. She lowered the bunched-up sweater from her face and stared down at it, trying to remember the last time he'd worn it. She picked at a loose thread, and it unraveled in her hand, became a squiggly coil of wine-colored yarn. She bit it off and tied a knot to save the rest of the sleeve. Yarn was precious these days. These days. When the world was at war and everything was scarce and your husband was gone. I don't know how to be on my own. What do you mean? We were on our own for years. From the moment Maman died. Vianne blinked. Her sister's words sounded a little jumbled, as if they were running on the wrong speed. You were alone, she said. I never was. I met Antoine when I was 14 and got pregnant at 16 and married him when I was barely 17. Papa gave me this house to get rid of me. So you see, I've never been on my own. That's why you're so strong and I'm not. You will have to be, Isabel said, for Sophie. Vianne drew in a breath and there it was. The reason she couldn't eat a bowl of arsenic or throw herself in front of a train. She took the short coil of crooked yarn 
and tied it to an apple tree branch. The burgundy color stood out against the green and brown. Now, each day in her garden, and when she walked to her gate, and when she picked apples, she would pass this branch and see this bit of yarn and think of Antoine. Each time she would pray, to him and to God, Come home. Come, Isabel said, putting an arm around Vianne, pulling her close. Inside, the house echoed the voice of a man who wasn't there. Vianne stood outside Rachel's stone cottage. Overhead, the sky was the color of smoke on this cold, late afternoon. The leaves of the trees, marigold and tangerine and scarlet, were just beginning to darken around the edges. Soon they would drop to the ground. Vianne stared at the door, wishing she didn't need to be here. But she had read the names Beck had given her. Marc de Champlain was also listed. When she finally found the courage to knock, Rachel answered almost instantly, wearing an old house dress and sagging woolen stockings. A cardigan sweater hung askew, buttoned incorrectly. It gave her an odd, tilted look. Vian, come in. Sarah and I were just making a rice pudding. It's mostly water and gelatin, of course, but I used a bit of milk. Vian managed a smile. She let her friend sweep her into the kitchen and pour her a cup of the bitter ersatz coffee. That was all they could get. Vianne was remarking on the rice pudding. What she even said, she didn't know. When Rachel turned and asked, What's wrong? Vianne stared at her friend. She wanted to be the strong one for once, but she couldn't stop the tears that filled her eyes. Stay in the kitchen, Rachel said to Sarah. If you hear your brother wake up, get him. You, she said to Vianne, come with me. She took Vianne by the arm and guided her through the small salon and into Rachel's bedroom. Vianne sat on the bed and looked up at her friend. Silently, she held out the list of names she'd gotten from Beck. They're prisoners of war, Rachel. Antoine and Mark and all the others. They won't be coming home. Three days later, on a frosty Saturday morning, Vianne stood in her classroom and stared out at the group of women seated in desks that were too small for them. They looked tired and a little wary. No one felt comfortable gathering these days. It was never clear exactly how far verboten extended into conversations about the war. And besides that, the women of Carivo were exhausted. They spent their days standing in line for insufficient quantities of foods, and when they weren't in line, they were foraging the countryside or trying to sell their dancing shoes or a silk scarf for enough money to buy a loaf of good bread. In the back of the room, tucked into the corner, Sophie and Sarah were leaning against each other, knees drawn up, reading books. Rachel moved her sleeping son from one shoulder to the other and closed the door of the classroom. Thank you all for coming. I know how difficult it is these days to do anything more than the absolutely necessary. There was a murmuring of agreement among the women. Why are we here? Madame Fournier asked tiredly. Vianne stepped forward. She had never felt completely comfortable around some of the women many of whom had disliked Vianne when she moved here at 14. When Vianne had caught Antoine, the best-looking young man in town, they'd liked her even less. Those days were long past, of course, and now Vianne was friendly with these women and taught their children and frequented their shops. But even so, the pains of adolescence left a residue of discomfort. I have received a list of French prisoners of war from Carivaux. I am sorry... Terribly sorry to tell you that your husband's, and mine and Rachel's, are on the list. I am told they will not be coming home. She paused, allowing the women to react. Grief and loss transformed the faces around her. Vianne knew the pain mirrored her own. Even so, it was difficult to watch, and she found her eyes misting again. Rachel stepped close, took her hand. 
I got us postcards, Vian said. Official ones, so we can write to our men. How did you get so many postcards? Madame Fournier asked, wiping her eyes. She asked her German for a favor, said Helene Ruel, the baker's wife. I did not, and he's not my German, Vian said. He's a soldier who has requisitioned my home. Should I just let the Germans have Le Jardin? Just walk away and have nothing? Every house or hotel in town with a spare room has been taken by them. I am not special in this. More tusking and murmurs. Some women nodded, others shook their heads. I would have killed myself before I let one of them move into my house, Hélène said. Would you, Hélène? Would you really? Vianne said. And would you kill your children first or throw them into the street to survive on their own? Hélène looked away. They have taken over my hotel, a woman said, and they are gentlemen for the most part, a bit crude perhaps, wasteful. Gentlemen, Hélène spat the word. We are pigs to the slaughter. You will see, pigs who put up no fight at all. I haven't seen you at my butcher shop recently, Madame Fournier said to Vianne in a judgmental voice. My sister goes for me, Vianne said. She knew this was the point of their disapproval. They were afraid that Vianne would get, and take, special privileges that they would be denied. I would not take food or anything from the enemy. She felt suddenly as if she were back in school, being bullied by the popular girls. Vianne is trying to help, Rachel said sternly enough to shut them up. She took the postcards from Vianne and began handing them out. Vianne took a seat and stared down at her own blank postcard. She heard the chicken scratching of other pencils on other postcards, and slowly she began to write. My beloved Antoine, we are well. Sophie is thriving, and even with so many chores, we found some time this summer to spend by the river. We, I, think of you with every breath and pray you are well. Do not worry about us and come home. Je t'aime, Antoine. Her lettering was so small she wondered if he would even be able to read it, or if he would get it, or if he was alive. For God's sake, she was crying. Rachel moved in beside her, laid a hand on her shoulder. We all feel it, she said quietly. Moments later, the women rose one by one. Wordlessly, they shuffled forward and gave Vianne their postcards. Don't let them hurt your feelings, Rachel said. They're just scared. I'm scared too, Vianne said. Rachel pressed her postcard to her chest. Her fingers splayed across the small square of paper, as if she needed to touch each corner. How can we not be? Afterward, when they returned to Le Jardin, Beck's motorcycle with the machine gun mounted sidecar was parked in the grass outside the gate. Rachel turned to her. Do you want us to come in with you? Vianne appreciated the worry in Rachel's gaze, and she knew that if she asked for help, she would get it. But how was she to be helped? No, merci, we are fine. He has probably forgotten something and will soon leave again. He is rarely here these days. Where is Isabel? A good question. She sneaks out every Friday morning before the sunrise. She leaned closer, whispered, I think she is meeting a boy. Good for her. To that, Vian had no answer. Will he mail the postcards for us? Rachel asked. I hope so. Vian stared at her friend a moment longer. Then she said, Well, we will know soon enough, and led Sophie into the house. Once inside, she instructed Sophie to go upstairs to read. Her daughter was used to such directives, and she didn't mind. Vianne tried to keep her daughter and Beck separated as much as possible. He was seated at the dining room table with papers spread out in front of him. At her entrance, he looked up. 
A drop of ink fell from the tip of his fountain pen, landed in a blue starburst on the white sheet of paper in front of him. Madame, most excellent, I am pleased you are returned. She moved forward cautiously, holding the packet of postcards tightly. They'd been tied up with a scrap of twine. I have some postcards here, written by friends in town, to our husbands, but we don't know where to send them. I hoped perhaps you could help us. She shifted uncomfortably from one foot to the other, feeling acutely vulnerable. Of course, madame, I would be pleased to do this favor for you, although it will take much time and research to accomplish. He rose politely. As it happens, I am now concocting a list for my superiors at the Commandantur. They need to know the names of some of the teachers at your school. Oh, she said, uncertain as to why he would tell her this. He never spoke of his work. Of course, they didn't speak often about anything. Jews, communists, homosexuals, Freemasons, Jehovah's Witnesses. Do you know these people? I am Catholic, Herr Captain, as you know. We do not speak of such things at school. I hardly know who are homosexuals and Freemasons at any rate. Ah, so you know the others. I don't understand. I am unclear. My pardons. I would appreciate it most sternly if you would let me know the names of the teachers in your school who are Jewish or communist. Why do you need their names? It is clerical, merely. You know us Germans. They are list makers. He smiled and pulled a chair out for her. Vianne stared down at the blank paper on the table, then at the postcards in her hand. If Antoine received one, he might write back. She might know at last if he was alive. This is not secret information, Herr Captain. Anyone can give you these names. He moved in close to her. With some effort, madam, I believe I can find your husband's address and mail a package for you also. Would this be sanguine? Sanguine is not the right word, Herr Captain. You mean to ask me if it would be all right? She was stalling, and she knew it. Worse, she was pretty sure that he knew it. Ah, thank you so much for tutoring me in your beautiful language. My apologies. He offered her a pen. Do not worry, madame. It is clerical, really. Vianne wanted to say that she wouldn't write down any names. But what would be the point? It was easy enough for him to get this information in town. Everyone knew whose names belonged on the list, and Beck could throw her out of her own house for such a defiance, and what would she do then? She sat down and picked up the pen and began to write down names. It wasn't until the end of the list that she paused and lifted the pen tip from the paper. I'm done, she said in a soft voice. You have forgotten your friend. Did I? Surely you meant to be accurate. She bit her lip nervously and looked down at the list of names. She was certain suddenly that she shouldn't have done this. But what choice did she have? He was in control of her home. What would happen if she defied him? Slowly, feeling sick to her stomach, she wrote the last name on the list. Rachel de Champlain Chapter 12 On a particularly cold morning in late November, Vianne woke with tears on her cheeks. She had been dreaming about Antoine again. With a sigh, she eased out of bed, taking care not to waken Sophie. Vianne had slept fully dressed, wearing a woolen vest, a long-sleeved sweater, woolen stockings, a pair of flannel pants, Antoine's cut down to fit her, and a knit cap and mittens. It wasn't even Christmas, and already layering had become de rigueur. She added a cardigan, and still she was cold. She burrowed her mittened hands into the slit at the foot of the mattress and withdrew the leather pouch Antoine had left for her. 
not much money remained in it. Soon they would have to live on her teaching salary alone. She returned the money, counting it had become an obsession since the weather turned cold, and went downstairs. There was never enough of anything anymore. The pipes froze at night, and so there was no water until midday. Vianne had taken to leaving buckets full of water positioned near the stove and fireplaces for washing. Gas and electricity were scarce, as was money to pay for them, so she was miserly with both. The flames on her stove were so low it barely boiled water. They rarely turned on the lights. She made a fire and then wrapped herself in a heavy eiderdown and sat on the divan. Beside her was a bag of yarn that she'd collected by pulling apart one of her old sweaters. She was making Sophie a scarf for Christmas, and these early morning hours were the only time she could find. With only the creaking of the house for company, she focused on the pale blue yarn and the way the knitting needles dove in and out of the soft strands, creating every moment something that hadn't existed before. It calmed her nerves, this once ordinary morning ritual. If she loosed her thoughts, she might remember her mother sitting beside her, teaching her, saying, Knit one, pearl two. That's right. Beautiful. Or Antoine, coming down the stairs in his stockinged feet, smiling, asking her what she was making for him. Antoine. The front door opened slowly, bringing a burst of ice-cold air and a flurry of leaves. Isabel came in, wearing Antoine's old wool coat and knee-high boots and a scarf that coiled around her head and neck, obscuring all but her eyes. She saw Vianne and came to a sudden stop. Oh, you're up. She unwound the scarf and hung up her coat. There was no mistaking the guilty look on her face. I was out checking on the chickens. Vianne's hands stilled. The needles paused. You might as well tell me who he is, this boy you keep sneaking out to meet. Who would meet the boy in this cold? Isabel went to Vianne, pulling her to her feet, leading her to the fire. At the sudden warmth, Vianne shivered. She hadn't realized how cold she'd been. You, she said, surprised that it made her smile. You would sneak out in the cold to meet a boy. He would have to be some boy. Clark Gable, maybe. Sophie rushed into the room, snuggling up to Vianne. This feels good, she said, holding her hands out. For a beautiful, tender moment, Vianne forgot her worries. And then Isabel said, Well, I'd best go. I need to be first in the butcher's queue. You need to eat something before you go, Vianne said. Give mine to Sophie, Isabel answered, pulling the coat back on and rewinding the scarf around her head. Vianne walked her sister to the door, watched her slip out into the darkness, then returned to the kitchen and lit an oil lamp and went down to the cellar pantry, where rows of shelving ran along the stone wall. Two years ago, this pantry had been full to overflowing with ham smoked in ash and jars full of duck fat set beside coils of sausage, bottles of aged champagne vinegar, tins of sardines, jars of jam. Now they were nearly to the end of the chicory coffee. The last of the sugar was a sparkly white residue in the glass container, and the flour was more precious than gold. Thank God the garden had produced a good crop of vegetables in spite of the war refugees' rampage. She had canned and preserved every single fruit and vegetable, no matter how undersized. She reached for a piece of wholemeal bread that was about to go bad. As breakfast for growing girls went, a boiled egg and a piece of toast wasn't much. But it could be worse. I want more, Sophie said when she'd finished. I can't, Vianne said. The Germans are taking all of our food, Sophie said, just as Beck emerged from his room, dressed in his gray-green uniform. Sophie, Vianne said sharply. Well, it is true, young lady, that we German soldiers are taking much of the food France produces, but men who are fighting need to eat, do they not? 
Sophie frowned up at him. Doesn't everyone need to eat? We, oui, mademoiselle, and we Germans do not only take, we give back to our friends. He reached into the pocket of his uniform and drew out a chocolate bar. Chocolate! Sophie, no, Vian said. But Beck was charming her daughter, teasing her as he made the chocolate bar disappear and reappear by sleight of hand. At last, he gave it to Sophie, who squealed and ripped the paper off. Beck approached Vian. You look sad this morning, he said quietly. Vian didn't know how to respond. He smiled and left. Outside, she heard his motorcycle start up and putter away. That was good chocolate, Sophie said, smacking her lips. You know, it would have been a good idea to have a small piece each night rather than to gobble it all up at once. And I shouldn't have to mention the virtues of sharing. Tante Isabel says it's better to be bold than meek. She says if you jump off a cliff, at least you'll fly before you fall. Ah, yes, that sounds like Isabel. Perhaps you should ask her about the time she broke her wrist jumping from a tree she shouldn't have been climbing in the first place. Come on, let's go to school. Outside, they waited at the side of the muddy, icy road for Rachel and the children. Together, they set off on the long, cold walk to school. I ran out of coffee four days ago, Rachel said. In case you've been wondering why I've been such a witch. I'm the one who has been short-tempered lately. Vianne said. She waited for Rachel to disagree, but Rachel knew her well enough to know when a simple statement wasn't so simple. It's that I've had some things on my mind. The list. She'd written the names down weeks ago, and nothing had come of it. Still, worry lingered. Antoine? Starvation? Freezing to death? Rachel smiled. What small worry has obsessed you this week? The school bell pealed. Hurry, Maman, we are late, Sophie said, grabbing her by the arm, dragging her forward. Vianne let herself be led up the stone steps. She and Sophie and Sarah turned into Vianne's classroom, which was already filled with students. You're late, Madame Moyac, Gilles said with a smile. That's one demerit for you. Everyone laughed. Vianne took off her coat and hung it up. You are very humorous, Gilles, as usual. Let's see if you're still smiling after our spelling test. This time they groaned, and Vianne couldn't help smiling at their crestfallen faces. They all looked so disheartened. It was difficult, honestly, to feel otherwise in this cold, blacked-out room that didn't have enough light to dispel the shadows. Oh, what the heck? It's a cold morning. Maybe a game of tag is what we need to get our blood running. A roar of approval filled the room. Vian barely had time to grab her coat before she was swept out of the classroom on a tide of laughing children. They had only been outside a few moments when Vian heard the grumble of automobiles coming toward the school. The children didn't notice. They only noticed airplanes these days, it seemed, and went on with their play. Vianne walked down to the end of the building and peered around the corner. A black Mercedes-Benz roared up the dirt driveway, its fenders decorated with small swastika flags that flapped in the cold. Behind it was a French police car. Children, Vianne said, rushing back to the courtyard. Come here, stand by me. Two men rounded the corner and came into view. One she had never seen before. He was a tall, elegant, almost a feet blonde man wearing a long black leather coat and spit-shined boots. An iron cross decorated his stand-up collar. The other man she knew. He had been a policeman in Carivo for years, Paul Jolaire. Antoine had often remarked that he had a mean and cowardly streak. Madame Moriac, the French police officer said with an officious nod. She didn't like the look in his eyes. It reminded her of how boys sometimes looked at each other when they were about to bully a weaker child. Bonjour, Paul. We are here for some of your colleagues. There is nothing to concern you, madame, 
You are not on our list. List. What do you want with my colleagues? She heard herself asking, but her voice was almost inaudible, even though the children were silent. Some teachers will be dismissed today. Dismissed? Why? The Nazi agent flicked his pale hand as if he were batting at a fly. Jews and communists and Freemasons. Others, he sneered who are no longer permitted to teach school or work in civil service or in the judiciary. But... The Nazi nodded at the French policeman, and the two turned as one and marched into the school. Madame Mauriac, someone said, tugging on her sleeve. Maman, Sophie said, whining. They can't do that, can they? Course they can, Gilles said. Damn Nazi bastards. Vianne should have disciplined him for his language, but she couldn't think of anything except the list of names she'd given to Beck. Vianne wrestled with her conscience for hours. She'd continued teaching for much of the day, although she couldn't remember how. All that stuck in her mind was the look Rachel had given her as she walked out of the school with the other dismissed teachers. Finally at noon, although they were already shorthanded at school, Vianne had asked another teacher to take over her classroom. Now, she stood at the edge of the town square. All the way here, she had planned what she would say, but when she saw the Nazi flag flying above the Hôtel de Ville, her resolve faltered. Everywhere she looked, there were German soldiers, walking in pairs, or riding gorgeous, well-fed horses, or darting up the streets in shiny black Citroëns. Across the square... A Nazi blew his whistle and used his rifle to force an old man to his knees. Go, Vian. She walked up the stone steps to the closed oak doors, where a fresh-faced young guard stopped her and demanded to know her business. I am here to see Captain Beck, she said. Ah. The guard opened the door for her and pointed up the wide stone staircase, making the number two with his fingers. Vianne stepped into the main room of the town hall. It was crowded with men in uniforms. She tried not to make eye contact with anyone as she hurried across the lobby to the stairs, which she ascended under the watchful eyes of the Führer, whose portrait took up much of the wall. On the second floor, she found a man in uniform, and she said to him, Captain Beck, s'il vous plaît? Oui, madame. He showed her to a door at the end of the hall and rapped smartly upon it. At a response from within, he opened the door for her. Beck was seated behind an ornate black and gold desk, obviously taken from one of the grand homes in the area. Behind him, a portrait of Hitler and a collection of maps were affixed to the walls. On his desk was a typewriter and a Ronio machine. In the corner stood a pile of confiscated radios, but worst of all was the food. There were boxes and boxes of food, heaps of cured meats and wheels of cheese stacked against the back wall. Madame Mauriac, he said, rising quickly. But a most pleasant surprise. He came toward her. What may I do for you? It is about the teachers you fired at the school. Not I, madame. Vianne glanced at the open door behind them and took a step toward him, lowering her voice to say, You told me the list of names was clerical in nature. I am sorry, truly. This is what I was told. We need them at the school. Your being here, it is dangerous, perhaps. He closed the small distance between them. You do not want to draw attention to yourself, Madame Moyak. Not here. There is a man. He glanced at the door and stopped speaking. Go, Madame. I wish you hadn't asked me. As do I, Madame. He gave her an understanding look. Now, go. Please. You should not be here. Vianne turned away from Captain Beck and all that food and the picture of the Führer, and left his office. On her way down the stairs, she saw how the soldiers observed her 
smiling to one another, no doubt joking about another French woman courting a dashing German soldier who had just broken her heart. But it wasn't until she stepped back out into the sunshine that she realized fully her mistake. Several women were in the square or near it, and they saw her step out of the Nazis' lair. One of the women was Isabel. Vianne hurried down the steps toward Hélène Ruel, the baker's wife, who was delivering bread to the commandantur. Socializing, Madame Moyac, Hélène said archly as Vianne rushed past her. Isabel was practically running across the square toward her. With a defeated sigh, Vianne came to a standstill, waiting for her sister to reach her. What are you doing in there? Isabel demanded, her voice too loud, or maybe that was only to Vianne's ears. They fired the teachers today. No, not all of them, just the Jews and the Freemasons and the Communists. The memory welled up in her, made her feel sick. She remembered the quiet hallway and the confusion among the teachers who remained. No one knew what to do, how to defy the Nazis. Just them, huh? Isabel said, her face tightening. I didn't mean it to sound that way. I meant to clarify, they didn't fire all the teachers. Even to her own ears, it sounded a feeble excuse, so she shut up. And this says nothing to explain your presence at their headquarters. I thought Captain Beck could help us, help Rachel. You went to Beck for a favor? I had to. French women do not ask Nazis for help, Vianne. Mon Dieu, you must know this. I know, Vianne said defiantly. But... But what? Vianne couldn't hold it in anymore. I gave him a list of names. Isabel went very still. For an instant, she seemed not to be breathing. The look she gave Vianne stung more than a slap across the face. How could you do that? Did you give him Rachel's name? I... I didn't know. Vianne stammered. How could I know? He said it was clerical. She grabbed Isabel's hand. Forgive me, Isabel. Truly, I didn't know. It is not my forgiveness you need to seek, Vianne. Vianne felt a stinging, profound shame. How could she have been so foolish? And how in God's name could she make amends? She glanced at her wristwatch. Classes would be ending soon. Go to the school, Vianne said. Get Sophie and Sarah and take them home. There's something I need to do. Whatever it is, I hope you've thought it through. Go, Vianne said tiredly. The chapel of St. Jeanne was a small stone Norman church at the edge of town. Behind it, and within its medieval walls, lay the convent of the Sisters of St. Joseph, nuns who ran both an orphanage and a school. Vianne went into the church, her footsteps echoing on the cold stone floor, her breath plumed in front of her. She took off her mittens just long enough to touch her fingertips to the frozen holy water. She made the sign of the cross and went to an empty pew. She genuflected and then knelt. Closing her eyes, she bent her head in prayer. She needed guidance and forgiveness. But for the first time in her life, she could find no words for her prayer. How could she be forgiven for such a foolish, thoughtless act? God would see her guilt and fear, and he would judge her. She lowered her clasped hands and climbed back up to sit on the wooden pew. Vian Moyak, is that you? Mother Superior Marie Therese moved in beside Vianne and sat down. She waited for Vianne to speak. It had always been this way between them. The first time Vianne had come to Mother for advice, Vianne had been sixteen years old and pregnant. It had been Mother who comforted Vianne after Papa had called her a disgrace. Mother, who had planned for a rushed wedding and talked Papa into letting Vianne and Antoine have Le Jardin, mother who'd promised Vianne that a child was always a miracle and that young love could endure. You know there is a German billeted at my house. 
Vianne said finally. They are at all of the big homes and in every hotel. He asked me which of the teachers at school were Jewish or communist or Freemasons. Ah, and you answered him. That makes me the fool Isabel calls me, doesn't it? You are no fool, Vianne. She gazed at Vianne. And your sister is quick to judge. That much I remember about her. I ask myself if they would have found these names without my help. They have dismissed Jews from positions all over town. Do you not know this? Monsieur Penoir is not the postmaster anymore, and Judge Breillat has been replaced. I have had news from Paris that the headmistress of College Sevigny was forced to resign, as have all of the Jewish singers at the Paris Opera. Perhaps they needed your help, perhaps they did not. Certainly they would have found the names without your help, Mother said in a voice that was both gentle and stern. But that is not what matters. What do you mean? I think as this war goes on, we will all have to look more deeply. These questions are not about them, but about us. Vianne felt tears sting her eyes. I don't know what to do anymore. Antoine always took care of everything. The Wehrmacht and the Gestapo are more than I can handle. Don't think about who they are. Think about who you are and what sacrifices you can live with and what will break you. It's all breaking me. I need to be more like Isabel. She is so certain of everything. This war is black and white for her. Nothing seems to scare her. Isabel will have her crisis of faith in this too, as will we all. I have been here before in the Great War. I know the hardships are just beginning. You must stay strong. By believing in God. Yes, of course, but not only by believing in God. Prayers and faith will not be enough, I'm afraid. The path of righteousness is often dangerous. Get ready, Vianne. This is only your first test. Learn from it. Mother leaned forward and hugged Vianne again. Vianne held on tightly, her face pressed to the scratchy wool habit. When she pulled back, she felt a little better. Mother Superior stood, took Vianne's hand, and drew her to a stand. Perhaps you could find the time to visit the children this week and give them a lesson? They loved it when you taught them painting. As you can imagine, there's a lot of grumbling about empty bellies these days. Praise the Lord the sisters have an excellent garden and the goat's milk and cheese is a godsend. Still... Yes, Vianne said. Everyone knew about how the belt tightening felt, especially to children. You're not alone, and you're not the one in charge, Mother said gently. Ask for help when you need it, and give help when you can. I think that is how we serve God, and each other, and ourselves, in times as dark as these. You're not the one in charge. Vianne contemplated Mother's words all the way home. She had always taken great comfort in her faith. When Maman had first begun to cough, and then when that coughing deepened, into a hacking shudder that left sprays of blood on handkerchiefs, Vianne had prayed to God for all that she needed, help, guidance, a way to cheat the death that had come to call. At fourteen, she'd promised God anything, everything, if he would just spare her mamma's life. With her prayers unanswered, she returned to God and prayed for the strength to deal with the aftermath, her loneliness, Papa's bleak, angry silences and drunken rages, Isabel's wailing neediness. Time and again, she had returned to God, pleading for help, promising her faith. She wanted to believe that she was neither alone nor in charge, but rather that her life was unfolding according to his plan, even if she couldn't see it. Now, though, such hope felt as slight and bendable as tin. She was alone, 
and there was no one else in charge, no one but the Nazis. She had made a terrible, grievous mistake. She couldn't take it back, however much she might hope for such a chance. She couldn't undo it. But a good woman would accept responsibility, and blame, and apologize. Whatever else she was or wasn't, whatever her failings, she intended to be a good woman. And so she knew what she needed to do. She knew it. And still, when she came to the gate at Rachel's cottage, she found herself unable to move. Her feet felt heavy, her heart even more so. She took a deep breath and knocked on the door. There was a shuffling of feet within, and then the door opened. Rachel held her sleeping son in one arm and had a pair of dungarees slung over the other. Vian, she said, smiling. Come in. Vian almost gave in to cowardice. Oh, Rachel, I just stopped by to say hello. Instead, she took a deep breath and followed her friend into the house. She took her usual place in the comfortable upholstered chair tucked in close to the blazing fire. Take Ari, I'll make us coffee. Vian reached for the sleeping baby and took him in her arms. He snuggled close, and she stroked his back and kissed the back of his head. We heard that some of the care packages were being delivered to prisoner of war camps by the Red Cross. Rachel said a moment later, coming into the room carrying two cups of coffee. She set one down on the table next to Vianne. Where are the girls? At my house, with Isabel. Probably learning how to shoot a gun. Rachel laughed. There are worse skills to have. She pulled the dungarees from her shoulder and tossed them onto a straw basket with the rest of her sewing. Then she sat down across from Vianne. Vianne breathed in deeply of the sweet scent that was pure baby. When she looked up, Rachel was staring at her. Is it one of those days? She asked quietly. Vianne gave an unsteady smile. Rachel knew how much Vianne sometimes mourned her lost babies, and how deeply she'd prayed for more children. It had been difficult between them, not a lot, but a little, when Rachel had gotten pregnant with Ari. There was joy for Rachel, and a thread of envy. No, she said. She lifted her chin slowly, looked her best friend in the eyes. I have something to tell you. What? Vianne drew in a breath. Do you remember the day we wrote the postcards, and Captain Beck was waiting for me when we got home? We? Oui, I offered to come in with you. I wish you had although I don't suppose it would have made a difference. He just would have waited until you left. Rachel started to rise. Did he? No, no, she said quickly. Not that. He was working at the dining room table that day, writing something when I returned. He asked me for a list of names. He wanted to know which of the teachers at the school were Jewish or communists. She paused. He asked about homosexuals and Freemasons, too, as if people talk about such things. You told him you didn't know. Shame made Vianne look away, but only for a second. She forced herself to say, I gave him your name, Rachel, along with the others. Rachel went very still. The color drained from her face, making her dark eyes stand out. And they fired us. Vianne swallowed hard, nodded. Rachel got to her feet and walked past Vianne without stopping, ignoring her pleading. Please, Rachel. Pulling away so she couldn't be touched, she went into her bedroom and slammed the door shut. Time passed slowly, in indrawn breaths, and captured prayers, and creaks of the chair. Vianne watched the tiny black hands on the mantel clock tick forward. She patted the baby's back in rhythm with the passing minutes. Finally, the door opened. Rachel walked back into the room. Her hair was a mess, as if she'd been shoving her hands through it. Her cheeks were blotchy, from either anxiety or anger, maybe both. 
Her eyes were red from crying. I'm so sorry, Vian said, rising. Forgive me. Rachel came to a stop in front of her, looking down at her. Anger flashed in her eyes, then faded and was replaced by resignation. Everyone in town knows I'm a Jew, Vian. I've always been proud of it. I know that. It's what I told myself. Still, I shouldn't have helped him. I am sorry. I wouldn't hurt you for the world. I hope you know that. Of course I know it, Rachel said quietly. But V, you need to be more careful. I know Beck is young and handsome and friendly and polite. But he's a Nazi, and they are dangerous. The winter of 1940 was the coldest anyone could remember. Snow fell day after day, blanketing the trees and fields. Icicles glittered on drooping tree branches. And still, Isabel woke every Friday morning, hours before dawn, and distributed her terrorist papers, as the Nazis now called them. Last week's tract followed the military operations in North Africa and alerted the French people to the fact that the winter's food shortages were not a result of the British blockades, as Nazi propaganda insisted, but rather were caused by the Germans looting everything France produced. Isabel had been distributing these tracts for months now, and truthfully, she couldn't see that they were having much impact on the people of Carivo. Many of the villagers still supported Pétain. Even more didn't care. A disturbing number of her neighbors looked upon the Germans and thought, so young, just boys, and went on trudging through life with their heads down, just trying to stay out of danger. The Nazis had noticed the flyers, of course. Some Frenchmen and women would use any excuse to curry favor, and giving the Nazis the flyers they found in their letterboxes was a start. Isabel knew that the Germans were looking for whoever printed and distributed the tracts, but they weren't looking too hard, especially not on these snowy days when the Blitz of London was all anyone could talk about. Perhaps the Germans knew that words on a piece of paper were not enough to turn the tide of a war. Today, Isabel lay in bed, with Sophie curled like a tiny sword fern beside her, and Vianne sleeping heavily on the girl's other side. The three of them now slept together in Vianne's bed. Over the past month, they'd added every quilt and blanket they could find to the bed. Isabel lay watching her breath gather and disappear in thin white clouds. She knew how cold the floor would be even through the woolen stocking she wore to bed. She knew this was the last time all day she would be warm. She steeled herself and eased out from underneath the pile of quilts. Beside her, Sophie made a moaning sound and rolled over to her mother's body for heat. When Isabel's feet hit the floor, pain shot into her shins. She winced and hobbled out of the room. The stairs took forever. Her feet hurt so badly. The damn chillblains. Everyone was suffering from them this winter. Supposedly, it was from a lack of butter and fat, but Isabel knew it was caused by cold weather and socks full of holes and shoes that were coming apart at the seams. She wanted to start a fire, ached for even a moment's warmth, really, but they were on their last bit of wood. In late January, they'd started ripping out barn wood and burning it, along with toolboxes and old chairs and whatever else they could find. She made herself a cup of boiling water and drank it down, letting the heat and weight trick her stomach into thinking it wasn't empty. She ate a small bit of stale bread, wrapped her body in a layer of newsprint, and then put on Antoine's coat and her own mittens and boots. A woolen scarf she wrapped around her head and neck, and even so, when she stepped outside, the cold took her breath away. She closed the door behind her and trudged out into the snow, her chill-blained toes throbbing with every step, her fingers going cold instantly, even inside the mittens. It was eerily quiet out here. She hiked through the knee-deep snow and opened the broken gate and stepped out onto the white-packed road. Because of the cold and snow, it took her three hours to deliver her papers this week's content was about the Blitz. 
the Bosch had dropped 32,000 bombs on London in one night alone. Dawn, when it came, was as weak as meatless broth. She was the first in line at the butcher's shop, but others soon followed. At 7 a.m., the butcher's wife rolled open the window gate and unlocked the door. Octopus, the woman said. Isabel felt a pang of disappointment. No meat? Not for the French, mademoiselle. She heard grumbling behind her from the women who wanted meat, and farther back, from the women who knew they wouldn't even be lucky enough to get octopus. Isabel took the paper-wrapped octopus and left the shop. At least she'd gotten something. There was no tinned milk to be had anymore, not with ration cards or even on the black market. She was fortunate enough to get a little camembert after two more hours in line. She covered her precious items with the heavy towel in her basket and hobbled down Rue Victor Hugo. As she passed a café filled with German soldiers and French policemen, she smelled brewed coffee and freshly baked croissants, and her stomach grumbled. Mademoiselle, a French policeman nodded crisply and indicated a need to step around her. She moved aside and watched him put up a poster in an abandoned storefront's window. The first poster read, Notice, shot for spying, the Jew Jacob Mansard, the communist Victor Yablonsky, and the Jew Louis Devry, and the second. Notice, henceforth, all French people arrested for any crime or infraction will be considered hostages. When a hostile act against Germany occurs in France, hostages will be shot. They're shooting ordinary French people for nothing, she said. Don't look so pale, mademoiselle. These warnings are not for beautiful women such as yourself. Isabel glared at the man. He was worse than the Germans, a Frenchman doing this to his own people. This was why she hated the Vichy government. What good was self-rule for half of France if it turned them into Nazi puppets? Are you unwell, mademoiselle? So solicitous, so caring. What would he do if she called him a traitor and spat in his face? I am fine, merci. She watched him cross the street confidently, his back straight, his hat positioned just so on his cropped brown hair. The German soldiers in the cafe welcomed him warmly, clapped him on the back, and pulled him into their midst. Isabel turned away in disgust. That was when she saw it. A bright silver bicycle leaning against the sidewall of the cafe. At the sight of it, she thought how much it would change her life, ease her pain, to ride to town and back each day. Normally a bicycle would be guarded by the soldiers in the cafe, but on this dark, snow-dusted morning, no one was outside at a table. Don't do it. Her heart started beating, quickly. Her palms turned damp and hot within her mittens. She glanced around. The women queued up at the butchers made it a point to see nothing and make eye contact with no one. The windows of the cafe across the street were fogged. Inside, the men were olive-hued silhouettes. So certain of themselves. Of us, she thought bitterly. At that, whatever sliver of restraint she possessed disappeared. She held the basket close to her side and limped out onto the ice-slicked cobblestone street, from that second, that one step forward, the world seemed to blur around her and time slowed down. She heard her breath, saw the plumes of it in front of her face. The buildings blurred or faded into white hulks. The snow dazzled until all she could see was the glint of the silver handlebars and the two black tires. She knew there was only one way to do this, fast, without a glance sideways or a pause in her step. Somewhere a dog barked. A door banged shut. Isabel kept walking. Five steps separated her from the bicycle. Four. Three. Two. She stepped up onto the sidewalk and took hold of the bicycle and jumped onto it. She rode down the cobblestone street, the chassis clanging at bumps in the road. She skidded around the corner, almost fell, and righted herself, 
pedaling hard toward Rue La Grande. There, she turned into the alley and jumped off the bicycle to knock on the door. Four hard clacks. The door opened slowly. Henri saw her and frowned. She pushed her way inside. The small meeting room was barely lit. A single oil lamp sat on a scarred wooden table. Henri was the only one here. He was making sausage from a tray of meat and fat. Skeins of it hung from hooks on the wall. The room smelled of meat and blood and cigarette smoke. She yanked the bicycle in with her and slammed the door shut. Well, hello, he said, wiping his hands on a towel. Have we called a meeting I don't know about? No. He glanced at her side. That's not your bicycle. I stole it, she said, from right under their noses. It is, or was, Alain Deschamps' bicycle. He left everything and fled to Lyon with his family when the occupation began. He moved toward her. Lately I have been seeing an SS soldier riding it around town. SS? Isabel's elation faded. There were ugly rumors swirling about the SS and their cruelty. Perhaps she should have thought this through. He moved closer, so close she could feel the warmth of his body. She had never been alone with him before, nor so near him. She saw for the first time that his eyes were neither brown nor green, but rather a hazel gray that made her think of fog in a deep forest. She saw a small scar at his brow that had either been a terrible gash at one time or poorly stitched, and it made her wonder all at once what kind of life he'd led that had brought him here and to communism. He was older than she by at least a decade, although to be honest, he seemed even older sometimes, as if perhaps he'd suffered a great loss. You'll need to paint it, he said. I don't have any paint. I do. Would you? A kiss, he said. A kiss? She repeated it to stall for time. This was the sort of thing that she'd taken for granted before the war. Men desired her. They always had. She wanted that back, wanted to flirt with Henri and be flirted with, and yet the very idea of it felt sad and a little lost, as if perhaps kisses didn't mean much anymore, and flirtation even less. One kiss and I'll paint your bicycle tonight, and you can pick it up tomorrow. She stepped toward him and tilted her face up to his. They came together easily, even with all the coats and layers of newsprint and wool between them. He took her in his arms and kissed her. For a beautiful second, she was Isabel Rossignol again, the passionate girl whom men desired. When it ended and he drew back, she felt deflated, sad. She should say something, make a joke, or perhaps pretend that she felt more than she did. That's what she would have done before, when kisses had meant more, or maybe less. There's someone else, Henri said, studying her intently. No, there isn't. Henri touched her cheek gently. You're lying. Isabel thought of all that Henri had given her. He was the one who'd brought her into the Free French Network and given her a chance. He was the one who believed in her. And yet when he kissed her, she thought of Gaetan. He didn't want me, she said. It was the first time she'd told anyone the truth. The admission surprised her. If things were different, I'd make you forget him. And I'd let you try. She saw the way he smiled at that, saw the sorrow in it. Blue, he said after a pause. Blue? It's the paint color I have. Isabel smiled. How fitting. Later that day, as she stood in one line after another for too little food, and then as she gathered wood from the forest and carried it home, she thought about that kiss. What she thought, over and over again, was, if only. Chapter 13 On a beautiful day in late April of 1941, 
Isabel lay stretched out on a woolen blanket in the field across from the house. The sweet smell of ripening hay filled her nostrils. When she closed her eyes, she could almost forget that the engines in the distance were German lorries taking soldiers and France's produce to the train station at Tours. After the disastrous winter, she appreciated how the sunshine lulled her into a drowsy state. There you are. Isabel sighed and sat up. Vianne wore a faded blue gingham day dress that had been grayed by harsh homemade soap. Hunger had whittled her down over the winter, sharpened her cheekbones, and deepened the hollow at the base of her throat. An old scarf turbaned her head, hiding hair that had lost its shine and curl. This came for you. Vianne held out a piece of paper. It was delivered by a man. For you, she said, as if that fact bore repeating. Isabel clambered awkwardly to her feet and snatched the paper from Vianne's grasp. On it, in scrawled handwriting, was, The curtains are open. She reached down for her blanket and began folding it up. What did it mean? They'd never summoned her before. Something important must be happening. Isabel, would you care to explain? No. It was Henri Navarre, the innkeeper's son. I didn't think you knew him. Isabel ripped the note into tiny pieces and let it fall away. He's a communist, you know, Vianne said in a whisper. I need to go. Vianne grabbed her wrist. You cannot have been sneaking out all winter to see a communist. You know what the Nazis think of them. It's dangerous to even be seen with this man. You think I care what the Nazis think? Isabel said, wrenching free. She ran barefooted across the field. At home, she grabbed some shoes and climbed aboard her bicycle. With an au revoir to a stunned-looking Vianne, Isabel was off pedaling down the dirt road. In town, she coasted past the abandoned hat shop. Sure enough, the curtains were open, and veered into the cobblestone alley and came to a stop. She leaned her bicycle against the rough limestone wall beside her and rapped four times. It didn't occur to her until the final knock that it might be a trap. The idea, when it came, made her draw in a sharp breath and glance left and right, but it was too late now. Henri opened the door. Isabel ducked inside. The room was hazy with cigarette smoke and reeked of burnt chicory coffee. There was about the place a lingering scent of blood, sausage-making. The burly man who had first grabbed her, Didier, was seated on an old hickory-backed chair, he was leaning back so far the two front chair legs were off the floor and his back grazed the wall behind him. You shouldn't have brought a notice to my house, Henri. My sister is asking questions. It was important we talked to you immediately. Isabel felt a little bump of excitement. Would they finally ask her to do something more than dropping papers and letter boxes? I am here. Henri lit up a cigarette. She could feel him watching her as he exhaled the gray smoke and put down his match. Have you heard of a prefect in Chartres who was arrested and tortured for being a communist? Isabel frowned. No. He cut his own throat with a piece of glass rather than name anyone or confess. Henri snubbed his cigarette out on the bottom of his shoe and saved the rest for later in his coat pocket. He is putting a group together of people like us who want to heed de Gaulle's call. He, the one who cut his own throat, is trying to get to London to speak to de Gaulle himself. He seeks to organize a free French movement. He didn't die? Isabel asked. Or cut his vocal cords? No, they're calling it a miracle, Didier said. Henri studied Isabel. I have a letter very important, that needs to be delivered to our contact in Paris. Unfortunately, I am being watched closely these days, as is Didier. 
Oh, Isabel said. I thought of you, Didier said. Me? Henri reached into his pocket and withdrew a crumpled envelope. Will you deliver this to our man in Paris? He is expecting it a week from today. But I don't have an Ausweis. We, oui, Henri said quietly. And if you were caught? He let that threat dangle. Certainly no one would think badly of you if you declined. This is dangerous. Dangerous was an understatement. There were signs posted throughout Carivo about executions that were taking place all over the occupied zone. The Nazis were killing French citizens for the smallest of infractions. Aiding this free French movement could get her imprisoned at the very least. Still, she believed in a free France the way her sister believed in God. So you want me to get a pass, go to Paris, deliver a letter, and come home? It didn't sound so perilous when put that way. No, Henri said. We need you to stay in Paris and be our letterbox, as it were. In the coming months, there will be many such deliveries. Your father has an apartment there, we. Oui? Paris. It was what she'd longed for from the moment her father had exiled her, to leave Carivo and return to Paris, and to be part of a network of people who resisted this war. My father will not offer me a place to stay. Convince him otherwise, Didier said evenly, watching her, judging her. He is not a man who is easily convinced, she said. So you can't do it. Voila, we have our answer. Wait, Isabel said. Henri approached her. She saw reluctance in his eyes and knew that he wanted her to turn down this assignment. No doubt he was worried about her. She lifted her chin and looked him in the eyes. I will do this. You will have to lie to everyone you love and always be afraid. Can you live that way? You'll not feel safe anywhere. Isabel laughed grimly. It was not so different from the life she'd lived since she was a little girl. Will you watch over my sister? She asked Henri. Make sure she's safe? There is a price for all our work, Henri said. He gave her a sad look. In it was the truth they had all learned. There was no safety. I hope you see that. All Isabel saw was her chance to do something that mattered. When do I leave? As soon as you get an Ausweis, which will not be easy. What in heaven's name is that girl thinking? Really, a schoolyard-style note from a man? A communist? Vianne unwrapped the stringy piece of mutton that had been this week's ration and set it on the kitchen counter. Isabel had always been impetuous, a force of nature, really, a girl who liked to break rules. Countless nuns and teachers had learned that she could be neither controlled nor contained. But this, this was not kissing a boy on the dance floor or running away to see the circus or refusing to wear a girdle and stockings. This was wartime in an occupied country. How could Isabel still believe that her choices had no consequences? Vianne began finally chopping the mutton. She added a precious egg to the mix and stale bread, then seasoned it with salt and pepper. She was forming the mixture into patties when she heard a motorcycle putt-puttering toward the house. She went to the front door and opened it just enough to peer out. Captain Beck's head and shoulders could be seen above the stone wall as he dismounted his motorcycle. Moments later, a green military lorry pulled up behind him and parked. Three other German soldiers appeared in her yard. The men talked among themselves and then gathered at the rose-covered stone wall her great-great-grandfather had built. One of the soldiers lifted a sledgehammer and brought it down hard on the wall, which shattered. Stones broke into pieces, a skein of roses fell, their pink petals scattering across the grass. Vianne rushed out into her yard. 
Herr Kapitän. The sledgehammer came down again. Crack. Madame, Beck said, looking unhappy. It bothered Vianne that she knew him well enough to notice his state of mind. We have orders to tear down all the walls along this road. As one soldier demolished the wall, two others came toward the front door, laughing at some joke between them. Without asking permission, they walked past her and went into her house. My condolences, Beck said, stepping over the rubble on his way to her. I know you love the roses, and, most sorrowfully, my men will be fulfilling a requisition order from your house. A requisition? The soldiers came out of the house. One carried the oil painting that had been over the mantel, and the other had the overstuffed chair from the salon. That was my grandmère's favorite chair, Vienne said quietly. I'm sorry, Beck said. I was unable to stop this. What in the world? Vienne didn't know whether to be relieved or concerned when Isabel yanked her bike over the pile of stone and leaned it against the tree. Already there was no barrier between her property and the road anymore. Isabel looked beautiful, even with her face pink from the exertion of riding her bicycle and shiny with perspiration. Glossy blonde waves framed her face. Her faded red dress clung to her body in all the right places. The soldiers stopped to stare at her. The rolled-up Abusan rug from the living room slung between them. Beck removed his military cap. He said something to the soldiers who were carrying the rolled-up carpet, and they hurried toward the lorry. You've torn down our wall, Isabel said. The Sternborn Führer wants to be able to see all houses from the road. Somebody is distributing anti-German propaganda. We shall find and arrest him. You think harmless pieces of paper are worth all of this? Isabel asked. They are far from harmless, mademoiselle. They encourage terrorism. Terrorism must be avoided, Isabel said, crossing her arms. Vianne couldn't look away from Isabel. There was something going on. Her sister seemed to be drawing her emotions back, going still, like a cat preparing to pounce. Herr Captain, Isabel said after a while. Oui, mademoiselle. Soldiers walked past them, carrying out the breakfast table. Isabel let them pass and then walked to the captain. My papa is ill. He is? Vianne said. Why don't I know this? What's wrong with him? Isabel ignored Vianne. He has asked that I come to Paris to nurse him, but... He wants you to nurse him? Vianne said, incredulous. Beck said, You need a travel pass to leave, mademoiselle. You know this. I know this. Isabel seemed to barely breathe. I thought perhaps you would procure one for me. You are a family man. Certainly you understand how important it is to answer a father's call. Strangely, as Isabel spoke, the captain turned slightly to look at Vianne, as if she were the one who mattered. I could get you a pass, we, oui, the captain said. For a family emergency such as this. I am grateful, Isabel said. Vianne was stunned. Did Beck not see how her sister was manipulating him? And why had he looked at Vianne when making his decision? As soon as Isabel got what she wanted, she returned to her bicycle. She took hold of the handlebars and walked it toward the barn. The rubber wheels bumped and thumped on the uneven ground. Vianne rushed after her. Papa's ill? She said when she caught up with her sister. Papa's fine. You lied? Why? Isabel's pause was slight, but perceptible. I suppose there is no reason to lie. It's all out in the open now. I have been sneaking out on Friday mornings to meet Henri, and now he has asked me to go to Paris with him. He has a lovely little pied-à-terre in the Montmartre, apparently. Are you mad? I am in love, I think. A little. Maybe. 
you are going to cross Nazi-occupied France to spend a few nights in Paris in the bed of a man whom you might love a little. I know, Isabel said. It's so romantic. You must be feverish. Perhaps you have a brain sickness of some kind. She put her hands on her hips and made a huff of disapproval. If love is a disease, I suppose I'm infected. Good God, Vianne crossed her arms. Is there anything I can say to stop this foolishness? Isabel looked at her. You believe me? You believe I would cross Nazi-occupied France on a lark? This is not like running away to see the circus, Isabel. But you believe this of me? Of course, Vianne shrugged. So foolish. Isabel looked oddly crestfallen. Just stay away from Beck while I'm gone. Don't trust him. Isn't that just like you? You're worried enough to warn me, but not worried enough to stay with me. What you want is really what matters. Sophie and I can rot for all you care. That's not true. Isn't it? Go to Paris. Have your fun. But don't for one minute forget that you are abandoning your niece and me. Vianne crossed her arms and glanced back at the man in her yard who was supervising the looting of her house. With him. Chapter 14 April 27th, 1995 The Oregon Coast I am trussed up like a chicken for roasting. I know these modern seat belts are a good thing, but they make me feel claustrophobic. I belong to a generation that didn't expect to be protected from every danger. I remember what it used to be like back in the days when one was required to make smart choices. We knew the risks and took them anyway. I remember driving too fast in my old Chevrolet, my foot pressed hard on the gas, smoking a cigarette and listening to Price sing Laudy Miss Claudie through small black speakers while children rolled around in the back seat like bowling pins. My son is afraid that I will make a break for it, I suppose, and it is a reasonable fear. In the past month, my entire life has been turned upside down. There is a sold sign in my front yard, and I am leaving home. It's a pretty driveway, don't you think? My son says. It's what he does. He fills space with words, and he chooses them carefully. It is what makes him a good surgeon. Precision. Yes. He turns into the parking lot. Like the driveway, it is lined in flowering trees. Tiny white blossoms drop to the ground like bits of lace on a dressmaker's floor, stark against the black asphalt. I fumble with my seatbelt as we park. My hands do not obey my will these days. It frustrates me so much that I curse out loud. I'll do that, my son says, reaching sideways to unhook my seatbelt. He is out of the automobile and at my door before I have even retrieved my handbag. The door opens. He takes me by the hand and helps me out of the car. In the short distance between the parking lot and the entrance, I have to stop twice to catch my breath. The trees are so pretty this time of year, he says as we walk together across the parking lot. Yes, they are flowering plum trees, gorgeous and pink, but I think suddenly of chestnut trees in bloom along the Champs-Élysées. My son tightens his hold on my hand. It is a reminder that he understands the pain of leaving a home that has been my sanctuary for nearly fifty years. But now it is time to look ahead, not behind to the Ocean Crest Retirement Community and Nursing Home. To be fair, 
It doesn't look like a bad place. A little industrial, maybe, with its rigidly upright windows and perfectly maintained patch of grass out front and the American flag flying above the door. It is a long, low building, built in the 70s, I'd guess, back when just about everything was ugly. There are two wings that reach out from a central courtyard, where I imagine old people sit in wheelchairs with their faces turned to the sun, waiting. Thank God I am not housed in the east side of the building, the nursing home wing. Not yet, anyway. I can still manage my own life, thank you very much, and my own apartment. Julian opens the door for me, and I go inside. The first thing I see is a large reception area decorated to look like the hospitality desk of a seaside hotel, complete with a fishing net full of shells hung on the wall. I imagine that at Christmas they hang ornaments from the netting and stockings from the edge of the desk. There are probably sparkly ho-ho-ho signs tacked up to the wall on the day after Thanksgiving. Come on, Mom. Oh, right. Mustn't dawdle. The place smells of what? Tapioca pudding and chicken noodle soup. Soft foods. Somehow I keep going. If there's one thing I never do, it's stop. Here we are, my son says, opening the door to room 317A. It's nice, honestly. A small, one-bedroom apartment. The kitchen is tucked into the corner by the door, and from it one can look out over a formica counter and see a dining table with four chairs and the living room, where a coffee table and sofa and two chairs are gathered around a gas fireplace. The TV in the corner is brand new, with a built-in VCR player. Someone, my son probably, has stacked a bunch of my favorite movies in the bookcase. Jean de Florette, Breathless, Gone with the Wind. I see my things, an afghan I knitted thrown over the sofa's back, my books in the bookcase. In the bedroom, which is of a fine size, the nightstand on my side of the bed is lined with prescription pill containers, a little jungle of plastic orange cylinders. My side of the bed. It's funny but some things don't change after the death of a spouse, and that's one of them. The left side of the bed is mine, even though I'm alone in it. At the foot of the bed is my trunk, just as I have requested. You could still change your mind, he says quietly. Come home with me. We've talked about this, Julian. Your life is too busy, you needn't worry about me 24-7. Do you think I will worry less when you are here? I look at him, loving this child of mine and knowing my death will devastate him. I don't want him to watch me die by degrees. I don't want that for his daughters either. I know what it is like. Some images, once seen, can never be forgotten. I want them to remember me as I am, not as I will be when the cancer has had its way. He leads me into the small living room and gets me settled on the couch. While I wait, he pours us some wine and then sits beside me. I am thinking of how it will feel when he leaves, and I'm sure the same thought occupies his mind. With a sigh, he reaches into his briefcase and pulls out a stack of envelopes. The sigh is in place of words, a breath of transition. In it, I hear that moment where I go from one life to another. In this new, pared-down version of my life, 
I am to be cared for by my son instead of vice versa. It's not really comfortable for either of us. I've paid this month's bills. These are things I don't know what to do with. Junk mostly, I think. I take the stack of letters from him and shuffle through them. A personalized letter from the Special Olympics Committee. A free estimate awning offer. A notice from my dentist that it has been six months since my last appointment. A letter from Paris. There are red markings on it, as if the post office has shuffled it around from place to place, or delivered it incorrectly. Mom, Julian says. He is so observant. He misses nothing. What is that? When he reaches for the envelope, I mean to hold on to it, keep it from him, but my fingers don't obey my will. My heartbeat is going all which away. Julian opens the envelope, extracts an écru card, an invitation. It's in French, he says. Something about the Croix de Guerre. So it's about World War II? Is this for Dad? Of course. Men always think war is all about them. And there's something handwritten in the corner. What is it? Guerre. The word expands around me, unfolds its black crow wings, becoming so big I cannot look away. Against my will, I take up the invitation. It is to a passeur's reunion in Paris. They want me to attend. How can I possibly go without remembering all of it? The terrible things I have done. The secret I kept. The man I killed. And the one I should have. Mom, what's a passeur? I can hardly find enough voice to say. It's someone who helped people. In the war. Chapter 15 Asking yourself a question, that's how resistance begins. And then ask that very question to someone else. Remco Campert May 1941, France On the Monday Isabel left for Paris, Vianne kept busy. She washed clothes and hung them out to dry. She weeded her garden and gathered a few early ripening vegetables. At the end of a long day, she treated herself to a bath and washed her hair. She was drying it with a towel when she heard a knock at the door. Startled by an unexpected guest, she buttoned her bodice as she went to the door. Water dripped onto her shoulders. When she opened the door, she found Captain Beck standing there, dressed in his field uniform, dust peppering his face. Herr Captain, she said, pushing the wet hair away from her face. Madame, he said. A colleague and I went fishing today. I have brought you what we caught. Fresh fish? How lovely. I will fry it up for you. For us, madame, you and me and Sophie. Vianne couldn't look away from either Beck or the fish in his hands. She knew without a doubt that Isabel wouldn't accept this gift, just as she knew that her friends and neighbors would claim to turn it down. Food. From the enemy. It was a matter of pride to turn it down. Everyone knew that. I have neither stolen nor demanded it. No Frenchman has more of a right to it than I. There can be no dishonor in your taking it. He was right. This was a fish from local waters. He had not confiscated it. Even as she reached for the fish, she felt the weight of rationalization settle heavily upon her. You rarely do us the honor of eating with us. It is different now, he said. With your sister away. Vianne backed into the house to allow him entry. As always, 
He removed his hat as soon as he stepped inside and clomped across the wooden floor to his room. Vian didn't notice until she heard the click shut of his door that she was still standing there, holding a dead fish wrapped in a recent edition of the Pariser Zeitung, the German newspaper printed in Paris. She returned to the kitchen. When she laid the paper-wrapped fish out on the butcher block, she saw that he'd already cleaned the fish, even going so far as to shave off the scales. She lit the gas stove and put a cast-iron pan over the heat, adding a precious spoonful of oil to the pan. While cubes of potato browned and onion caramelized, she seasoned the fish with salt and pepper and set it aside. In no time, tantalizing aromas filled the house, and Sophie came running into the kitchen, skidding to a stop in the empty space where the breakfast table used to be. Fish, she said with reverence. Vian used her spoon to create a well within the vegetables and put the fish in the middle to fry. Tiny bits of grease popped up, the skin sizzled and turned crisp. At the very end, she placed a few preserved lemons in the pan, watching them melt over everything. Go tell Captain Beck that supper is ready. He is eating with us? Tant Isabel would have something to say about that. Before she left... She told me never to look him in the eye and to try not to be in the same room with him. Vianne sighed. The ghost of her sister lingered. He brought us the fish, Sophie, and he lives here. Oui, maman, I know that still. She said, go call the captain for supper. Isabel is gone, and with her, her extreme worries. Now go. Vianne returned to the stove. Moments later, she carried out a heavy ceramic tray bearing the fried fish surrounded by the pan-roasted vegetables and preserved lemons, all of it enhanced with fresh parsley. The tangy lemony sauce in the bottom of the pan, swimming with crusty brown bits, could have benefited from butter, but still it smelled heavenly. She carried it into the dining room and found Sophie already seated, with Captain Beck beside her. In Antoine's chair... Vianne missed a step. Beck rose politely and moved quickly to pull out her chair. She paused only slightly as he took the platter from her. This looks most becoming, he said in a hearty voice. Once again, his French was not quite right. Vianne sat down and scooted into her place at the table. Before she could think of what to say, Beck was pouring her wine. A lovely 37 Montrachet he said. Vian knew what Isabel would say to that. Beck sat across from her. Sophie sat to her left. She was talking about something that had happened at school today. When she paused, Beck said something about fishing, and Sophie laughed. And Vian felt Isabel's absence as keenly as she'd previously felt her presence. Stay away from Beck. Vian heard the warning as clearly as if it had been spoken aloud beside her. She knew that in this one thing her sister was right. Vian couldn't forget the list, after all, and the firings, or the sight of Beck seated at his desk with crates of food at his feet and a painting of the Fuhrer behind him. My wife quite despaired of my skill with Annette after that, he was saying, smiling. Sophie laughed. My papa fell into the river one time when we were fishing, remember, maman? He said the fish was so big it pulled him in, right, maman? Vianne blinked slowly. It took her a moment to notice that the conversation had circled back to include her. It felt odd, to say the least. In all their past meals with Beck at the table, conversation had been rare who could speak surrounded by Isabel's obvious anger. It is different now, with your sister away. Vianne understood what he meant. The tension in the house, at this table, was gone now. What other changes would her absence bring? Stay away from Beck. How was Vianne to do that? And when was the last time she'd eaten a meal this good? Or heard Sophie laugh?
The Gare de Lyon was full of German soldiers when Isabel disembarked from the train carriage. She wrestled her bicycle out with her. It wasn't easy with her valise banging into her thighs the whole time and impatient Parisians shoving at her. She had dreamed of coming back here for months. In her dreams, Paris was Paris, untouched by the war. But on this Monday afternoon, after a long day's travel, she saw the truth. The occupation might have left the buildings in place, and there was no evidence outside the Gare de Lyon of bombings. But there was a darkness here, even in the full light of day, a hush of loss and despair as she rode her bicycle down the boulevard. Her beloved city was like a once beautiful courtesan, grown old and thin, weary, abandoned by her lovers. In less than a year, this magnificent city had been stripped of its essence by the endless clatter of German jackboots on the streets and disfigured by swastikas that flew from every monument. The only cars she saw were black Mercedes Benzes with miniature swastika flags flapping from prongs on the fenders, and Wehrmacht lorries, and now and then a gray panzer tank. All up and down the boulevard, windows were blacked out and shutters were drawn. At every other corner, it seemed, her way was barricaded. Signs in bold black lettering offered directions in German, and the clocks had been changed to run two hours ahead on German time. She kept her head down as she pedaled past pods of German soldiers and sidewalk cafes hosting uniformed men. As she rounded onto the Boulevard de la Bastille, she saw an old woman on a bicycle trying to bypass a barricade. A Nazi stood in her way, berating her in German, a language she obviously didn't understand. The woman turned her bicycle and pedaled away. It took Isabel longer to reach the bookshop than it should have, and by the time she coasted to a stop out front, her nerves were taut. She leaned her bicycle against a tree and locked it in place. Clutching her valise in sweaty, gloved hands, she approached the bookshop. In a bistro window, she caught sight of herself. Blonde hair hacked unevenly along the bottom, face pale with bright red lips, the only cosmetic she still had. She had worn her best ensemble for traveling, a navy and cream plaid jacket with a matching hat and a navy skirt. Her gloves were a bit the worse for wear, but in these times no one noticed a thing like that. She wanted to look her best to impress her father, grown up. How many times in her life had she agonized over her hair and clothing before coming home to the Paris apartment, only to discover that Papa was gone and Vianne was too busy to return from the country, and that some female friend of her father's would care for Isabel while she was on holiday. Enough so that by the time she was fourteen she'd stopped coming home on holidays at all. It was better to sit alone in her empty dormitory room than be shuffled among people who didn't know what to do with her. This was different, though. Henri and Didier, and their mysterious friends in the Free French, needed Isabel to live in Paris. She would not let them down. The bookshop's display windows were blacked out, and the grates that protected the glass during the day were drawn down and locked in place. She tried the door and found it locked. On a Monday afternoon at four o'clock? She went to the crevice in the store facade that had always been her father's hiding place and found the rusted skeleton key and let herself in. The narrow store seemed to hold its breath in the darkness. Not a sound came at her. Not her father turning the pages of a beloved novel, or the sound of his pen scratching on paper as he struggled with the poetry that had been his passion when Maman was alive. She closed the door behind her and flicked on the light switch by the door. Nothing. She felt her way to the desk and found a candle in an old brass holder. An extended search of the drawers revealed matches, and she lit the candle. The light, meager as it was, revealed destruction in every corner of the shop. Half of the shelves were empty, many of them broken and hanging on slants, the books a fallen pyramid on the floor beneath the low end. Posters had been ripped down and defaced. 
It was as if marauders had gone through on a rampage looking for something hidden and carelessly destroyed everything along the way. Papa! Isabel left the bookshop quickly, not even bothering to replace the key. Instead, she dropped it in her jacket pocket and unlocked her bicycle and climbed aboard. She kept to the smaller streets, the few that weren't barricaded, until she came to Rue de Grenelle. There, she turned and pedaled for home. The apartment on the Avenue de la Bourdonnais had been in her father's family for more than a hundred years. The city street was lined on either side by pale sandstone buildings with black ironwork balconies and slate roofs. Carved stone cherubs decorated the cornices. About six blocks away, the Eiffel Tower rose high into the sky, dominating the view. On the street level were dozens of storefronts with pretty awnings and cafes, with tables set out front. The high floors were all residential. Usually, Isabel walked slowly along the sidewalk, window shopping, appreciating the hustle and bustle around her. Not today. The cafes and bistros were empty. Women in worn clothes and tired expressions stood in queues for food. She stared up at the blacked-out windows as she fished the key from her bag. Opening the door, she pushed her way into the shadowy lobby, hauling her bicycle with her. She locked it to a pipe in the lobby. Ignoring the coffin-sized cage elevator, which no doubt didn't run in these days of limited electricity, she climbed the narrow, steeply-pitched stairs that coiled around the elevator shaft and came to the fifth-floor landing where there were two doors, one on the left side of the building and theirs on the right. She unlocked the door and stepped inside. Behind her, she thought she heard the neighbor's door open. When she turned back to say hello to Madame Leclerc, the door clicked quietly shut. Apparently, the nosy old woman was watching the comings and goings in apartment 6B. She entered her apartment and closed the door behind her. Papa? Even though it was midday, the blacked-out windows made it dark inside. Papa? There was no answer. Truthfully, she was relieved. She carried her valise into the salon. The darkness reminded her of another time long ago. The apartment had been shadowy and musty. There had been breathing then, and footsteps creaking on wooden floors. Hush, oh, Isabelle. No talking. Your maman is with the angels now. She turned on the light switch in the living room. An ornate, blown glass chandelier flickered to life, its sculpted glass branches glittering as if from another world. In the meager light, she looked around the apartment, noticing that several pieces of art were missing from the walls. The room reflected both her mother's unerring sense of style and the collection of antiques from other generations. Two paned windows, covered now, should have revealed a beautiful view of the Eiffel Tower from the balcony. Isabel turned off the light. There was no reason to waste precious electricity while she waited. She sat down at the round wooden table beneath the chandelier, its rough surface scarred by a thousand suppers over the years. Her hand ran lovingly over the banged-up wood. Let me stay, Papa, please. I'll be no trouble. How old had she been at that time? Eleven? Twelve? She wasn't sure. But she'd been dressed in the blue sailor uniform of the convent school. It all felt like a lifetime ago now. And yet here she was again, ready to beg him to... love her. Let her stay. Later. How much longer? She wasn't sure how long she'd sat here in the dark remembering the circumstances of her mother because she had all but forgotten her face in any real way. She heard footsteps and then a key rattling in the lock. She heard the door open and rose to her feet. The door clicked shut. She heard him shuffling through the entry, past the small kitchen. She needed to be strong now, determined, but the courage that was as much a part of her as the green of her eyes had always faded in her father's presence and it retreated now. Papa? She said into the darkness. 
she knew he hated surprises. She heard him go still. Then a light switch clicked and the chandelier came on. Isabel, he said with a sigh. What are you doing here? She knew better than to reveal uncertainty to this man who cared so little for her feelings. She had a job to do now. I have come to live with you in Paris, again, she added as an afterthought. You left Vienne and Sophie alone with the Nazi? They are safer with me gone, believe me. Sooner or later, I would have lost my temper. Lost your temper? What is wrong with you? You will return to Carivo tomorrow morning. He walked past her to the wooden sideboard that was tucked against the papered wall. Pouring himself a glass of brandy, he drank it down in three large gulps and poured another. When he finished the second drink, he turned to her. No, she said. The single word galvanized her. Had she ever said it to him before? She said it again for good measure. No. Pardon? I said no, papa. I will not bend to your will this time. I will not leave. This is my home. My home. Her voice weakened on that. Those are the drapes I watched Mamma make on her sewing machine. This is the table she inherited from her great uncle. On the walls of my bedroom you'll find my initials, drawn in Mamma's lipstick when she wasn't looking. In my secret room, my fort, I bet all my dolls are still lined up along the walls. Isabelle. No. You will not turn me away, Papa. You have done this too many times. You are my father. This is my home. We are at war. I'm staying. She bent down for the valise at her feet and picked it up. In the pale glow of the chandelier, she saw defeat deepen the lines in her father's cheeks. His shoulders slumped. He poured himself another brandy, gulped it greedily. Obviously, he could barely stand to look at her without the aid of alcohol. There are no parties to attend, he said, and all your university boys are gone. This is really what you think of me, she said. Then she changed the subject. I stopped by the bookshop. The Nazis, he said in response. They stormed in one day and pulled out everything by Freud, Mann, Trotsky, Tolstoy, Moroy. All of them they burned, and the music too. I would rather lock the doors than sell only what I am allowed to. So I did just that. So, how are you making a living? Your poetry? He laughed. It was a bitter, slurred sound. This is hardly a time for gentler pursuits. Then how are you paying for electricity and food? Something changed in his face. I've got a good job at the Hotel de Crillon. In service? She could hardly credit him serving beer to German brutes. He glanced away. Isabel got a sick feeling in her stomach. For whom do you work, Papa? The German high command in Paris, he said. Isabel recognized that feeling now. It was shame. After what they did to you in the Great War? Isabel. I remember the stories Mamma told us about how you'd been before the war and how it had broken you. I used to dream that someday you'd remember that you were a father. But all that was a lie, wasn't it? You're just a coward. The minute the Nazis returned, you raced to aid them. How dare you judge me and what I've been through. You're eighteen years old. Nineteen, she said. Tell me, Papa, do you get our conquerors coffee or hail them taxis on their way to Maxime's? Do you eat their lunch leftovers? He seemed to deflate before her eyes. Age. She felt unaccountably regretful for her sharp words, even though they were true and deserved. But she couldn't back down now. So we are agreed? I will move into my old room and live here. We need barely speak if that is your condition. There is no food here in the city, Isabel. Not for us Parisians, anyway. All over town are signs warning us not to eat rats, and these signs are necessary. People are raising guinea pigs for food. 
You will be more comfortable in the country where there are gardens. I am not looking for comfort or safety. What are you looking for in Paris, then? She realized her mistake. She'd set a trap with her foolish words and stepped right into it. Her father was many things. Stupid was not one of them. I'm here to meet a friend. Tell me we are not talking about some boy. Tell me you are smarter than that. The country was dull, Papa. You know me. He sighed, poured another drink from the bottle. She saw the telltale glaze come into his eyes. Soon, she knew, he would stumble away to be alone with whatever it was he thought about. If you stay, there will be rules. Rules? You will be home by curfew. Always and without exception. You will leave me my privacy. I can't stomach being hovered over. You will go to the shops each morning and see what our ration cards will get us. And you will find a job. He paused, looked at her, his eyes narrowed. And if you get yourself in trouble like your sister did, I will throw you out. Period. I am not... I don't care. A job, Isabel. Find one. He was still talking when she turned on her heel and walked away. She went into her old bedroom and shut the door, hard. She had done it. For once, she'd gotten her way. Who cared that he'd been mean and judgmental? She was here, in her bedroom, in Paris, and staying. The room was smaller than she remembered. Painted a cheery white, with a twin iron canopied bed, and a faded old rug on the wooden plank floor, and a Louis Caz armchair that had seen better days. The window, blacked out, overlooked the interior courtyard of the apartment building. As a girl, she'd always known when her neighbors were taking out the trash, because she could hear them clanking out there, slamming down lids. She tossed her valise on the bed and began to unpack. The clothes she'd taken on Exodus and returned to Paris with, were shabbier for the constant wear and hardly worth hanging in the armoire along with the clothes she'd inherited from her maman. Beautiful, vintage flapper dresses with flared skirts, silk-fringed evening gowns, woolen suits that had been cut down to fit her, and crepe day dresses, an array of matching hats, and shoes made for dancing on ballroom floors or walking through the Rodin Gardens, with the right boy on one's arm. Clothes for a world that had vanished. There were no more right boys in Paris. There were practically no boys at all. They were all captive in camps in Germany or hiding out somewhere. When her clothes were returned to hangers in the armoire, she closed the mahogany doors and pushed the armoire sideways just enough to reveal the secret door behind it. Her fort. She bent down and opened the door set into the white paneled wall by pushing on the top right corner. It sprang free, creaked open, revealing a storage room about six feet by six feet, with a roof so slanted that even as a ten-year-old girl, she'd had to hunch over to stand in it. Sure enough, her dolls were still in there, some slumped and others standing tall. Isabel closed the door on her memories and moved the armoire back in place. She undressed quickly and slipped into a pink silk dressing gown that reminded her of her maman. It still smelled vaguely of rose water, or she pretended it did. As she headed out of the room to brush her teeth, she paused at her father's closed door. She could hear him writing, his fountain pen scratched on rough paper. Every now and then he cursed and then fell silent. That was when he was drinking, no doubt. Then came the thunk of a bottle, or a fist, on the table. Isabel readied for bed, setting her hair in curlers and washing her face and brushing her teeth. On her way back to bed, she heard her father curse again, louder this time, maybe drinking, and she ducked into her bedroom and slammed the door behind her. I can't stomach being hovered over. Apparently, what this really meant was that her father couldn't stand to be in the same room with her. 
funny that she hadn't noticed it last year, when she'd lived with him for those weeks between her expulsion from the finishing school and her exile to the country. True, they'd never sat down to a meal together then, or had a conversation meaningful enough to remember. But somehow she hadn't noticed. They'd been together in the bookshop, working side by side. Had she been so pathetically grateful for his presence that his silence escaped her notice? Well, she noticed it now. He pounded on her bedroom door so hard she released a little yelp of surprise. I'm leaving for work, her father said through the door. The ration cards are on the counter. I left you 100 francs. Get what you can. She heard his footsteps echo down the wooden hall, heavy enough to rattle the walls. Then the door slammed shut. Goodbye to you, too, Isabel mumbled stung by the tone of his voice. Then she remembered. Today was the day. She threw the coverlet back and climbed out of bed and dressed without bothering to turn on the light. She had already planned her outfit. A drab gray dress and black beret, white gloves, and her last pair of black slingback pumps. Sadly, she had no stockings. She studied herself in the salon mirror, trying to be critical. But all she saw was an ordinary girl in a dull dress, carrying a black handbag. She opened her handbag, again, and stared down at the silk, hammock-like lined interior. She had slid a tiny opening in the lining and slipped the thick envelope inside of it. Upon opening the handbag, it looked empty. Even if she did get stopped, which she wouldn't, why would she? a 19-year-old girl dressed for lunch? They would see nothing in her handbag except her papers, her ration coupons, and her carte d'identité, certificat de domicile, and her Ausweis. Exactly what should be there. At ten o'clock, she left the apartment. Outside, beneath a bright, hot sun, she climbed aboard her blue bicycle and pedaled toward the quay. When she reached the Rue de Rivoli, black cars and green military lorries with fuel tanks strapped onto their sides and men on horseback filled the street. There were Parisians about, walking on the sidewalks, pedaling down the few streets upon which they were allowed to ride, queuing for food in lines that extended down the block. They were noticeable by the look of defeat on their faces and the way they hurried past the Germans without making eye contact. At Maxime's restaurant, beneath the famous red awning, she saw a cluster of high-ranking Nazis waiting to get inside. The rumor was rampant that all of the country's best meats and produce went straight to Maxime's to be served to the high command. And then she spotted it. The iron bench near the entrance to the Comédie Française. Isabel hit the brakes on her bicycle and came to a bumpy, sudden stop then stepped off the pedal with one foot. Her ankle gave a little twist when she put her weight on it. For the first time, her excitement turned a little sharp with fear. Her handbag felt heavy suddenly, noticeably so. Sweat collected in her palms and along the rim of her felt hat. Snap out of it! She was a courrier, not a frightened schoolgirl. What risk there was, she accepted. While she stood there, a woman approached the bench and sat down with her back to Isabel. A woman. She hadn't expected her contact to be a woman, but that was strangely comforting. She took a deep, calming breath and walked her bicycle across the busy crosswalk and past the kiosks with their scarves and trinkets for sale. When she was directly beside the woman on the bench, she said what she'd been told to say. Do you think I'll need an umbrella today? I expect it to remain sunny. The woman turned. She had dark hair, which she'd coiled away from her face with care, and bold Eastern European features. She was older, maybe thirty, but the look in her eyes was even older. Isabel started to open her handbag when the woman said, No, sharply. Then, follow me, she said, rising quickly. Isabel remained behind the woman, as she made her way across the wide, gravelly expanse 
of the Cour Napoléon, with the mammoth elegance of the Louvre rising majestically around them. Although it didn't feel like a place that had once been a palace of emperors and kings, not with swastika flags everywhere and German soldiers sitting on the benches in the Tuileries Garden. On a side street, the woman ducked into a small café. Isabel locked her bicycle to a tree out front and followed her inside, taking a seat across from her. You have the envelope? Isabel nodded. In her lap, she opened her handbag and withdrew the envelope, which she handed to the woman beneath the table. A pair of German officers walked into the bistro, took a table not far away. The woman leaned over and straightened Isabel's hat. It was a strangely intimate gesture, as if they were sisters or best friends. Leaning close, the woman whispered in her ear, Have you heard of Les Calabos? No. Collaborators, French men and women who are working with the Germans, they are not only in Vichy. Be aware always. These collaborators love to report us to the Gestapo. And once they know your name, the Gestapo are always watching. Trust no one. She nodded. The woman drew back and looked at her. Not even your father. How do you know about my father? We want to meet you. You just have. We she said quietly. Stand at the corner of Boulevard Saint-Germain and Rue de Saint-Simon tomorrow at noon. Do not be late. Do not bring your bicycle, and do not be followed. Isabel was surprised by how quickly the woman got to her feet. In an instant she was gone, and Isabel was at the café table alone, under the watchful eye of the German soldier at the other table. She forced herself to order a café au lait, although she knew there would be no milk and the coffee would be chicory. Finishing it quickly, she exited the café. At the corner, she saw a sign pasted to the window that warned of executions in retaliation for infractions. Beside it, in the cinema window, was a yellow poster that read, Interdit aux Juifs, No Jews Allowed. As she unlocked her bicycle, the German soldier appeared beside her, she bumped into him. He asked solicitously if she was all right. Her answer was an actress's smile and a nod. Mais oui, merci. She smoothed her dress and clamped her purse in her armpit and climbed onto the bicycle. She pedaled away from the soldier without looking back. She had done it. She'd gotten an Ausweiss and come to Paris and forced her papa to let her stay and she had delivered her first secret message for the Free French. Chapter 16 Vianne had to admit that life at Le Jardin was easier without Isabel. No more outbursts, no more veiled comments made just within Captain Beck's earshot, no more pushing Vianne to wage useless battles in a war already lost. Still, Sometimes without Isabel, the house was too quiet, and in the silence, Vianne found herself thinking too loudly. Like now. She'd been awake for hours, just staring at her own bedroom ceiling, waiting for the dawn. Finally, she got out of bed and went downstairs. She poured herself a cup of bitter made from acorns coffee and took it out into the backyard where she sat on the chair that had been Antoine's favorite, beneath the sprawling branches of the yew tree, listening to the chicken scratching lethargically through the dirt. Her money was all but gone. They would now have to live on her meager teaching salary. How was she to do it? And alone. She finished her coffee, as terrible as it was, carrying the empty cup back into the shadowy, already warming house, she saw the door to Captain Beck's bedroom was open. He had left for the day while she was out back. Good. She woke Sophie, listened to the story of her latest dream, and made her a breakfast of dry toast and peach jam. Then the two of them headed for town. Vian rushed Sophie as much as possible, but Sophie was in a foul mood and complained and dragged her feet. Thus, 
It was late afternoon by the time they reached the butcher's shop. There was a queue that snaked out the door and down the street. Vianne took her place at the end and glanced nervously at the Germans in the square. The queue shuffled forward. At the display window, Vian noticed a new propaganda poster that showed a smiling German soldier offering bread to a group of French children. Beside it was a new sign that read, No Jews Allowed. What does that mean, Mamel? Sophie said, pointing to the sign. Hush, Sophie, Vian said sharply. We have talked about this. Some things are no longer spoken of. But Father Joseph says... Hush, Vian said impatiently, giving Sophie's hand a tug for emphasis. The queue moved forward. Vian stepped to the front and found herself staring at a gray-haired woman with skin the color and texture of oatmeal. Vian frowned. Where is Madame Fournier? she asked, offering her ration ticket for today's meat. She hoped there was still some to be had. No Jews allowed, the woman said. We have a little smoked pigeon left. But this is the Fournier shop. Not anymore. It's mine now. You want the pigeon or not? Vian took the small tin of smoked pigeon and dropped it in her willow basket. Saying nothing, she led Sophie outside. On the opposite corner, a German sentry stood guard in front of the bank, reminding the French people that the bank had been seized by the Germans. Maman, Sophie whined. It's wrong to... Hush, Vian grabbed Sophie's hand. As they walked out of town and along the dirt road home, Sophie made her displeasure known. She huffed and sighed and grumbled. Vian ignored her. When they reached the broken gate to Le Jardin, Sophie yanked free and spun to face Vian. How can they just take the butcher's shop? Tant Isabel would do something. You're just afraid. And what should I do? Storm into the square and demand that Madame Fournier get her shop back? And what would they do to me for that? You've seen the posters in town. She lowered her voice. They're executing French people, Sophie. Executing them. But... No buts. These are dangerous times, Sophie. You need to understand that. Sophie's eyes glazed with tears. I wish Papa were here. Vianne pulled her daughter into her arms and held her tightly. Me too. They held each other for a long time and then slowly separated. We are going to make pickles today. How about that? Oh, fun. Vianne couldn't disagree. Why don't you go pick cucumbers? I'll get the vinegar started. Vianne watched her daughter run ahead, dodging through the heavily laden apple trees toward the garden. The moment she disappeared, Vianne's worry returned. What would she do without money? The garden was producing well, so there would be fruit and vegetables. But what about the coming winter? How could Sophie stay healthy without meat or milk or cheese? How would they get new shoes? She was shaking as she made her way into the hot, blacked-out house. In the kitchen, she clutched the counter's edge and bowed her head. Madame? She turned so fast she almost tripped over her own feet. He was in the living room, sitting on the divan, with an oil lamp lit beside him, reading a book. Captain Beck, she said his name quietly. She moved toward him, her shaking hands clasped together. Your motorcycle is not out front. It was such a beautiful day. I decided to walk from town, he rose. She saw that he had recently had a haircut and that he'd nicked himself shaving this morning. A tiny red cut marred his pale cheek. You look upset. Perhaps it is because you have not been sleeping well since your sister left. She looked at him in surprise. I hear you walking around in the dark. You're awake too, she said stupidly. I often cannot sleep either. I think of my wife and children. My son is so young. I wonder if he will know me at all. 
I think the same about Antoine, she said, surprising herself with the admission. She knew she shouldn't be so open with this man, the enemy, but just now she was too tired and scared to be strong. Beck stared down at her, and in his eyes she saw the loss they shared. Both of them were a long way from the people they loved, and lonelier for it. Well, I mean not to intrude on your day, of course, but I have some news for you. With much research, I have discovered that your husband is in an Auflag in Germany. A friend of mine is a guard there. Your husband is an officer. Did you know this? No doubt he was valiant on the battlefield. You found Antoine? He's alive? He held out a crumpled, stained envelope. Here is a letter he has written to you, and now you may send him care packages, which I believe would cheer him most immeasurably. Oh, my! She felt her legs weaken. He grasped her, steadied her, and led her over to the divan. As she slumped to the seat, she felt tears welling in her eyes. Such a kind thing to do, she whispered, taking the letter from him, pressing it to her chest. My friend delivered the letter to me. From now on, my apologies. You will correspond on the postcards only. He smiled at her, and she had the strangest feeling that he knew about the lengthy letter she concocted in her head at night. Merci, she said, wishing it weren't such a small word. Au revoir, madame, he said, then turned on his heel and left her alone. The crumpled, dirty letter shook in her grasp. The letters of her name blurred and danced as she opened it. Vian, my beloved. First, do not worry about me. I am safe and fed well enough. I am unhurt, truly. No bullet holes in me. In the barracks, I have been lucky enough to claim an upper bunk, and it gives me some privacy in a place of too many men. Through a small window, I can see the moon at night and the spires of Nuremberg. But it is the moon that makes me think of you. Our food is enough to sustain us. I have grown used to pellets of flour and small pieces of potato. When I get home, I look forward to your cooking. I dream of it, and you and Sophie, all the time. Please, my beloved, don't fret. Just stay strong and be there for me when the time comes for me to leave this cage. You are my sunlight in the dark and the ground beneath my feet. Because of you I can survive. I hope that you can find strength in me too, V. That because of me, you will find a way to be strong. Hold my daughter tightly tonight and tell her that somewhere far away, her papa is thinking of her. And tell her I will return. I love you, Vianne. Yes. The Red Cross is delivering packages. If you could send me my hunting gloves, I would be very happy. The winters here are cold. Vianne finished the letter and immediately began reading it again. Exactly a week after her arrival in Paris, Isabel was to meet the others who shared her passion for a free France and she was nervous as she walked among the sallow-faced Parisians and well-fed Germans toward an unknown destination. She had dressed carefully this morning in a fitted blue rayon dress with a black belt. She'd set her hair carefully last night and combed it out into precise waves this morning, pinning it back from her face. She wore no makeup. An old convent school blue beret and white gloves completed the outfit. I am an actress, and this is a role, she thought as she walked down the street. I am a schoolgirl in love, sneaking out to meet a boy. That was the story she'd decided on and dressed for. She was sure that, if questioned, she could make a German believe her. With all of the barricaded streets, it took her longer than expected to arrive at her destination. But finally, she ducked around a barricade and moved on to the Boulevard Saint-Germain. She stood beneath a street lamp. Behind her, 
traffic moved slowly up the boulevard. Horns honking, motors grumbling, horse hooves clomping, bicycle bells ringing. Even with all that noise, this once lively street felt stripped of its life and color. A police wagon pulled up alongside of her, and a gendarme stepped out of the vehicle, his cloak folded over his shoulders. He was carrying a white stick. Do you think I'll need an umbrella today? Isabel jumped, made a little sound. She'd been so focused on the policeman, he was crossing the street now, heading toward a woman coming out of a cafe, that she'd forgotten her mission. I, I expect it to remain sunny, she said. The man clutched her upper arm. There was no other word for it, really. He had a tight grip. And led her down the suddenly empty street. It was funny how one police wagon could make Parisians disappear. No one stuck around for an arrest, neither to witness it nor to help. Isabel tried to see the man beside her, but they were moving too fast. She glimpsed his boots, slashing quickly across the sidewalk beneath them. Old leather, torn laces, a hole emerging from scuff marks at the left toe. Close your eyes, he said as they crossed the street. Why? Do it. She was not one to follow orders blindly, a quip she might have made under other circumstances, but she wanted so badly to be a part of this that she did as instructed. She closed her eyes and stumbled along beside him, almost tripping over her own feet more than once. At last they came to a stop. She heard him knock four times on a door. Then there were footsteps, and she heard the whoosh of a door opening and the acrid smell of cigarette smoke wafted across her face. It occurred to her now, just this instant, that she could be in danger. The man pulled her inside, and the door slammed shut behind them. Isabel opened her eyes, even though she had not been told to do so. Best that she show her metal now. The room didn't come into focus instantly. It was dark, the air thick with cigarette smoke. All of the windows were blacked out. The only light came from two oil lamps, sputtering valiantly against the shadows and smoke. Three men sat at a wooden table that bore an overflowing ashtray. Two were young, wearing patched coats and ragged pants. Between them sat a pencil-thin old man with a waxed gray mustache whom she recognized. Standing at the back wall was the woman who had been Isabel's contact, she was dressed all in black, like a widow, and was smoking a cigarette. Monsieur Lavy? she asked the older man. Is that you? He pulled the tattered beret from his shiny, bald head and held it in clasped hands. Isabelle Rosignol. You know this woman? one of the men asked. I was a regular patron of her father's bookshop, Lavy said. Last I heard, she was impulsive, undisciplined, and charming. How many schools expelled you, Isabel? One too many, my father would say. But what good is knowing where to seat an ambassador's second son at a dinner party these days? Isabel said. I am still charming. And still outspoken. A rash head and thoughtless words could get everyone in this room killed, he said carefully. Isabel understood her mistake instantly. She nodded. You are very young, the woman in the back said, exhaling smoke. Not anymore, Isabel said. I dressed to look younger today. I think it is an asset. Who would suspect a 19-year-old girl of anything illegal? And you, of all people, should know that a woman can do anything a man can do. Monsieur Lévy sat back in his chair and studied her. A friend recommends you highly. Henri, he tells us you have been distributing our tracts for months, and Anouk says you were quite steady yesterday. Isabel glanced at the woman, Anouk, who nodded in response. I will do anything to help our cause, Isabel said. Her chest felt tight with anticipation. It had never occurred to her that she could come all this way and be denied entrance to this network of people whose cause was her own. At last, Monsieur Lévy said, You will need false papers, a new identity. We will get that for you, but it will take some time. 
Isabel drew in a sharp breath. She had been accepted. A sense of destiny seemed to fill the room. She would do something that mattered now. She knew it. For now, the Nazis are so arrogant. They do not believe that any kind of resistance can succeed against them, Levy said. But they will see. They will see. And then the danger to all of us will increase. You must tell no one of your association with us, no one. And that includes your family. It is for their safety and your own. It would be easy for Isabel to hide her activities. No one cared particularly where she went or what she did. We, oui, she said. So, what do I do? Anouk pulled away from the wall and crossed the room, stepping over the stack of terrorist papers that were on the floor. Isabel couldn't see the headline clearly. It was something about the RAF bombing of Hamburg and Berlin. She reached into her pocket and pulled out a small package about the size of a deck of cards, wrapped in crinkled, tan-colored paper and tied up with twine. You will deliver this to the tabac in the old quarter in Amboise, the one directly below the chateau. It must arrive no later than tomorrow, 4 p.m. She handed Isabel the package and one half of a torn five-franc note. Offer him the note. If he shows you another half, give him the package. Leave then. Do not look back. Do not speak to him. As she took the package and the note, she heard a sharp, short knock on the door behind her. An instant tension tightened the air in the room. Glances were exchanged. Isabel was reminded keenly that this was dangerous work. It could be a policeman on the other side of the door, or a Nazi. Three knocks followed. Monsieur Levy nodded evenly. The door opened and in walked a fat man with an egg-shaped head and an age-spotted face. I found him wandering around, the old man said as he stepped aside to reveal an RAF pilot still in his flight suit. Mon Dieu, Isabel whispered, Anouk nodded glumly. They are everywhere, Anouk said under her breath, falling from the skies. She smiled tightly at the joke. Evaders escapees from German prisons, downed airmen. Isabel stared at the airmen. Everyone knew the penalty for helping British airmen. It was announced on billboards all over town, imprisonment or death. Get him some clothes, Levy said. The old man turned to the airmen and began speaking. Clearly the airmen didn't speak French. They are going to get you some clothes, Isabel said. The room fell silent. She felt everyone looking at her. You speak English? Anouk said quietly. Passably. Two years in a Swiss finishing school. Another silence fell. Then Levy said, Tell the pilot we will put him in hiding until we can find a way out of France for him. You can do that? Isabel said. Not at present, Anouk said. Don't tell him that, of course. Just tell him we are on his side and he is safe, relatively, and he is to do as he is told. Isabel went to the airman. As she neared him, she saw the scratches on his face and the way something had torn the sleeve of his flight suit. She was pretty sure dried blood darkened his hairline, and she thought, he dropped bombs on Germany. Not all of us are passive, she said to the young man. You speak English, he said. Thank God. My aeroplane crashed four days ago. I've been crouching in dark corners ever since. I didn't know where to go till this man grabbed me and dragged me here. You will help me? She nodded. How? Can you get me back home? I don't have the answers. Just do as they tell you. And monsieur? Yes, ma'am. They are risking their lives to help you. You understand that? He nodded. Isabel turned to face her new colleagues. He understands and will do as you ask. Merci, Isabel, Levy said. Where do we contact you after your return from Amboise? 
The moment she heard the question, Isabel had an answer that surprised her. The bookshop, she said firmly. I'm going to reopen it. Levy gave her a look. What will your father say about that? I thought he closed it when the Nazis told him what to sell. My father works for the Nazis, she said bitterly. His opinions don't account for much. He asked me to get a job. This will be my job. I will be accessible to all of you at any time. It is the perfect solution. It is, Levy said, although it sounded as if he didn't agree. Very well, then. Anouk will bring you new papers as soon as we can get a carte d'identité made. We will need a photograph of you. His gaze narrowed. And Isabel. Allow me to be an old man for a moment and to remind a young girl who is used to being impulsive that there can be none of that anymore. You know I am friends with your father, or I was until he showed his true colors, and I have heard stories about you for years. It is time for you to grow up and do as you are told, always, without exception. It is for your safety as much as ours. It embarrassed Isabel that he felt the need to say this to her, and in front of everyone. Of course. And if you get caught, Anouk said, it will be as a woman, you understand? They have special unpleasantries for us. Isabel swallowed hard. She had thought, briefly, of imprisonment and execution. This was something she had never even considered. Of course she should have. What we all demand of each other, or hope for at any rate, is two days. Two days? If you are captured and questioned, try to say nothing for two days. That gives us time to disappear. Two days, Isabel said. That's not so long. You are so young, Anouk said, frowning. In the past six days, Isabel had left Paris four times. She delivered packages in Amboise, Blois, and Lyon. She'd spent more time in train stations than in her father's apartment, an arrangement that suited them both. As long as she stood in food queues during the day and returned home before the curfew, her father didn't care what she did. Now, though, she was back in Paris and ready to move forward, with the next phase of her plan. You are not reopening the bookshop. Isabel stared at her father. He stood near the blacked-out window. In the pale light, the apartment looked shabbily grand, decorated as it was with ornate antiques collected over the generations. Good paintings in heavy gilt frames graced the walls. Some were missing, and black shadows hung on the wall in their place. Probably Papa had sold them. And if the blackout shades could be lifted, a breathtaking view of the Eiffel Tower lay just beyond their balcony. You told me to get a job, she said stubbornly. The paper-wrapped package in her handbag gave her a new strength with her father. Besides, he was already half drunk. In no time, he'd be sprawled in the bergere in the salon, whimpering in his sleep. When she was a girl... Those sad sounds he made in his sleep had made her long to comfort him. No more. I meant a paid job, he said dryly. He poured himself another snifter of brandy. Why don't you just use a soup bowl, she said. He ignored that. I won't have it, that's all. You will not open the bookshop. I have already done it, today. I was there cleaning all afternoon. He seemed to go still, his bushy gray eyebrows raised into his lined brow. You cleaned? I cleaned, she said. I know it surprises you, Papa, but I am not twelve years old. She moved toward him. I am doing this, Papa. I have decided. It will allow me time to queue up for food and a chance to make some small bit of money. The Germans will buy books from me. I promise you that. You'll flirt with them, he said. She felt the sting of his judgment. 
says the man who works for them? He stared at her. She stared at him. Fine, he said at last. You'll do what you will. But the storeroom in back, that's mine. Mine, Isabel. I will lock it up and take the key, and you will respect my wishes by staying out of that room. Why? It doesn't matter why. Do you have assignations with women there? On the sofa? He shook his head. You are a foolish girl. Thank God your maman did not live to see who you have become. Isabel hated how deeply that hurt her. Or you, papa, she said. Or you. Chapter 17 In mid-June of 1941, on the second to the last school day of the term, Vianne was at the blackboard, conjugating a verb, when she heard the now familiar putt-putt-putt of a German motorcycle. Soldiers again, Gilles Fournier said bitterly. The boy was always angry lately, and who could blame him? The Nazis had seized his family's butcher shop and given it to a collaborator. Stay here, she said to her students, and went out into the hallway. In walked two men, a Gestapo officer in a long black coat, and the local gendarme, Paul, who had gained weight since his collaboration with the Nazis. His stomach strained at his belt. How many times had she seen him strolling down Rue Victor Hugo, carrying more food than his family could eat, while she stood in a lengthy queue, clutching a ration card that would provide too little? Vianne moved toward them, her hands clasped tightly at her waist. She felt self-conscious in her threadbare dress, with its frayed collar and cuffs, and although she had carefully drawn a brown seam line up the back of her bare calves, it was obvious that it was a ruse. She had no stockings on, and that made her feel strangely vulnerable to these men. On either side of the hallway, classroom doors opened, and teachers stepped out to see what the officers wanted. They made eye contact with one another, but no one spoke. The Gestapo agent walked determinedly toward Monsieur Paretsky's classroom at the end of the building. Fat Paul struggled to keep up, huffing along behind him. Moments later, Monsieur Paretsky was dragged out of his classroom by the French policeman. Vianne frowned as they passed her. Old man Paretsky, who had taught her sums a lifetime ago and whose wife tended to the school's flowers, gave her a terrified look. Paul? Vianne said sharply. What is happening? The policeman stopped. He is accused of something. I did nothing wrong, Paretsky cried, trying to pull free of Paul's grasp. The Gestapo agent noticed the commotion and perked up. He came at Vianne fast, heels clicking on the floor. She felt a shiver of fear at the glint in his eyes. Madam, what is your reason for stopping us? He he's a friend of mine. Really? He said, drawing length from the word, making it a question. So you know that he is distributing anti-German propaganda? It's a newspaper, Paretsky said. I'm just telling the French people the truth. Vianne, tell them. Vianne felt attention turn to her. Your name? The Gestapo demanded, opening a notebook and taking out a pencil. She wet her lips nervously. Vianne Moriac. He wrote it down. And you work with Monsieur Poretsky distributing flyers? No, she cried out. He is a teaching colleague, sir. I know nothing about anything else. The Gestapo closed the notebook. Has no one told you that it is best to ask no questions? I didn't mean to, she said, her throat dry. He gave a slow smile. It frightened her, disarmed her, that smile. Enough so that it took her a minute to register his next words. You are terminated, madame. Her heart seemed to stop. E Excuse me? I speak of your employment as a teacher. You are terminated. 
Go home, madame, and do not return. These students do not need an example such as you. At the end of the day, Vianne walked home with her daughter and even remembered now and then to answer one of Sophie's non-stop questions, but all the while she was thinking, What now? What now? The stalls and shops were closed this time of day, their bins and cases empty. There were signs everywhere saying, No eggs, no butter, no oil, no lemons, no shoes, no thread, no paper bags. She had been frugal with the money Antoine left for her. More than frugal, miserly, even though it had seemed like so much money in the beginning. She had used it for necessities only, wood, electricity, gas, food. But still it was gone. How would she and Sophie survive without her salary from teaching? At home, she moved in a daze. She made a pot of cabbage soup and loaded it up with shredded carrots that were soft as noodles. As soon as the meal was finished, she did laundry, and when it was hanging out on the line, she darned socks until night fell. Too early, she shuffled a whiny, complaining Sophie off to bed. Alone, and feeling it like a knife pressed to her throat, she sat down at the dining table with an official postcard and a fountain pen. Dearest Antoine, we are out of money, and I have lost my job. What am I to do? Winter is only months away. She lifted the pen from the paper. The blue word seemed to expand against the white paper. Out of money. What kind of woman was she to even think of sending a letter like this to her prisoner of war husband? She balled up the postcard and threw it into the cold, soot-caked fireplace where it lay all alone, a white ball on a bed of gray ash. No, it couldn't be in the house. What if Sophie found it, read it? She retrieved it from the ashes and carried it out to the backyard where she threw it into the pergola. The chickens would trample and peck it to death. Outside, she sat down in Antoine's favorite chair, feeling dazed by the suddenness of her changed circumstances and this new and terrible fear. If only she could do it all over again. She'd spend even less money. She'd go without more. She'd let them take Monsieur Peretsky without a word. Behind her, the door creaked open and clicked shut. Footsteps, breathing. She should get up and leave, but she was too tired to move. Beck came up behind her. Would you care for a glass of wine? It's a Chateau Margaux, 28. A very good year, apparently. Wine. She wanted to say yes. Please. Perhaps she'd never needed a glass more. But she couldn't do it. Neither could she say no, so she said nothing. She heard the thunk of a cork being freed and then the gurgle of wine being poured. He set a full glass on the table beside her. The sweet, rich scent was intoxicating. He poured himself a glass and sat down in the chair beside her. I am leaving, he said after a long silence. She turned to him. Do not look so eager. It is only for a while, a few weeks. I have not been home in two years, he took a drink. My wife may be sitting in our garden right now, pondering who will return to her. I am not the man who left, alas. I have seen things, he paused. This war, it is not as I expected. And things change in an absence this long, do you not agree? We, oui, she said. She had often thought the same thing. In the silence between them, she heard a frog croak and the leaves fluttering in a jasmine-scented breeze above their heads. A nightingale sang a sad and lonely song. You do not seem yourself, madame, he said. If you do not mind me saying so. I was fired from my teaching position today. It was the first time she'd said the words aloud, 
and they caused hot tears to glaze her eyes. I drew attention to myself. A dangerous thing to do. The money my husband left is gone. I am unemployed, and winter will soon be upon us. How am I to survive, to feed Sophie and keep her warm? She turned to look at him. Their gazes came together. She wanted to look away, but couldn't. He placed the wine glass in her hand, forced her fingers to coil around it. His touch felt hot against her cold hands, made her shiver. She remembered his office suddenly, and all that food stacked within it. It is just fine, he said again. And the scent of it, the black cherries and dark rich earth, and a hint of lavender wafted up to her nose, reminding her of the life she'd had before, the nights she and Antoine had sat out here drinking wine. She took a sip and gasped. She'd forgotten this simple pleasure. You are beautiful, madame, he said, his voice as sweet and rich as the wine. Perhaps it has been too long since you heard that. Vianne got to her feet so fast, she knocked into the table and spilled the wine. You should not say such things, Herr Captain. No, he said, rising to his feet. He stood in front of her, his breath scented by red wine and spearmint gum. I should not. Please, she said, unable to even finish the sentence. Your daughter will not starve this winter, madame, he said. Softly, as if it were their secret accord. That is one thing you can be sure of. God help Vianne, it relieved her. She mumbled something, she wasn't even sure what, and went back into the house, where she climbed into bed with Sophie, but it was a long time before she slept. The bookshop had once been a gathering place for poets and writers and novelists and academics. Isabel's best childhood memories took place in these musty rooms. While Papa had worked in the back room on his printing press, Maman had read Isabel's stories and fables and made up plays for them to act out. They had been happy here for a time, before Maman took sick and Papa started drinking. There's my ease. Come sit on Papa's lap while I write your Maman a poem. Or maybe she had imagined that memory, constructed it from the threads of her own need, and wrapped it tightly around her shoulders. She didn't know any more. Now it was Germans who crowded into the shadowy nooks and crannies. In the six weeks since Isabel had reopened the shop, word had apparently spread among the soldiers that a pretty French girl could be found often at the shop's counter. They arrived in a stream, dressed in their spotless uniforms, their voices loud as they jostled one another. Isabel flirted with them mercilessly, but made sure never to leave the shop until it was empty. And she always left by the back door, wearing a charcoal cloak with the hood drawn up, even in the heat of summer. The soldiers might be jovial and smiling, boys, really, who talked of pretty fraulines back home and bought French classics by acceptable authors for their families, but she never forgot that they were the enemy. Mademoiselle, you are so beautiful, and you are ignoring us. How will we survive? A young German officer reached for her. She laughed prettily and pirouetted out of his reach. Now, monsieur, you know I can show no favorites. She sidled into place behind the sales counter. I see you are holding a book of poetry. Certainly you have a girl back home who would love to receive such a thoughtful gift from you. His friends shoved him forward, all of them talking at once. Isabel was taking his money when the bell above the front door tinkled gaily. Isabel looked up, expecting to see more German soldiers, but it was Anouk. She was dressed as usual, more for her temperament than the season, in all black. A fitted v-neck black sweater and straight skirt with a black beret and gloves. A Galois cigarette hung from her bright red lips, unlit. She paused in the open doorway, with a rectangle of the empty alley behind her, a flash of red geraniums and greenery. 
At the bell, the Germans turned. Anouk let the door shut behind her. She casually lit her cigarette and inhaled deeply. With half of the store length between them and three German soldiers milling about, Isabel's gaze caught Anouk's. In the weeks that Isabel had been a courier, she'd gone to Blois, Lyon, and Marseille, to Amboise and Nice, not to mention at least a dozen drops in Paris recently, all under her new name, Juliette Gervaise. Using false papers that Anouk had slipped her one day in a bistro, right under the Germans' noses, Anouk had been her most frequent contact, and even with their age difference, which had to be at least a decade, maybe more, they had become friends in the way of women who live parallel lives, wordlessly, but no less real for its silence. Isabel had learned to see past Anouk's dour expression and flat mouth, to ignore her taciturn demeanor. Behind all that, Isabel thought there was sadness, a lot of it, and anger. Anouk walked forward with a regal, disdainful air that cut a man down to size before he even spoke. The Germans fell silent, watching her, moving sideways to let her pass. Isabel heard one of them say, Manish, and another, Widow. Anouk seemed not to notice them at all. At the counter, she stopped and took a long drag on her cigarette. The smoke blurred her face, and for a moment, only her cherry red lips were noticeable. She reached down for her handbag and withdrew a small brown book. The author's name, Baudelaire, was etched into the leather, and although the surface was so scratched and worn and discolored, the title was impossible to read. Isabel knew the volume, Les Fleurs du Mal, The Flowers of Evil. It was the book they used to signal a meeting. I am looking for something else by this author, Anouk said, exhaling smoke. I am sorry, madame, I have no more Baudelaire, some Verlaine, perhaps, or Rimbaud. Nothing, then. Anouk turned and left the bookshop. It wasn't until the bell tinkled that her spell broke and the soldiers began speaking again. When no one was looking, Isabel palmed the small volume of poetry. Inside of it was a message for her to deliver, along with the time it was to be delivered. The place was as usual, the bench in front of the Comédie Française. The message was hidden beneath the end papers, which had been lifted and re-glued dozens of times. Isabel watched the clock, willing the time to advance. She had her next assignment. At precisely 6 p.m., she herded the soldiers out of the bookshop and closed up for the night. Outside, she found the chef and owner of the bistro next door, Monsieur Depard, smoking a cigarette. The poor man looked as tired as she felt. She wondered sometimes, when she saw him sweating over the fryer or shucking oysters, how he felt about feeding Germans. Bonsoir, monsieur, she said. Bonsoir, mademoiselle. Long day, she commiserated. Oui. She handed him a small used copy of Fables for his children. For Jacques and Gigi, she said with a smile. One moment. He rushed into the cafe and returned with a small, grease-stained sack. Frit, he said. Isabel was absurdly grateful. These days she not only ate the enemy's leftovers, she was thankful for them. Merci. Leaving her bicycle in the shop, she decided to ignore the crowded, depressingly silent metro and walk home, enjoying the greasy, salty frites on her way. Everywhere she looked, Germans were pouring into cafes and bistros and restaurants while the ashen-faced Parisians hurried to be home before curfew. Twice along the way, she had a niggling sense that she was being followed, but when she turned, there was no one behind her. She wasn't sure what brought her to a halt on the corner near the park, but all at once, she knew that something was wrong. Out of place, in front of her, the street was full of Nazi vehicles honking at one another. Somewhere someone screamed. Isabel felt the hairs on the back of her neck raise. She glanced back quickly, but no one was behind her. 
Lately, she often felt as if she were being followed. It was her nerves working overtime. The golden dome of the Avalide shone in the fading rays of the sun. Her heart started pounding. Fear made her perspire. The musky, sour scent of it mingled with the greasy odor of frit, and for a moment her stomach tilted uncomfortably. Everything was fine. No one was following her. She was being foolish. She turned onto Rue de Grenelle. Something caught her eye, made her stop. Up ahead, she saw a shadow where there shouldn't be a shadow. Movement where it should be still. Frowning, she crossed the street, picking her way through the slow-moving traffic. On the other side, she moved briskly past the clot of Germans drinking wine in the bistro toward an apartment building on the next corner. There, hidden in the dense shrubbery beside an ornate set of glossy black doors, she saw a man crouch down behind a tree in a huge copper urn. She opened the gate and stepped into the yard. She heard the man scramble backward, his boots crunching on the stones beneath him. Then he stilled. Isabel could hear the Germans laughing at the cafe down the street, yelling out, Sieg, s'il vous plaît, to the poor, overworked waitress. It was the supper hour, the one hour of the day, when all the enemy cared about was entertainment and stuffing their stomachs with food and wine that belonged to the French. She crept over to the potted lemon tree. The man was squatted down, trying to make himself as small as possible. Dirt smeared his face, and one eye was swollen shut, but there was no mistaking him for a Frenchman. He was wearing a British flight suit. Mon Dieu, she muttered. Anglais? He said nothing. R A F? she asked in English. His eyes widened. She could see him trying to decide whether to trust her. Very slowly, he nodded. How long have you been hiding here? After a long moment, he said, All day. You'll get caught, she said. Sooner or later. Isabel knew she needed to question him further, but there wasn't time. Every second she stood here with him, the danger to both of them increased. It was amazing that the Brit hadn't been caught already. She needed to either help him or walk away before attention was drawn. Certainly walking away was the smart move. Fifty-seven Avenue de la Bordonnée, she said quietly in English. That's where I am going. In one hour, I will go out for a cigarette. You come to the door then. If you arrive without being seen, I will help you. You understand me? How do I know I can trust you? She laughed at that. This is a foolish thing I am doing. And I promised not to be so impetuous. Ah, well. She pivoted on her heel and left the garden area, clanging the gate shut behind her. She hurried down the street. All the way home, her heart was pounding, and she second-guessed her decision. But there was nothing to do about it now. She didn't look back, not even at her apartment building. There, she stopped and faced the big brass knob in the center of the oak door. She felt dizzy and headachy. she was so scared. She fumbled with the key in the lock and twisted the knob and surged into the dark, shadowy interior. Inside, the narrow lobby was crowded with bicycles and handcarts. She made her way to the base of the narrow, winding stairway and sat on the bottom step, waiting. She looked at her wristwatch a thousand times, and each time she told herself not to do this. But at the appointed time, she went back outside. Night had fallen. With the blackout shades and unlit street lamps, the street was as dark as a cave. Cars rumbled past, unseen without their headlamps on, heard and smelled, but invisible unless an errant bit of moonlight caught them. She lit her brown cigarette, took a deep drag, and exhaled slowly, trying to calm herself. I'm here, miss. Isabel stumbled backward and opened the door. Stay behind me, eyes down, not too close. 
She led him through the lobby, both of them banging into bicycles, clanging them and rattling wooden carts. She had never run up the five flights of stairs faster. She pulled him into her apartment and slammed the door shut behind him. Take off your clothes, she said. Pardon me? She flicked on the light switch. He towered over her, she saw that now. He was broad-shouldered and skinny at the same time, narrow-faced, with a nose that looked like it had been broken a time or two. His hair was so short it looked like fuzz. Your flight suit, take it off, quickly. What had she been thinking to do this? Her father would come home and find the airmen and then turn them both into the Germans. Where would she hide his flight suit? And those boots were a dead giveaway. He bent forward and stepped out of his flight suit. She had never seen a grown man in his undershorts and T-shirt before. She felt her face flush. No need to blush, miss, he said, grinning as if this were ordinary. She yanked his suit into her arms and held out her hand for his identification tags. He handed them over, two small discs worn around his neck. Both contained the same information. Lieutenant Torrance McLeish. His blood group and religion and number. Follow me, quietly. What's the word? On the edges of your toes. Tiptoes, he whispered. She led him to her bedroom. There, slowly, gently, she pushed the armoire out of the way and revealed the secret room. A row of glassy doll eyes stared back at her. That's creepy, miss, he said, and it's a small space for a big man. Get in, stay quiet. Any untoward sound could get us searched. Madame Leclerc next door is curious and could be a collaborator, do you understand? Also, my father will be home soon. He works for the German High Command. Blimey. She had no idea what that meant, and she was sweating so profusely her clothes were starting to stick to her chest. What had she been thinking to offer this man help? What if I have to, you know, he asked. Hold it. She pushed him into the room, giving him a pillow and blanket from her bed. I'll come back when I can. Quiet, we? Oui? He nodded. Thank you. She couldn't help shaking her head. I am a fool. A fool? She shut the door on him and shoved the armoire back into place. Not quite where it went, but good enough for now. She had to get rid of his flight suit and tags before her father came home. She moved through the apartment on bare feet as quietly as possible. She had no idea if the people downstairs would notice the sound of the armoire being moved or too many people moving about up here. Better safe than sorry. She jammed the flight suit in an old Samaritan department store bag and crushed it to her chest. Leaving the apartment felt dangerous suddenly. So did staying. She crept past the Leclerc apartment and then rushed down the stairs. Outside, she drew in a gulping breath. Now what? She couldn't throw this just anywhere. She didn't want someone else to get in trouble. For the first time, she was grateful for the city's blackout conditions. She slipped into the darkness on the sidewalk and all but disappeared. There were few Parisians out this close to curfew, and the Germans were too busy drinking French wine to glance outside. She drew in a deep breath, trying to calm down, to think. She was probably moments away from curfew, although that was hardly her biggest problem. Papa would be home soon. The river. She was only a few blocks away, and there were trees along the quay. She found a smaller, barricaded side street and made her way to the river, past the row of military lorries parked along the street. She had never moved so slowly in her life. One step, one breath, at a time. The last fifty feet between her and the banks of the Seine seemed to grow and expand with each step she took, and then again as she descended the stairs to the water. But at last she was there, 
standing beside the river. She heard boat lines creaking in the darkness, waves slapping their wooden hulls. Once again, she thought she heard footsteps behind her. When she stilled, so did they. She waited for someone to come up behind her, for a voice demanding her papers. Nothing. She was imagining it. One minute passed, then another. She threw the bag into the black water and then hurled the identification tags in after it. The dark, swirling water swallowed the evidence instantly. Still, she felt shaky as she climbed the steps and crossed the street and headed for home. At her apartment door, she paused, finger-combing her sweat-dampened hair and pulling the damp cotton blouse from her breasts. The one light was on, the chandelier. Her father sat hunched over the dining room table with paperwork spread out before him. He appeared haggard and too thin. She wondered suddenly how much he had been eating lately. In the weeks she'd been home, she had not once seen him have a meal. They ate, like they did everything else, separately. She had assumed that he ate German scraps at the high command. Now she wondered. You're late, he said harshly. She noticed the brandy bottle on the table. It was half empty. Yesterday, it had been full. How was it that he always found his brandy? The Germans wouldn't leave. She moved toward the table and put several franc notes down. Today was a good day. I see your friends at the high command have given you more brandy. The Nazis do not give much away, he said. Indeed. So you have earned it. A noise sounded, something crashing to the hardwood floor, maybe. What was that? Her father said, looking up. Then came another sound, like a scraping of wood on wood. Someone is in this apartment, Papa said. Don't be absurd, Papa. He rose quickly from the table and left the room. Isabel rushed after him. Papa! Hush! He hissed. He moved down the entryway, into the unlit part of the apartment. At the Bombay chest near the front door, he picked up a candle in a brass holder and lit it. Surely you don't think someone has broken in, she said. He threw her a harsh, narrow-eyed look. I will not ask you to be silent again. Now hold your tongue. His breath smelled of brandy and cigarettes. But why? Shut up. He turned his back on her and moved down the narrow, slanted floor hallway toward the bedrooms. He passed the minuscule coat closet, nothing but coats inside, and followed the candle's quavering path into Vianne's old room. It was empty but for the bed and nightstand and writing desk, Nothing was out of place in here. He got slowly to his knees and looked under the bed. Satisfied at last that the room was empty, he headed for Isabel's room. Could he hear the pounding of her heart? He checked her room. Under the bed. Behind the door. Behind the floor-to-ceiling damask curtains that framed the blacked-out courtyard window. Isabel forced herself not to stare at the armoire, See, she said loudly, hoping the airman would hear voices and sit still. No one is here, really, Papa. Working for the enemy is making you paranoid. He turned to her. In the corona of candlelight, his face looked haggard and worn. It wouldn't hurt you to be afraid, you know. Was that a threat? Of you, Papa, or of the Nazis? Are you paying no attention at all, Isabel? You should be afraid of everyone. Now, get out of my way. I need a drink. Chapter 18 Isabel lay in bed, listening. When she was sure her father was asleep, a drunken sleep, no doubt, she left her bed went in search of her grandmère's porcelain chamber pot and holding it, stood in front of the armoire. Slowly, a half inch at a time, she moved it away from the wall, just enough to open the hidden door. 
Inside, it was dark and quiet. Only when she listened intently did she hear him breathing. Monsieur, she whispered. Hello, miss, came at her from the dark. She lit the oil lamp by her bed and carried it into the space. He was sitting against the wall, with his legs stretched out. In the candlelight, he seemed softer somehow, younger. She handed him the chamber pot and saw that color rose on his cheeks as he took it from her. Thank you. She sat down opposite him. I got rid of your identification tags and flight suit. Your boots will have to be cut down for you to wear. Here is a knife. Tomorrow morning, I will get you some of my father's clothes. I don't imagine they'll fit well. He nodded, saying, And what is your plan? That made her smile nervously. I'm not sure. You are a pilot? Lieutenant Torrance McLeish, RAF. My aeroplane went down over Reims. And you've been on your own since then? In your flight suit? Fortunately, my brother and I played hide-and-seek a lot when we were lads. You're not safe here. I gathered. He smiled, and it changed his face, reminded her that he was really just a young man far from home. If it makes you feel better, I took three German aeroplanes down with me. You need to get back to Britain so you can get back to it. I can't agree more, but how? The whole coastline is behind barbed wire and patrolled by dogs. I can't exactly leave France by boat or air. I have some friends who are working on this. We will go see them tomorrow. You are very brave, he said softly. Or oh, foolish, she said, unsure of which was more true. I have often heard I'm impetuous and unruly. I imagine I will hear it from my friends tomorrow. Well, miss, you won't hear anything but brave from me. The next morning, Isabel heard her father walk past her room. Moments later, she smelled coffee wafting her way, and then, after that, the front door clicked shut. She left her room and went into her father's, which was a mess of clothes on the floor and an unmade bed, with an empty brandy bottle lying on its side on his writing desk. She pulled the blackout shade and peered past the empty balcony to the street below, where she saw her father emerge out onto the sidewalk. He had his black briefcase held close to his chest, as if his poetry actually mattered to anyone, and a black hat pulled low on his brow. Hunched like an overworked secretary, he headed for the metro. When he passed out of her view, she went to the armoire in his room and rummaged through it for old clothes. A shapeless turtleneck sweater with fraying sleeves, old corduroy pants, patched in the seat and bereft of several buttons, and a gray beret. Isabel cautiously moved the armoire and opened the door. The secret room smelled of sweat and piss, so much that she had to clamp her hand over her nose and mouth as she gagged. Sorry, miss, McLeish said sheepishly. Put these on, wash up there at the pitcher, and meet me in the salon. Put the armoire back. Move quietly. People are downstairs. They may know my father is gone and expect only one person to be walking around up here. Moments later, he stepped into the kitchen, dressed in her father's cast-offs. He looked like a fairy tale boy who'd sprouted overnight. The sweater strained across his broad chest, and the corduroy pants were too small to button at the waist. He was wearing the beret flat on the crown of his head, as if it were a yarmulke. This would never work. How would she get him across town in broad daylight? I can do this, he said. I'll follow along behind you. Trust me, miss. I've been walking about in a flight suit. This is easy. It was too late to back out now. She'd taken him in and hidden him. Now she needed to get him someplace safe. Walk at least a block behind me. If I stop, you stop. If I get pinched, you keep walking. Don't even look back. Pinched must mean arrested. 
She went to him, adjusted his beret, set it at a jaunty angle. Her gaze held his. Where are you from, Lieutenant McLeish? Ipswich, miss. You'll tell my parents, if necessary. It won't be necessary, Lieutenant. She drew in a deep breath. He had reminded her again of the risk that she'd undertaken to help him. The false papers in her handbag, identifying her as Juliette Gervais of Nice, baptized in Marseille, and a student at the Sorbonne, were the only protection she had if the worst happened. She went to the front door, opened it, and peered out. The landing was empty. She shoved him out, saying, Go! Stand outside by the milliner's empty shop, then follow me. He stumbled out of the apartment, and she closed the door behind him. One, two, three. She counted silently, imagining trouble with every step. When she could stand it no more, she left the apartment and went down the stairs. All was quiet. She found him outside, standing where he'd been told to. She lifted her chin and walked past him without a glance. All the way to the Saint-Germain, she walked briskly, never turning around, never looking back. Several times she heard German soldiers yell out, Halt! and blow their whistles. Twice she heard gunshots, but she neither slowed nor looked. By the time she reached the red door at the apartment on Rue de Saint-Simon, she was sweating and a little lightheaded. She knocked four times in rapid succession. The door opened. Anouk appeared in the slit of an opening. Surprise widened her eyes. She opened the door and stepped back. What are you doing here? Behind her, several of the men Isabel had met before were seated around tables, with maps set out in front of them, the pale blue lines illuminated by candlelight. Anouk started to shut the door. Isabel said, Leave it open. Tension followed her directive. She saw it sweep the room, change the expressions around her. At the table, Monsieur Lévy began putting the maps away. Isabel glanced outside and saw McLeish coming up the walkway. He stepped into the apartment and she slammed the door shut behind him. No one spoke. Isabel had their full attention. This is Lieutenant Torrance McLeish of the RAF, pilot. I found him hiding in the bushes near my apartment last night. And you brought him here, Anouk said, lighting a cigarette. He needs to get back to Britain, Isabel said. I thought, no, Anouk said. You did not. Lévy sat back in his chair and pulled a galois from his breast pocket and lit it up, studying the airmen. There are others that we know of in the city, and more who escaped from German prisons. We want to get them out, but the coasts and the airfields are sewn up tight. He took a long drag on his cigarette. The tip glowed and crackled and blackened. It is a problem we have been working on. I know, Isabel said evenly. She felt the full weight of her responsibility. Had she acted rashly again? Were they disappointed in her? She didn't know. Should she have ignored McLeish? She was about to ask a question when she heard someone talking in another room. Frowning, she said. Who else is here? Others, Levy answered. Others are always here. No one of concern to you. We need a plan for the airmen, it is true, Anouk said. We believe we could get them out of Spain, Levy said, if we could get them into Spain. The Pyrenees, Anouk said. Isabel had seen the Pyrenees, so she understood Anouk's comment. The jagged peaks rose impossibly high into the clouds and were usually snow-covered or ringed in fog. Her mother had loved Biarritz, a small coastal town nearby, and twice, in the good days long ago, the family had vacationed there. The border with Spain is guarded by both German and Spanish patrols, Anouk said. The whole border? Isabel asked. Well, no, of course not. But where they are and where they aren't, who knows, Levy said. 
The mountains are smaller near Saint Jean de Luz, Isabel pointed out. We,、oui, but so what? They are still impassable, and the few roads are guarded, Anouk said. My maman's best friend was a Basque, whose father was a goat herder. He crossed the mountains on foot all the time. We have had this idea. We even tried it once, Levy said. None of the party was heard from again. Getting past the German sentries at Saint Jean de Luz is hard enough for one man, let alone several. And then there is the actual crossing of the mountains on foot. It is nearly impossible. Nearly impossible and impossible are not the same thing. If goat herders can cross the mountains, certainly airmen can do it. Isabel said. As she said it, an idea came to her, and a woman could move easily across the checkpoints, especially a young woman. No one would suspect a pretty girl. Anouk and Levy exchanged a look. I will do it, Isabel said, or try it anyway. I'll take this airman. And are there others? Monsieur Levy frowned. Obviously, this turn of events surprised him. Cigarette smoke clouded blue-gray between them. And you have climbed mountains before. I'm in good shape, was her answer. If they catch you, they'll imprison you, or kill you, he said quietly. Put your impetuousness aside for a moment and think on that, Isabel. This is not handing over a piece of paper. You have seen the signs posted all over town. The rewards offered for people who aid the enemy. Isabel nodded earnestly. Anouk sighed heavily, stabbing out her cigarette in the overflowing ashtray. She gazed at Isabel a long time, eyes narrowing. Then she walked to the door behind the table. She pushed the door open a little and whistled, gave a trilling little bird call. Isabel frowned. She heard something in the other room: a chair pushing back from a table, footsteps. Gaetan stepped into the room. He was dressed shabbily, in corduroy pants that were patched at the knees and ragged at the hem and a little too short, in a sweater that hung on his wiry frame, its collar pulled out of shape. His black hair, longer now, in need of cutting, had been slicked back from his face. Which was sharper, almost wolf-like. He looked at her as if they were the only two in the room. In an instant, it was all undone. The feelings she discounted, tried to bury, to ignore, came flooding back. One look at him, and she could barely breathe. You know, Gate, Anouk said. Isabel cleared her throat. She understood. That he'd known she was here all along, that he'd chosen to stay away from her, for the first time since she joined this underground group, Isabel felt keenly young, apart. Had they all known about it? Had they laughed about her naivete behind her back? I do. So, Levy said after an uncomfortable pause. Isabel has a plan. Gaetan didn't smile. Does she? She wants to lead this airman and others across the Pyrenees on foot and get them into Spain, to the British consulate, I assume. Gaetan swore under his breath. We need to try something, Levy said. Do you truly understand the risk, Isabel? Anouk asked, coming forward. If you succeed, the Nazis will hear of it. They will hunt you down. There is a ten thousand franc reward for anyone who leads the Nazis to someone aiding airmen. Isabel had always simply reacted in her life. Someone left her behind; she followed. Someone told her she couldn't do something; she did it. Every barrier she turned into a gate. But this, she let fear give her a little shake, and she almost gave in to it. Then she thought about the swastikas that flew from the Eiffel Tower. And Vianne living with the enemy, and Antoine lost in some prisoner of war camp, and Edith Cavell. Certainly, she had been afraid sometimes too. Isabel would not let fear stand in her way. 
the airmen were needed in Britain to drop more bombs on Germany. Isabel turned to the airman. Are you a fit man, Lieutenant? she said in English. Could you keep up with a girl on a mountain crossing? I could, he said, especially one as pretty as you, miss. I wouldn't let you out of my sight. Isabel faced her compatriots. I'll take him to the consulate in San Sebastian. From there, it will be up to the Brits to get him home. Isabel saw the conversation that passed in silence around her, concerns and questions unvoiced. A decision reached in silence. Some risks simply had to be taken. Everyone in this room knew it. It will take weeks to plan. Maybe longer, Levy said. He turned to Gaetan. We will need money immediately. You will speak to your contact? Gaetan nodded. He grabbed a black beret from the sideboard, putting it on. Isabel couldn't look away. She was angry at him. She knew that, felt it. But as he came toward her, that anger dried up and blew away like dust, beneath the longing that mattered so much more. Their gazes met, held, and then he was past her, reaching for the doorknob, going outside. The door clicked shut behind him. So, Anouk said, the planning, we should begin. For six hours, Isabel sat at the table in the apartment on Rue de Saint-Simon. They brought in others from the network and gave them tasks. To gather clothes for the pilots and stockpile supplies, they consulted maps and devised routes and began the long, uncertain process of setting up safe houses along the way. At some point, they began to see it as a reality instead of merely a bold and daring idea. It wasn't until Monsieur Lévy mentioned the curfew that Isabel pushed back from the table. They tried to talk her into staying the night, but such a choice would make her father suspicious. Instead, she borrowed a heavy black peacoat from Anouk and put it on, grateful for the way it camouflaged her. The Boulevard Saint-Germain was eerily quiet, shutters closed tightly and blacked out, street lamps dark. She kept close to the buildings, grateful that the worn-down heels of her white Oxfords didn't clatter on the sidewalk. She crept past barricades and around groups of German soldiers patrolling the streets. She was almost home when she heard an engine growling. A German lorry shambled up the street behind her, its blue painted headlights turned off. She pressed flat against the rough stone wall behind her, and the phantom lorry rolled past, grumbling in the darkness. Then everything was silent again. A bird whistled, a trilling song, familiar. Isabel knew then that she'd been waiting for him, hoping. She straightened slowly, rose to her feet. Beside her, a potted plant released the scent of flowers. Isabel, Gaetan said. She could barely make out his features in the dark, but she could smell the pomade in his hair and the rough scent of his laundry soap, and the cigarette he'd smoked some time ago. How did you know I was working with Paul? Who do you think recommended you? She frowned. Henri. And who told Henri about you? I had Didier following you from the beginning, watching over you. I knew you would find your way to us. He reached out, tucked the hair behind her ears, and the intimacy of the act left her parched with hope. She remembered saying, I love you, and shame and loss twisted her up inside. She didn't want to remember how he'd made her feel, how he'd fed her roasted rabbit by hand and carried her when she was too tired to walk and showed her how much one kiss could matter. I'm sorry I hurt you, he said. Why did you? It doesn't matter now he sighed. I should have stayed in that back room today. It's better not seeing you. Not for me. He smiled. You have a habit of saying whatever is on your mind, don't you, Isabel? Always. Why did you leave me? He touched her face with a gentleness that made her want to cry. It felt like a goodbye, that touch, and she knew goodbye. 
I wanted to forget you. She wanted to say something more, maybe, kiss me, or don't go, or say I matter to you. But it was already too late. The moment, whatever it was, was past. He was stepping away from her, disappearing into the shadows. He said softly, Be careful, Is. And before she could answer, she knew he was gone. She felt his absence in her bones. She waited a moment more, for her heartbeat to slow down and her emotions to stabilize. Then she headed for home. She had barely released the lock on her front door when she felt herself being yanked inside. The door slammed shut behind her. Where in the hell have you been? Her father's alcoholic breath washed over her, its sweetness a cloak over something dark, bitter, as if he'd been chewing aspirin. She tried to pull free, but he held her so close it was almost an embrace, his grasp on her wrist tight enough to leave a bruise. Then, as quickly as he'd grasped her, he let her go. She stumbled back, flailing for the light switch. When she flipped it, nothing happened. No more money for electricity, her father said. He lit an oil lamp, held it between them. In the wavering light, he looked to be sculpted of melting wax. His lined face sagged. His eyelids were puffy and a little blue. His paddle nose showed black pores the size of pinheads. Even with all of that, with as tired and old as he suddenly seemed, it was the look in his eyes that made her frown. Something was wrong. Come with me, he said, his voice raspy and sharp, unrecognizable this time of night without a slur. He led her down past the closet and around the corner to her room. Inside, he turned to look at her. Behind him, in the lamp's glow, she saw the moved armoire and the door to the secret room ajar. The smell of urine was strong. Thank God the airman was gone. Isabel shook her head, unable to speak. He sank to sit on the edge of her bed, bowing his head. Christ, Isabel, you are a pain in the ass. She couldn't move or think. She glanced at the bedroom door, wondering if she could make it out of the apartment. It, it was nothing, Papa. A boy. We, a date. We were kissing, Papa. And do all of your dates piss in the closet? You must be very popular then. He sighed. Enough of this charade. Charade? You found an airman last night and hid him in the closet, and today you took him to Monsieur Lavy. Isabel could not have heard correctly. Pardon? Your downed airman, the one who pissed in the closet and left dirty boot prints in the hallway. You took him to Monsieur Lavy. I do not know what you are talking about. Good for you, Isabel. When he fell silent, she couldn't stand the suspense. Papa? I know you came here as a courier for the underground, and that you are working with Paul Lévy's network. Ha! How? Monsieur Lévy is an old friend. In fact, when the Nazis invaded, he came to me and pulled me out of the bottle of brandy. That was all I cared about. He put me to work. Isabel felt so unsteady, she couldn't stand. It was too intimate to sit by her father, so she sank slowly to the carpet. I didn't want you involved in this, Isabel. That's why I sent you from Paris in the first place. I didn't want to put you at risk with my work. I should have known you'd find your own way to danger. And all the other times you sent me away? She wished instantly that she hadn't asked the question. But the moment she had the thought, it was given voice. I am no good as a father. We both know that. At least not since your maman's death. How would we know? You never tried. I tried. You just don't remember. Anyway, that is all water gone by now. We have bigger concerns. We, oui, she said. Her past felt upended somehow off balance. She didn't know what to think or feel. Better to change the subject than to dwell on it. I am, 
planning something. I will be gone for a while. He looked down at her. I know. I have spoken to Paul. He was silent for a long moment. You know that your life changes right now. You will have to live underground, not here with me, not with anyone. You will not be able to spend more than a few nights in any one place. You will trust absolutely no one. And you will not be Isabelle Rossignol at all anymore. You will be Juliette Gervais. The Nazis and the collaborators will always be searching for you. And if they find you... Isabel nodded. A look passed between them. In it, Isabel felt a connection that had never existed before. You know that prisoners of war receive some mercy. You can expect none. She nodded. Can you do this, Isabel? I can do it, Papa. He nodded. The name you are looking for is Micheline Babineau, your maman's friend in Oronia. Her husband was killed in the Great War. I think she would welcome you. And tell Paul I will need photographs immediately. Photographs? Of the airmen. At her continued silence, he finally smiled. Really, Isabelle? Have you not put the pieces together? But... I forge papers, Isabel. That's why I work at the High Command. I began by writing the very tracks you distributed in Gariveau. But it turns out that the poet has a forger's hand. Who do you think gave you the name Juliette Gervais? But, but... You believed I collaborated with the enemy. I can hardly blame you. In him, suddenly... She saw someone foreign, a broken man where a cruel, careless man had always stood. She dared to rise up, to move toward him, to kneel in front of him. She stared up at him, feeling hot tears glaze her eyes. Why did you push me and Vian away? I hope you never know how fragile you are, Isabel. I'm not fragile, she said. The smile he gave her was barely one at all. We are all fragile, Isabel. It's the thing we learn in war. Chapter 19 Warning All males who come to the aid, either directly or indirectly, of the crews of enemy aircraft coming down in parachutes or having made a forced landing, help in their escape, hide them, or come to their aid in any fashion, will be shot on the spot. Women who render the same help will be sent to concentration camps in Germany. I guess I am lucky to be a woman, Isabel muttered to herself. How was it that the Germans hadn't noticed by now, October 1941, that France had become a country of women? Even as she said the words, she recognized the false bravado in them. She wanted to feel brave right now, Edith Cavill risking her life, but here, in this train station patrolled by German soldiers, she was scared. There was no backing out now, no changing her mind. After months of planning and preparation, she and four airmen were ready to test the escape plan. On this cool October morning, her life would change. From the moment she boarded this train bound for Saint-Jean-de-Luz, 
she would no longer be Isabelle Rossignol, the girl in the bookshop who lived on the Avenue de la Bourdonnais. From now on, she was Juliette Gervais, codename The Nightingale. Come, Anouk linked arms with Isabelle and led her away from the warning sign and toward the ticket counter. They had gone over these preparations so many times, Isabel knew the plan well. There was only one flaw. All of their attempts to reach Madame Babineau had thus far failed. That one key component, finding a guide, Isabel would have to do on her own. Off to her left, waiting for her signal, Lieutenant McLeish stood dressed as a peasant. All he'd kept from his escape kit were two benzedrine tablets and a tiny compass that looked like a button and was pinned to his collar. He had been given false papers. Now he was a Flemish farm worker. He had an identity card and a work permit, but her father couldn't guarantee that the papers would pass close inspection. He had cut off the tops of his flight boots and shaved off his mustache. Isabel and Anouk had spent countless hours training him in proper behavior. They'd dressed him in a baggy coat and a worn, stained pair of work trousers. They'd bleached the nicotine stains from the first and second fingers of his right hand and taught him to smoke like a Frenchman, using his thumb and forefinger. He knew he was to look left before crossing the street, not right, and he was never to approach Isabel unless she approached him first. She had instructed him to play deaf and dumb and to read a newspaper while on the train the entire trip. He was also to buy his own ticket and sit apart from Isabel. They all were. When they disembarked in Saint-Jean-de-Luz, the airmen were to walk a good distance behind her. Anouk turned to Isabel. Are you ready? Her gaze asked. She nodded slowly. Cousin Etienne will board the train in Poitiers, Uncle Émile in Ruffec, and Jean-Claude in Bordeaux. The other airmen. Oui. Isabel was to disembark at Saint-Jean-de-Luz with the four airmen, two Brits and two Canadians, and cross the mountains into Spain. Once there, she was to send a telegram. The nightingale has sung, meant success. She kissed each of Anouk's cheeks, murmured au revoir, and then walked briskly over to the ticket window. Saint-Jean-de-Luz, she said, and handed the attendant her money. Taking the ticket, she headed for Platform C. Not once did she look back, although she wanted to. The train whistle sounded. Isabel stepped aboard, taking a seat on the left side. More passengers filed in, took seats. Several German soldiers boarded the train, sitting across from her. McLeish was the last to board. He stepped into the train and shuffled past her without a glance, his shoulders hunched in an effort to appear smaller. As the doors eased shut, he settled into a seat at the other end of the compartment and immediately opened his newspaper. The train whistle blew again, and the giant wheels began to turn, picking up speed slowly. The compartment banged a little, heaved left and right, and then settled into a steady thrumming movement, the wheels clackety-clacking on the iron tracks. The German soldier across from Isabel glanced down the compartment. His gaze settled on McLeish. He tapped his friend on the shoulder, and both men started to rise. Isabel leaned forward. Bonjour, she said with a smile. The soldiers immediately sat back down. Bonjour, mademoiselle, they said in unison. Your French is quite good, she lied. Beside her, a heavy-set woman in peasant clothes made a harumphing sound of disgust and whispered, You should be ashamed of yourself, in French. Isabel laughed prettily. Where are you going? She asked the soldiers. They would be on this carriage for hours. It would be good to keep their attention on her. Tour, one said as the other said, on Zan. Ah, and do you know any card games to pass the time? I have a deck with me. Yes, yes, the younger one said. Isabel reached in her handbag for her playing cards. She was dealing a new hand and laughing when the next airman boarded the train and shuffled past the Germans. Later, when the conductor came through, she offered up her ticket. 
He took it and moved on. When he came to the airman, MacLeish did exactly as instructed. He handed over his ticket while he kept reading. The other airman did the same. Isabel released her breath in a sigh of relief and leaned back in her seat. Isabel and the four airmen made it to saint jean de luz without incident. Twice they'd walked, separately of course, past German checkpoints. The soldiers on guard had barely looked at the series of false papers, saying, Dankeschön, without even looking up. They were not on the lookout for downed airmen and apparently hadn't considered a plan as bold as this. But now Isabel and the men were approaching the mountains. In the foothills, she went to a small park along the river and sat on a bench overlooking the water. The airmen arrived as planned, one by one, with MacLeish first. He sat down beside her. The others took seats within earshot. You have your signs? she asked. MacLeish withdrew a piece of paper from his shirt pocket. It read, Deaf and dumb, waiting for my maman to pick me up. The other airmen did the same. If a German soldier hassles any of you, you show him your papers and your sign. Do not speak. And I act stupid, which is easy for me, MacLeish grinned. Isabel was too anxious to smile. She shrugged off her canvas rucksack and handed it to MacLeish. In it were a few essentials, a bottle of wine, three plump pork sausages, two pairs of heavy woolen socks, and several apples. Sit where you can in Irogne, not together, of course. Keep your heads down and pretend to read your books. Don't look up until you hear me say, There you are, cousin. We've been looking all over for you. Understood? They all nodded. If I am not back by dawn, travel separately to Po and go to the hotel I told you about. A woman named Eliane will help you. Be careful, MacLeish said. Taking a deep breath, she left them and walked to the main road. A mile or so later, as night began to fall, she crossed a rickety bridge. The road turned to dirt and narrowed into a cart track that climbed up, up, up into the verdant foothills. Moonlight came to her aid, illuminating hundreds of tiny white specks, goats, there were no cottages up this high, just animal sheds. At last, she saw it. A two-storied, half-timbered house with a red roof that was exactly as her father had described. No wonder they had not been able to reach Madame Babineau. This cottage seemed designed to keep people away, as did the path up to it. Goats bleated at her appearance and bumped into one another nervously. Light shone through the haphazardly blacked-out windows, and smoke puffed cheerily from the chimney, scenting the air. At her knock, the heavy wooden door opened just enough to reveal a single eye and a mouth nearly hidden by a gray beard. Bonsoir, Isabel said. She waited a moment for the old man to reply in kind, but he said nothing. I am here to see Madame Babineau. Why? the man demanded. Julian Rossignol sent me. The old man made a clicking sound between his teeth and tongue. Then the door opened. The first thing Isabel noticed inside was the stew, simmering in a big black pot that hung from a hook in the giant stone-faced fireplace. A woman was seated at a huge scarred trestle table in the back of the wide, timber-beamed room, from where Isabel stood, it looked as if she were dressed in charcoal-colored rags. But when the old man lit an oil lamp, Isabel saw that the woman was dressed like a man, in rough breeches and a linen shirt with a leather lace-up neckline. Her hair was the color of iron shavings, and she was smoking a cigarette. Still, Isabel recognized the woman, even though it had been fifteen years she remembered sitting on the beach at Saint-Jean-de-Luz, hearing the women laugh, and Madame Babineau saying, This little beauty will cause you endless trouble, Madeleine. The boys will someday swarm her. 
and Maman saying, She is too smart to toss her life to boys, aren't you, my Isabelle? Your shoes are caked with dirt. I've walked here from the train station at Saint-Jean-de-Luz. Interesting. The woman used her booted foot to push out the chair across from her. I am Micheline Babineau. Sit. I know who you are, Isabel said. She added nothing. Information was dangerous these days. It was traded with care. Do you? I'm Juliette Gervais. Why do I care? Isabel glanced nervously at the old man who watched her warily. She didn't like turning her back on him, but she had no choice. She sat down across from the woman. You want a cigarette? It's a galloise bleu. They cost me three francs and a goat, but it's worth it. The woman took a long, sensual drag off her cigarette and exhaled the distinctively scented blue smoke. Why do I care about you? Julien Rosignol believes I can trust you. Madame Babineau took another drag on the cigarette and then stubbed it out on the sole of her boot. She dropped the rest of it in her breast pocket. He says his wife was close friends with you. You are godmother to his eldest daughter. He is the godfather to your youngest son. Was. The Germans killed both of my sons at the front and my husband in the last war. He wrote letters to you recently. The post is shit these days. What does he want? Here it was, the biggest flaw in this plan. If Madame Babineau was a collaborator, it was all over. Isabel had imagined this moment a thousand times, planned it down to the pauses. She'd thought of ways to word things to protect herself. Now she saw the folly of all that, the uselessness. She simply had to dive in. I left four downed pilots in Irogne waiting for me. I want to take them to the British consulate in Spain. We hope the British can get them back to England so they can fly more missions over Germany and drop more bombs. In the silence that followed, Isabel heard the beat of her heart, the tick of the mantel clock, the distant bleating of a goat. And, Madame Babineau said at last, almost too softly to hear, and... I need a Basque guide to help me cross the Pyrenees. Julian thought you could help me. For the first time, Isabel knew she had the woman's undivided attention. Get Eduardo, Madame Babineau said to the old man, who jumped to do her bidding. The door banged shut so hard the ceiling rattled. The woman retrieved the half-smoked cigarette from her pocket and lit it up inhaling and exhaling several times in silence as she studied Isabel. What do you... Isabel started to ask. The woman pressed a tobacco-stained finger to her lips. The door to the farmhouse crashed open and a man burst in. All Isabel could make out were broad shoulders, burlap, and the smell of alcohol. He grabbed her by the arm and lifted her out of the chair and threw her up against the rough-hewn wall. She gasped in pain and tried to get free, but he pinned her in place, wedged his knee roughly between her legs. Do you know what the Germans do to people like you? He whispered, his face so close to her she couldn't focus, couldn't see anything but black eyes and thick black lashes. He smelled of cigarettes and brandy. Do you know how much they will pay us for you and your pilots? Isabel turned her head to avoid his sour breath. Where are these pilots of yours? His fingers dug into the flesh of her upper arms. Where are they? What pilots? She gasped. The pilots you are helping escape. What pilots? I don't know what you're talking about. He growled again and cracked her head against the wall. You asked for our help to get pilots over the Pyrenees. Me? A woman? Climb across the Pyrenees? You must be joking. I don't know what you're talking about. Are you saying Madame Babineau is lying? I don't know Madame Babineau. I just stopped here to ask for directions. I'm lost. He smiled, revealing tobacco and wine-stained teeth. Clever girl, he said, letting her go. And not a bit weak in the knees. Madame Babineau stood. Good for her. 
The man stepped back, giving her space. I am Eduardo, he turned to the old woman. The weather is good. Her will is strong. The men may sleep here tonight. Unless they are weaklings, I will take them tomorrow. You'll take us, Isabel said, to Spain? Eduardo looked to Madame Babineau, who looked at Isabel. It would be our great pleasure to help you, Juliet. Now, where are these pilots of yours? In the middle of the night, Madame Babineau woke Isabel and led her into the farmhouse's kitchen, where a fire was already blazing in the hearth. Coffee? Isabel finger-combed her hair and tied a cotton scarf around her head. No, merci. It is too precious. The old woman gave her a smile. No one suspects a woman my age of anything. It makes me good at trading. Here. She offered Isabel a cracked porcelain mug full of steaming black coffee. Real coffee. Isabel wrapped her hands around the mug and breathed deeply of the familiar, never again to be taken for granted aroma. Madame Babineau sat down beside her. She looked into the woman's dark eyes and saw a compassion that reminded her of her maman. I am scared, Isabel admitted. It was the first time she'd said this to anyone. As you should be, as we all must be. If something goes wrong, will you get word to Julien? He's still in Paris. If we don't make it, tell him the nightingale didn't fly. Madame Babineau nodded. As they sat there, the airmen came into the room one by one. It was the middle of the night, and none looked like they had slept well. Still, the hour appointed for their departure was here. Madame Babineau set out a meal of bread and sweet lavender honey and creamy goat cheese. The men planted themselves on the mismatched chairs and scooted close to the table, talking all at once, devouring the food in an instant. The door banged open, bringing with it a rush of cold night air. Dried leaves scudded inside, dancing across the floor, plastering themselves like tiny black hands to the stones of the fireplace. The flames within shivered and thinned. The door slammed shut. Eduardo stood there, looking like a scruffy giant in the low-ceilinged room. He was a typical Basque with broad shoulders and a face that seemed to have been carved in stone with a dull blade. The coat he wore was thin for the weather and patched in more places than it was whole. He handed Isabel a pair of Basque shoes called espadrilles, with rope soles that were supposedly good in the rough terrain. How is the weather for this journey, Eduardo? Madame Babineau asked. Cold is coming. We must not tarry. He swung a ragged rucksack from his shoulder and dropped it on the ground. To the men, he said, These are espadrilles. They will help you. Find a pair that fits. Isabel stood beside him, translating for the men. The men came forward obediently and squatted around the rucksack, pulling out shoes, passing them around. None fit me, McLeish said. Do what you can, Madame Babineau said. Sadly, we aren't a shoe shop. When the men had exchanged their flight boots for walking shoes, Eduardo had them stand in a line. He studied each man in turn, checking his clothing and his small pack. Take everything out of your pockets and leave it here. The Spanish will arrest you for anything, and you do not want to escape the Germans only to find yourself in a Spanish prison. He handed them each a goatskin boda bag full of wine and a walking stick that he'd made from knobby, mossy branches. When he was finished, he slapped them on the back hard enough to send most of them stumbling forward. Silence, Eduardo said. Always. They left the cottage and filed onto the uneven terrain of the goat pasture outside. The sky was lit by a weak blue moon. Night is our protection, Eduardo said. Night and speed and quiet. He turned, stopped them with a raised hand. Juliet will be at the back of the line. I will be at the front. When I walk, you walk. You walk in single file. There is no talking, none. You will be cold, freezing cold on this night. 
and hungry and soon you will be tired. Keep walking. Eduardo turned his back on the men and began walking up the hill. Isabel felt the cold instantly. It bit into her exposed cheeks and slipped through the seams of her woolen coat. She used her gloved hand to hold the pieces of her collar together and began the long trek up the grassy hillside. Sometime around three in the morning, the walk became a hike. The terrain steepened. The moon slid behind invisible clouds and blinked out, leaving them in near total darkness. Isabel heard the men's breathing become labored in front of her. She knew they were cold. Most of them did not have adequate clothing for this freezing air, and few of them had shoes that fit correctly. Twigs snapped beneath their feet. Rocks clattered away from them, made a sound like rain on a tin roof as they fell down the steep mountainside. The first pangs of hunger twisted her empty stomach. It started to rain. A gnashing wind swept up from the valley below, slamming into the party walking single file. It turned the rain into freezing shards that attacked their exposed skin. Isabel began to shiver uncontrollably. Her breath came out in great, heaving gasps. And still she climbed. Up, 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 past the tree line. Ahead, someone made a yelping sound and fell hard. Isabel couldn't see who it was. The night had closed around them. The man in front of her stopped. She ran into his back and he stumbled sideways, fell into a boulder and cursed. Don't stop, men, Isabel said, trying to keep the spirit in her voice. They climbed until Isabel gasped with every step, but Eduardo allowed them no respite. He stopped only long enough to make sure they were still behind him, and then he was off again, clambering up the rocky hillside like a goat. Isabel's legs were on fire, aching painfully, and even with her espadrilles, blisters formed. Every step became an agony and a test of will. Hours and hours and hours passed. Isabel grew so breathless, she couldn't have formed the words needed to beg for a drink of water. But she knew that Eduardo wouldn't have listened to her anyway. She heard MacLeish in front of her, gasping, cursing every time he slipped, crying out in pain at the blisters she knew were turning his feet into open sores. She couldn't make out the path at all anymore. She just trudged upward, her eyelids struggling to stay open. Angling forward against the wind, she pulled her scarf up over her nose and mouth and kept going. Her breath, coming in pants, warmed her scarf. The fabric turned moist and then froze into solid, icy folds. Here, Eduardo's booming voice came at her from the darkness. They were so high up the mountain that there were sure to be no German or Spanish patrols. The risk to their lives up here came from the elements. Isabel collapsed in a heap, landing hard enough on a piece of rock that she cried out, but she was too tired to care. MacLeish dropped down beside her, gasping. Christ almighty! and pitching forward. She grabbed his arm, steadied him as he started to slide downward. She heard a cacophony of voices come after it. Thank God! Bloody well time! And then she heard bodies hit the ground. They fell downward in a group, as if their legs could hold them no more. Not here, Eduardo said. The goat herder's shack, over there. Isabel staggered to her feet. In the back of the line, she waited, shivering, her arms crossed around her body as if she could hold heat within, but there was no heat. She felt like a shard of ice, brittle and frozen. Her mind fought the stupor that wanted to take over. She had to keep shaking her head to keep her thoughts clear. She heard a footstep and knew Eduardo was standing beside her in the darkness, their faces pelted by icy rain. Are you all right? he asked. I'm frozen solid, and I'm afraid to look at my feet. Blisters? The size of dinner plates, I'm pretty sure. I can't tell if the rain is making my shoes wet or if blood is bubbling through the material. She felt tears sting her eyes and freeze instantly, 
binding her lashes together. Eduardo took her hand and led her to the goat herder's shed, where he started a fire. The ice in her hair turned to water and dripped to the floor, puddling at her feet. She watched the men collapse where they stood, thumping back against the rough wooden walls as they pulled their rucksacks into their laps and began searching through them for food. McLeish waved her over. Isabel picked her way through the men and collapsed beside McLeish. In silence, listening to men chewing and belching and sighing around her, she ate the cheese and apples she'd brought with her. She had no idea when she fell asleep. One minute she was awake, eating what passed for supper on the mountain, and the next thing she knew, Eduardo was waking them again. Gray light pressed against the dirty window of the shack. They'd slept through the day and been wakened in the late afternoon. Eduardo started a fire, made a pot of Ersatz coffee, and handed it out to them. Breakfast was stale bread and hard cheese. Good, but not nearly enough to stave off the hunger that was still sharp from yesterday. Eduardo took off at a brisk walk, climbing the slick, frost-covered shale of the treacherous trail like a billy goat. Isabel was the last one out of the shack. She looked up the trail. Gray clouds obscured the peaks, and snowflakes hushed the world until there was no earthly sound except their breathing. Men vanished in front of her, becoming small black dots in the whiteness. She plunged into the cold, climbing steadily, following the man in front of her. He was all she could see in the falling snow. Eduardo's pace was punishing. He climbed up the twisting path without pause, seemingly unaware of the biting, burning cold that turned every breath into a fire that exploded in the lungs. Isabel panted and kept going, encouraging the men when they started to lag, cajoling them and teasing them and urging them on. When darkness fell again, she redoubled her efforts to keep morale up. Even though she felt sick to her stomach with fatigue and parched with thirst, she kept going. If any one of them got more than a few feet away from the person in front of him, he could be lost forever in this frozen darkness. To leave the path for a few feet was to die. She stumbled on through the night. Someone fell in front of her, made a yelping sound. She rushed forward, found one of the Canadian flyers on his knees, wheezing hard, his mustache frozen. I'm beat, baby doll, he said, trying to smile. Isabel slid down beside him, felt her backside instantly grow cold. It's Teddy, right? You got me. Look, I'm done for. Just go on ahead. You've got a wife, Teddy? A girl back home in Canada? She couldn't see his face, but she heard the way he sucked in his breath at her question. You aren't playing fair, doll. There's no fair in life and death, Teddy. What's her name? Alice. Get on your feet for Alice, Teddy. She felt him shift his weight, get his feet back underneath him. She angled her body against him, let him lean against her as he stood. All right, then, he said, shuddering hard. She let him go, heard him walk on ahead. She sighed heavily, shivering at the end of it. Hunger gnawed at her stomach. She swallowed dryly, wishing they could stop just for a minute. Instead, she pointed herself in the direction of the men and kept going. Her mind was muddling again, her thoughts blurring. All she could think of was taking this step, and the next one, and the next one. Sometime near dawn, the snow turned to rain, that turned their woolen coats into sodden weights. Isabel hardly noticed when they started going down. The only real difference was the men falling, slipping on the wet rocks and tumbling down the rocky, treacherous mountainside. There was no way to stop them. She just had to watch them fall and help them get back on their feet when they came to a breathless, broken stop. The visibility was so bad that they were constantly in fear of losing sight of the man in front and plunging off the path. At daybreak, Eduardo stopped and pointed to a yawning black cave tucked into the mountainside. The men gathered inside, 
making huffing sounds as they sat and stretched out their legs. Isabel heard them opening their packs, burrowing through for the last bits of their food. Somewhere deep inside, an animal scurried around, its claws scratching lightly on the hard-packed dirt floor. Isabel followed the men inside. Roots hung down from the dripping stone and mud interior. Eduardo knelt down and made a small fire, using the moss he'd picked that morning. Eat and sleep, he said when the flames danced up. Tomorrow we make the final trek. He reached for his goatskin boda, drank deeply, and then left the cave. The damp wood crackled and popped, sounding like gunfire in the cave. But Isabel and the men were too exhausted to even flinch. Isabel sat down beside McLeish and leaned tiredly against him. You're a wonder, he said in a hushed voice. I've been told I don't make smart decisions. This may be proof of that. She shivered. Whether from cold or exhaustion, she didn't know. Dumb but brave, he said with a smile. Isabel was grateful for the conversation. That's me. I don't think I've thanked you properly for saving me. I don't think I've saved you yet, Torrance. Call me Tori, he said. All my mates do. He said something else, about a girl waiting for him in Ipswich, maybe, but she was too tired to hear what it was. When she wakened, it was raining. Bollocks, one of the men said. It's pissing out there. Eduardo stood outside the cave, his strong legs braced widely apart, his face and hair pelted by rain that he seemed not to notice at all. Behind him, there was darkness. The airmen opened their rucksacks. No one had to be told to eat anymore. They knew the routine. When you were allowed to stop, you drank, you ate, you slept, and in that order. When you were awakened, you ate and drank and got to your feet, no matter how much it hurt to do so. As they stood... A groan moved from man to man, a few cursed. It was a rainy, moonless night, utterly dark. They had made it over the mountain, almost 1,000 meters high, where they crossed the previous night, and were halfway down the other side. But the weather was worsening. As Isabel left the cave, wet branches smacked her in the face. She pushed them away with a gloved hand and kept going, her walking stick thumped with each step. Rain made the shale as slick as ice and ran in rivulets alongside them. She heard the men grunting in front of her. She trudged forward on blistered, aching feet. The pace set by Eduardo was gruelingly hard. Nothing stopped or slowed the man, and the airmen struggled to keep up. Look, she heard someone say. In the distance, far away, lights twinkled. A spiderweb pattern of white dots spanned the darkness. Spain, Eduardo said. The sight rejuvenated the group. They continued, their walking sticks thumping, their feet landing solidly as the ground gradually leveled out. How many hours passed this way? Five? Six? She didn't know. Enough that her legs began to ache, and the small of her back was a pit of pain. She was constantly spitting rain and wiping it out of her eyes, and the emptiness in her stomach was a rabid animal. A pale sheen of daylight began to appear at the horizon. A blade of lavender light, then pink, then yellow, as she zigzagged down the trail. Her feet hurt so much she gritted her teeth to keep from crying out in pain. By the fourth nightfall, Isabel had lost all sense of time and place. She had no idea where they were or how much longer this agony would go on. Her thoughts became a simple plea, tumbling through her mind, keeping pace with her aching steps. The consulate, the consulate, the consulate. Stop, Eduardo said, holding up his hand. Isabel stumbled into McLeish. His cheeks were bright red with cold, and his lips were chapped and his breathing ragged. Not far away, past a blurry green hillside, she saw a patrol of soldiers in light green uniforms. Her first thought was, We are in Spain. 
and then Eduardo shoved them both behind a stand of trees. They hid for a long time, and then set off again. Hours later, she heard a roar of rushing water. As they neared the river, the sound obliterated everything else. Finally, Eduardo stopped and gathered the men close together. He was standing in a pool of mud, his espadrilles disappearing into the muck. Behind him were gray granite cliffs, upon which spindly trees grew in defiance of the laws of gravity. Bushes sprouted like cattle catchers around formidable gray rocks. We hide here until nightfall, Eduardo said. Over that ridge is the Bidasoa River. On the other bank is Spain. We are close, but close is nothing. Between the river and your freedom are patrols with dogs. These patrols will shoot at anything they see moving. Do not move. Isabel watched Eduardo walk away from the group. When he was gone, she and the men hunkered down behind giant boulders and inside the lee of fallen trees. For hours, the rain beat down on them, turned the mud beneath them into a marsh. She shivered and drew her knees into her chest and closed her eyes. Impossibly, she fell into a deep, exhausted sleep that was over much too quickly. At midnight, Eduardo wakened her. The first thing Isabel noticed when she opened her eyes was that the rain had stopped. The sky overhead was studded with stars. She climbed tiredly to her feet and immediately winced in pain. She could only imagine how much the airman's feet hurt. She was lucky enough to have shoes that fit. Under cover of night, they set off again, the sound of their footsteps swallowed by the roar of the river. And then they were there, standing amid the trees at the edge of a giant gorge. Far below, the water crashed and roiled and roared, splashing up along the rock sides. Eduardo gathered them close. We can't swim across. The rains have made the river a beast that will swallow us all. Follow me. They walked along the river for a mile or two, and then Eduardo stopped again. She heard a creaking sound, like a boat line stretched by rising seas, and an occasional clatter. At first, there was nothing to see. Then the bright white searchlights on the other side flashed across the white-tipped, rushing river, and shone on a rickety suspension bridge that linked this side of the gorge to the opposite shore. There was a Spanish checkpoint not far away, with guards patrolling back and forth. Holy mother of God, one of the airmen said. Fuck me, said another. Isabel joined the men in a crouch behind some bushes, where they waited, watching the searchlights crisscross the river. It was after two in the morning when Eduardo finally nodded. There was no movement on the other side of the gorge at all. If their luck held, or if they had any at all, the sentries were asleep at their posts. Let's go, Eduardo whispered, getting the men to their feet. He led them to the start of the bridge, a sagging sling with rope sides and a wooden slat floor through which the rushing white river could be seen in strips. Several of the slats were missing. The bridge blew side to side in the wind and made a whining, creaking sound. Isabel looked at the men, most of whom were pale as ghosts. One step at a time, Eduardo said. The slats look weak, but they'll hold your weight. You have sixty seconds to cross. That's the amount of time between the searchlights. As soon as you get to the other side... Drop to your knees and crawl beneath the window of the guardhouse. You've done this before, right? Teddy said, his voice breaking on before. Plenty of times, Teddy, Isabel lied. And if a girl can do it, a strapping pilot like you will have no problem at all, right? He nodded. You bet your ass. Isabel watched Eduardo cross. When he was on the other side, she gathered the airmen close. One by one, counting off in 60-second intervals, she guided them onto the rope bridge and watched them cross, holding her breath and fisting her hands until each man landed on the opposite shore. Finally, it was her turn. 
she pushed the sodden hood off her head, waiting for the light to scrape past her and keep going. The bridge looked so flimsy and unsound, but it had held the men's weight. It would hold hers. She clutched the rope sides and stepped onto the first plank. The bridge swung around her, dipped right and left. She glanced down and saw strips of raging white waters 100 feet below. Gritting her teeth, she moved steadily forward, stepping from plank to plank to plank until she was on the other side, where she immediately dropped to her knees. The searchlight passed above her. She scrambled forward and up the embankment and into the bushes on the other side where the airmen were crouched beside Eduardo. Eduardo led them to a hidden hillock of land and finally let them sleep. When the sun rose again, Isabel blinked dully awake. It's not so bad here, Tori whispered beside her. Isabel looked around, bleary-eyed. They were in a gully above a dirt road, hidden by a stand of trees. Eduardo handed them wine. His smile was as bright as the sun that shone in her eyes. There, he said, pointing to a young woman on a bicycle not far away. Behind her, a town glinted ivory in the sunlight. It looked like something out of a children's picture book, full of turrets and clock towers and church spires. Almadora will take you to the consulate in San Sebastian. Welcome to Spain. Isabel instantly forgot the struggle it had taken to get here, and the fear that accompanied her every step. Thank you, Eduardo. It won't be so easy next time, he said. It wasn't easy this time, she said. They didn't expect us. Soon they will. He was right, of course. They hadn't had to hide from German patrols or disguise their scents from dogs, and the Spanish sentinels were relaxed. But when you come back again, with more pilots, I'll be here, he promised. She nodded her gratitude and turned to the man around her, who looked as exhausted as she felt. Come on, men. Off we go. Isabel and the men staggered down the road toward a young woman who stood beside a rusted old bicycle. After the false introductions were made, Almadora led them down a maze of dirt roads and back alleys. Miles passed until they stood outside an elaborate caramel-hued building in Parte Viejo, the old section of San Sebastian. Isabel could hear the crashing of distant waves against a seawall. Merci, Isabel said to the girl. De nada. Isabel looked up at the glossy black door. Come on, men, she said, striding up the stone steps. At the door, she knocked hard three times and then rang the bell. When a man in a crisp black suit answered, she said, I am here to see the British consul. Is he expecting you? No. Mademoiselle, the consul is a busy. I've brought four RAF pilots with me from Paris. The man's eyes bulged a bit. McLeish stepped forward. Lieutenant Torrance McLeish, RAF. The other men followed suit, standing shoulder to shoulder as they introduced themselves. The door opened. Within a matter of moments, Isabel found herself seated on an uncomfortable leather chair, facing a tired-looking man across a large desk. The airman stood at attention behind her. I brought you four downed airmen from Paris, Isabel said proudly. We took the train south and then walked across the Pyrenees. You walked? Well, perhaps hiked is a more accurate word. You hiked across the Pyrenees from France and into Spain. He sat back in his chair, all traces of a smile gone. I can do it again, too. With the increased RAF bombings, there are going to be more downed airmen. To save them, we will need financial help. Money for clothes and papers and food, and something for the people we enlist to shelter us along the way. You'll want to ring up MI9, McLeish said. They'll pay whatever Juliet's group needs. The man shook his head, made a tisking sound. A girl leading pilots across the Pyrenees. Will wonders never cease? McLeish grinned at Isabel. 
A wonder indeed, sir. I told her the very same thing.